Good evening. Welcome to the June 3rd City Council meeting. I'm Gina Louise Shara. I'm the council president and I will be presiding this evening. This meeting and all participating on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. We will begin with public comment. Then after public comment, we'll convene the meeting. We're doing things a little bit differently to allow additional time if needed and to facilitate doing the business of the council at a time that's more accessible to the public and more reasonable for our abilities. So um, I just wanna announce a couple of things. Um, we have a special meeting this coming Monday, June 7th at 7 p.m. On that agenda, we have the ordinances pertaining to the zero lot line, which will not be discussed this evening. And any of the items from tonight's agenda that we continue tonight that we don't take up tonight will be um, will be on the are on the June seventh agenda, and that is when we will deliberate on them. So, if there's an item of interest to you on today's agenda, other than the items pertaining to the fiscal year twenty two budget and the funds, um, then I want to make you aware that that any item other than those may be continued to Monday's meeting. I don't want you waiting around um, without that knowledge that it's possible we won't be taking those up this evening. Um, so we are gonna begin with public comment. If you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. The raise hand feature is at the bottom menu bar under reactions, or it's at the bottom of the participants panel, which opens if you click on participants at the bottom of the screen. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, may, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me to ensure equal access. And because of the open meeting law, technical problems such as not being able to raise your hand are the only thing the chat function is used for and it'll only be available during public comment. We cannot accept comment or commentary over chat. Private chat or chat only visible on Zoom during a public meeting is antithetical to an open public process in violation of our council rules for public participation and violates the spirit and potentially the law of open meeting law. If you wanna submit a written comment, please email it to city council at northamptonma.gov and it will be sent to all counselors and will be part of the public record. I'll unmute each raised hand in the order raised to make a comment. Before you begin, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. To ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to speak, the council limits comments to three minutes. You're in no way obligated to use the full three minutes, but if you do, after three minutes, I'll ask you to please finish your sentence. According to the council rules, we do not respond during public comment as it is your turn and time to speak. So while your comments should be directed at us, you'll understand when we don't respond. Our rules also state that counselors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. Your protected speech is a constitutional right and one that we ask you to wield with consideration and respect for all and with recognition that the public space that grants you that freedom is shared equally by everyone. Also according to open meeting law, if someone is disrupting a meeting, they may be removed. You may speak on any topic, it doesn't need to be an item on the agenda. I ask that all but the council turn off your video until called upon as comments are directed to the council. There was a, um, we had a Zoom bombing incident at our last meeting and uh, we will do our very best to try and catch anything like that as quickly as possible. And I appreciate uh, the person who made me aware of it. So um, please, if something happens, please let me know in chat. Um, the meeting can also be watched on channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media's YouTube uh, channel or other platforms. And the recording of this meeting will be available on Northampton Open Media's government video archive channel on YouTube. And I thank them as always for their public service to Northampton. So we will start with public comment and give me one moment. I gotta find the timer. Okay. So first up for public comment is Carol Owen. Hello, I am Carol Owen. I'm a resident of Ward 6 in Florence. I'm a 40-year resident and homeowner in Northampton. I served on the Policing Review Commission. And what I wanted to emphasize tonight is the importance of closing the gap between the mayor's budget for year one, that's fiscal um, 2022, to, be, to begin the line item that was set up to begin the development of the Department of Community Care. And the gap between that budget item and the $880,000 recommended by the Policing Review Commission. Thus far, we have heard of the availability of $574,000 uh, for the development of the first year development of the department, 
that would include $150,000 that are included in the bill sponsored by Senator Comerford that is assumed to be available to us following the State Legislative Conference Committee. I urge the mayor and the council to consider committing a portion of the American Rescue Plan money to a more adequate and realistic funding of the first year of the Department of Community Care without closing the gap between the current proposed budget and something more like 800,000 $800, to a million dollars. The new Department of Community Care would be restricted to activities like hiring 1.5 FTEs, writing a mission statement, uh, hiring consultants, uh, job descriptions, writing job descriptions, doing legal research, figuring out how that new department would relate to other city departments, including the NPD. And you know, while these are all important activities, it would be more meaningful if we could also see some hiring of direct staff, uh, an advisory board set up, <clears throat> and actual piloting of some of the alternative responses to non-criminal 911 calls that were anticipated in the commission report. By piloting these alternative responses and working to include both advisory positions and on the street positions uh, that uh, include people in Northampton with lived experience of responding to other people's mental health and substance abuse mm -hmm. issues, we would learn a lot from this pilot about how the staffing resources in the new department would work in an environment where we still have a need for policing for different kinds of responses. These developmental relationships could be worked out in the first year. In closing, I urge the mayor and the council to close the funding gap between what is being proposed in the budget so far and the strong, clear recommendation of the Northampton Policing Review Commission. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That's mine. Okay. Next is Cynthia Swopis. Can you unmute? Oh, you're not, you're muted, Cynthia. Sorry about that, thank you. I'm Cynthia Swopis. I lived in Northampton for 30 years. Um, I want to uh, thank the mayor and the city council for your willingness to listen and engage with the recommendations of the Police Review Commission to develop a Department of Community Care that is designed to address the issues outlined by the members of all the community regarding safety in Northampton. While the initial budget allocation supplemented by money from the state illustrates your commitment to the issues outlined since the George Floyd murder, I would like you to consider the following. I know you want to do this right. I know you are all, all committed to addressing the complications of armed responses to 911 calls. At the same time, I know how phased responses make us feel better because they take the time to analyze the problem, research solutions, establish buy-in from all the concerned parties and provide a structure moving forward. The money allocated in the budget will largely be devoted to the hiring of two positions and conducting research needed to determine how to structure the staffing and infrastructure of the department. That work needs to be done, but I implore you to consider the history of asking people of color and other marginalized groups to wait until we find a solution to problems that are over 200 years old. You saw how our city responded to the COVID-19 crisis. You saw how a public health infrastructure was built in a matter of weeks under the leadership of Meredith O'Leary. You saw how we set up a homeless testing shelter and center at the high school in a matter of days. You saw how we established a vaccine clinic in our senior clinic and our senior center staffed by first responders and so many volunteers that the, when the list was posted every day, it filled up immediately. <clears throat> I, tonight, I, I urge you and ask you to consider double the funding allocated for the Department of Community Care so we can speed this process up. So we can provide that coordinator and the staff the support that they are going to need to put us in a position next year at this time with a fully functional Department of Community Care. I know we can do it. I know we can do it in a year. And I know we can do it with some more uh, funding allocated in our budget. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Next is Allison Spencer Bunch. Uh, 
I'm Allison Spencer Bunch. I live in Ward 5 and I'm calling on the City Council to substantially cut the police budget and on uh, the mayor to fund the Department of Community Care to at least the $882,000 suggested in the Police Review Commission report. In order for the department to be successful and fully operational in 2023, there needs to be money dedicated to hire a team of crisis workers and advisory board members, not just one department head and one assistant. This needs to be money in the budget, not money dependent on grants that may or may not come. Anything less sets the department up for failure. It's not enough for the city council to say that this is the mayor's responsibility or that cuts to the police department need to wait until the community care department is operational. You need to cut from the police budget now to make room for these additional funds. The police review commission had several suggestions for things that could be moved out of the police department. City council members can also not say in good faith that Northampton police are exempt from violent white supremacy. Shoestring has a series of publications describing misconduct of NPD officers numerous public comments over the past year from members of communities impacted by policing describe incidents of harassment, bias, violence, and trauma caused by the police. Trust the people describing the harm the police are doing right here in Northampton. Divest from the Northampton Police Department and truly invest in community care. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Aaron Clark. You're, you're, you're not muted, but I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Aaron Clark, Ward 7. I've been a homeowner here for seven years. Uh, I'm resident and citizen of Northampton for the past 11 years. Um, so I'm grateful for everyone um, joining in this meeting tonight. is a moral document reflecting our values that has been Aaron Aaron can I stop you for a sec your um your your sound is going in and out There we go I'm sorry That's okay Is that better Yes Okay um, so I'll start over. Good evening, Aaron Clark, Ward 7, homeowner for seven years, resident and citizen of Northampton for the past 11 years. I'm grateful for everyone joining in this meeting, and I agree with Carol, Allison, and Cynthia's comments so far. Um, so we know that a budget is a moral document reflecting our values. It's been said and repeated numerous times in these meetings alone. We also know that current the current proposed budget raises the police budget by 3% while sabotaging the Department of Community Care as Carol Owen clearly illustrated in her comment earlier, by underfunding it from the get-go at a proposed 424,000, which is less than half of the 882,000 that the Northampton Policing Review Commission called for in the report. Ignoring the NPRC report does not reflect care in action. To truly reflect care in action, the council needs to commit to the Department of Community Care at 100% at least, not just 50% as proposed. How can it be named the Department of Community Care with a 50% public commitment to sabotage through intentional underfunding? So speaking of action further, uh, many of us are familiar with the wonderful writer, illustrator, Eric Carl, just passed away May 23rd. I'm sure quite a few of us can fondly recall his book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Regarding beautiful, cat beautiful butterflies in Carl's work, Fellow writer Maya Angelou tells us, quote, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. You all may say that Black Lives Matter, some may even have a yard sign or a bumper sticker, a series of profile pictures, quote, in your email signature, what have you. But as Maya Angelou tells us, through Eric Carle's work, simply delighting in beauty ignores the real necessity of fully committing to action in order to create truly authentic, sustainable transformation. Cynthia also just pointed to this larger idea of action and transformation before appearance as well. So for you city councilors, this means showing that Black Lives Matter in Northampton by defunding NPD by 50%, fully funding the Department of Community Care at least the, for at least the full 882,000 that the NPRC recommended so that sustainable transformation can occur 
and ultimately divest from the NPD and let's invest in community, admit the changes that are necessary in order to achieve that beauty that Maya Angelou speaks to. Um, I'll also close with another quote from James Baldwin that further speaks to what happens when we ignore the essential. He says, quote, it is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy that justice can have. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is uh, just says WMA abolitionists, maybe a collective. Hello, my name is Jose Adastra. I organize with Western Mass Abolitionist Collective. I've been, we, my family and I live in Ward 1. We're going on two years living here and I grew up coming here with my family and playing here as a child. Over the past year, um, I've been called an extremely dangerous minority, a liar, an interloper. I've been told to go back to where I come from and I've been told that I'm a liar basically by the more fascist of our community members and some people that aren't even from here and some some cops wives who have the audacity to attend from Westfield and call me some sort of terrorist um, on a public meeting. Um, and I, I'm going to get to the point. We have a bunch of weed stores doing really well. You can be creative on how to reallocate funds in this town. You should slash the budget. The Surgeon General said that police can't even enforce a mask mandate. That, that's how racist that they were, that they would end up doing more harm than good. And you just left them there to, to, to deal with the pandemic anyways. It's insulting that you cut more than you gave. You cut that budget as a social justice cut and then you didn't even reassign all of it that's appalling that money wasn't for you to put in a stability fund that money is for the suffering of black and brown people and you put it in your savings account that's insulting and we won't tolerate it you should at least assign two million dollars to the department of community care or last year you did a 10 percent jo jo joke cut and you didn't reallocate it anywhere that's not what we asked for we asked for it to be reallocated and then you made us provide information for you that we that black and brown people have been providing for at least a hundred years we already knew all of the stuff that came up in the police commission review you just chose not to believe us because maybe I'm an interloper to you or I don't belong here or maybe I'm a liar to you or maybe you to think I'm an extremely dangerous minority as well and maybe that is true because I will not tolerate the continued injustice and oppression of my people and I will not tolerate less than goddamn half of the police budget cut being reassigned to the Department of Community Care. Do you think that my, me and my family don't pay a cost to organize in our free time? Do you think that I don't pay a health cost, a financial cost, and an emotional cost? We all do. We all do. And it's especially imp impactful because I grew up as a subject of state violence, and I experience it firsthand. So not only have you subjected us to state violence for most of my family's natural life, at least 100 years, but now it's people like me that have to continuously come and say the same things we've been saying for at least 400 years, okay? And we have to wait for you to incrementally cut it. You're setting it up for failure. Uh, and like, if you think that I'm not willing, I, I have already dedicated my life to ruining the lives of the people who continue is, to oppress me. That it's is already, time. Uh, that's my commitment. I, Can you finish like, your sentence? I will. Um, the rest of my life, I'm going to be following the politicians who choose to oppress people whatever that, you know, it, just do the right thing. Assign an absorbent amount of money to the Department of Community Thank Care you. because that's what yeah. we deserve. And well good health minutes. to you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next is Lil P. Uh, I would just like to um, save my time for later because I'm not quite ready yet, so. Sure. Uh, Hendrix. 
Hi, I'm a Northampton resident. I've been living here all of my life. I was born and raised. I'm in Ward 5. My name is Henry Morgan. I live in Florence. Um, I just wanted to come out here in support of you guys fully funding the Department of Community Care because I genuinely believe that we can do it as a community, that we can build real community safety that's based on informed consent and not coercive state violence like the police department is. And if we are able to prove that we can create real community safety as an alternative to the police, then that's proof that we can do anything to create a nonviolent civilization, which I believe that we can do. Thank you for Thank everything you. you've done. Thank you. Next is Emma L. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I had clicked that. I would like to speak later. Thank you. Sure, I'll put your hand down. Okay, next is Megan. So my name is Megan. Uh, I'm a current resident of Springfield, but I lived uh, in Northampton for a long time and worked at ServiceNet in Northampton. And as someone who's worked in the field of mental health for a long time, I really um, want to speak also in favor of um, cutting the police budget further and funding the Department of Community Care. I also currently um, work and serve people living with Alzheimer's and dementia in the community. And I think we want to also think about other populations that are just terribly impacted by the police and who the police do not serve, um, including uh, people with other types of disabilities, um, people with dementia, Alzheimer's, people with mental health conditions, and also, of course, people of color who are disproportionately harmed by the police. And so, yes, just wanting to, again, support better funding the Department of Community Care, fully funding it, because I think it um, is a really great idea and would really help our community a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Amy Olson. Hi, my name is Amy Olson. I live in Ward 3 Northampton. Um, I agree with what everyone else has said, um, urging you to cut the police budget by at least 50%. Um, that's been the point of what people have been saying for over a year now. Um, and also to fully fund and more <laughs> the Department of Community Care. Um, looking at the budget and like Aaron said, budgets are a moral document. If there's over six million to the police and not even half a million to this Department of Community Care, it really shows something. Um, so just urging you to question whose side are you on, um, urging you to think big, dream big, and act big, and cut the police budget and fully fund the Department of Community Care. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Okay. Next is Janet Bruce. Thank you. Um, Janet Gross, Ward 2. <clears throat> I would like to add my full support to both Councillor Jarrett's at least 20 feet between houses amendment and the no extra wide houses amendment. While not a resident of Bay State, I find the city's actions there far too reminiscent of those on Round Hill Road over the past decade. Similarities brought too close to home when I looked out my window earlier this spring to find an individual whom I can now identify as the owner of New Way Homes taking, please note the verb, taking photos of our house. The state of Massachusetts duly recognized the voices of its citizens when it scuttled the King Street roundabout. It is time for the city of Northampton to support its residents similarly by enacting the two most recent zero lot line amendments, thereby tempering the power of predatory developers. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Dan Kennedy. 
All right, hi everybody. Good to see a lot of familiar faces um, again. <laughs> um, I think you know why I'm here. My name is Dan Kennedy. I'm a resident of uh, Northampton Ward 4, and I was also a member of the Policing Review Commission. Um, I'm here again to ask that you reject this budget um, and ask for a full funding of the Department of Community Care. Uh, I, like many people, are really excited about the potential uh, for grant funding to come through the state and other, um, other avenues, but I do want to caution that the main reason that we, we thought that this needed to be a department response, one of those things was that grant dependent funding <laughs> means that you can only go so far as your grant allows. Um, those grants also often come with, with strings and things like that, but the biggest thing is that grant funding can disappear. Can disappear. Um, if you will have a grant for three years, you can plan for three years, but you can't really plan beyond that uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so I want to caution us that the, um, in the report, we said the majority of the funding should not come from grants. It should be through the city. Um, I still believe that wholeheartedly, and I hope to see that happen. Um, I still am concerned that there's funding for more research um, and planning, which I appreciate. There's funds for hiring a project manager, but there's not funds for hiring a doer. <laughs> um, that you can plan all that you want, but unless we start acting or have at least the flexibility to act within that funding, uh, all it means is slow progress, slow change, and the potential for change, but not real change. And I wanna say that when <laughs> slow change is easy and it feels good when you're not the person who that change affects, when you don't have to wait, when the improvement and the change is going to come, whether or not it impacts your life, um, it's easy to say, let's go slow. Uh, so I do, again, encourage you to reject this and really work at how you can get that funding up to what really needs to happen so that infrastructure, technology, the purchases can start being made um, as planning is happening and that hiring and training can occur uh, so that we don't have to be in this meeting a year from now saying, wouldn't it be great if we could start this um, or wouldn't it be great if we had started earlier? Um, these are things that can have meaningful impacts now. Um, or at least very soon. So I'm hoping, I'm optimistic um, that we'll get through this. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Next is Jackie Balance. Ah, Jackie Balance again from Bay State. Good evening. Um, I also want the city to fully fund community care. Um, like you to implement that environmentally conscious public lighting and uh, support Main Street for everyone. That's another grassroots uprising of citizens concerned with among other things, the emergency part of the climate emergency. We need to start adapting to the future right now. We know that the zero lot line amendment was already confusing when it was first introduced to the council on April 1st. It left community resources with a unanimous neutral vote after two councilors admitted that the discussion left them with, quote, hamsters running around in my head. Legislative matters and the planning board jointly after some confusing amendments and discussion and the discovery that not every voting member was working from the same document, punted the confusing ordinance to the whole council to fix with the blessing of the city solicitor. And you know what happened in council last meeting when two members finally admitted, quote, I'm confused, a cleaned up version of the ordinance was requested. There's been unresolved confusion every step of the way. Councillor Jarrett gets a lot of credit for his cleanup efforts and for his helpful amendment, which is in the cleaned up version that's coming before you. It is much less confusing now. You have also received a citizen sponsored amendment called no extra wide houses that Janet just referred to a couple speakers ago. It is the capstone of the actual stated goal of the ordinance, which I will read it is to maintain more consistent setbacks within neighborhoods. That's the whole purpose of all these revisions. 
Don't forget that. Alex Jarrett's amendment and Bill Ryan's amendment together make it work. Without those amendments, the proposed ordinance changes fail utterly. If that is not obvious to you, I beg you to do your homework and learn how we got here with zero lot line developments. It's a story with many elements at play and that's why it's been so confusing. If you haven't done so yet, please read The Emperor Has No Clothes in your email. My extended comment was forwarded to each of you by the amazing Laura Kutzler. Thank you, Laura. My email includes revealing transcriptions from the evolution of zero lot line developments. Read the transcriptions and draw your own conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Deborah. Hi, thank you. My name is Deborah Berkovitz and I live at 41 Warner Street in Bay State Village. Thank you everybody for your service today. Um, in 2013, city planners told us that there would, quote, be basic design standards that would maintain a consistent look throughout the neighborhood, end quote, that would alleviate, quote, residents' concerns about past projects developed without such standards. It described these designs as including front porches and the distribution of parking, as well as many, quote, other standards that aim to have a project match the character of the neighborhood. I supported these zoning changes. Uh, everybody I've talked to in Bay State Village did, and we didn't get any of the neighborhood protections that we were promised. What we have are extra wide houses on small lots that are completely incongruent with a neighborhood and are dwarfing the houses around them. John Henzel said in the last meeting that 1800 square feet isn't a McMansion, and he is 100% right. It's a reasonable size house. However, 1,800 square feet and 35 foot tall isn't 35 feet tall isn't looking very reasonable next to the 900 or 1,200 square foot one or one and a half story historic houses, and much more importantly, 1,800 square feet a few feet away from another 1,800 square foot house, and yet another 1,800 square foot house looks like a 3,600 square foot house or a 5,400 square foot McMansion, extra wide. The planning department has made a number of complicated and completely unclear proposals regarding zero lot lines ostensibly to meet resident concerns. However, residents' voices weren't solicited or our concerns addressed. I have sat in on all of these meetings and it is clear to me that everyone is struggling with what seems to be intentionally confusing amendments. I have a lot of education and I can't figure them out. Like people voting on them, it's easy for me to feel like I should just give up and go along with it. I'm not saying everybody's doing that, but that's certainly my inclination, like, whoa, I don't get this. Bill Ryan has made an elegant and clear proposal. No more extra white houses. Our lots were shrunk. The houses need to shrink also so that they are scaled closer to previous zoning. They won't go back to it, but closer. While I would like to see something far more consistent with what was promised with the 2013 zoning changes, this feel, feels like a small compromise. The city gets more housing and more taxes. John Henzel gets to keep gutting our neighborhoods and we get a tiny bit of what we asked for. My heart sank today when yet another 170-year-old house two doors away from me went on the market on Warner Street. We will likely lose yet another critical house in our neighborhood and gain more new way homes, perhaps this time taking advantage of the two full-size houses per lot. And our block will continue to be a large-scale subdivision being developed one house at a time, a death by a thousand cuts. Please support no extra wide houses and Alex Jarrett's amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Catherine Komodar. Um, okay, sorry, one second. Okay, great. Hi everybody, I'm Catherine Komodar. I live um, on Warner Street in Bay State also. Um, thanks to the council for hearing us speak this evening. Um, I'm also here to support two zoning amendments um, tonight, Councillor Jarrett's re reduced lot line amendment to require at least 20 feet between houses in reduced lot line developments, and also the no extra wide houses amendment drafted by Bill Ryan that would limit the size of houses in reduced lot line developments to be no more than five feet wider than they would have been allowed standardly. Um, 
I also um, wanted to follow up what Deborah just said. I my heart was in my throat when I walked to work today, and I walked by that next house for sale on Warner Street. There was another neighbor outside also with their heart in their throats when we saw that. And I thought, well, what will our laws allow um, New Way Homes to do to that property? You know, is he going to tear it down as he did with 61 Warner um, and then replace it with three large houses? Or will he turn around after he's bought it and put it back on the market like he did with 290 Riverside and then build two large houses in the backyards? Um, how many of those lovely old centuries, uh, old maple trees will he cut down? And I, um, the death by a thousand cuts was the language I would have used also. I just feel like we're, we're bleeding here. <laughs> it's very painful. Um, and I feel like these two amendments are uh, a small but important step forward in trying to balance growing Northampton with preserving what we love here. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sarah Field. Hi there. Um, my name is Sarah Field. I live in Ward 6. I haven't been able to make a lot of city council meetings lately, but I've had a chance to view a lot of the commentary on YouTube and appreciate you guys streaming. I mean, on Northampton TV and appreciate so many of the comments that people have shared around the police budget and the Department of Community Care. Um, I'm here to also advocate that you all follow the recommendations of the Police Review Commission, fully fund the Department of Community Care, um, and reallocate that funding from the police budget, and that you also defund the police by 50%. Um, I want to get a little bit weird here today and talk about love in a city council meeting, because I think that we should talk about love and um, center love in everything that we do. And I wanna talk about love and power so love and power are often seen as oppositional, but they are actually not. You all have tremendous power right now that you can use in service of love. Um, I wanna share a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. about love and power. He said, power without love is reckless and abusive and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. You all have the opportunity right now to literally shift power from a, um, an organization, an entity that has a history and a present day practice of abuse and violence, of power without love, to a new like seedling of an organization, of an entity, of an institution that we can co-create as a community to really manifest power as fused with love. And you can do that by moving power, which in uh, you know, our current world is money, is funding. Um, so I really encourage you to think about where you want to place the power in our community. Do you want to place it in a situation that is um, devoid of love? Or do you want to create an entity that is love backed by power? Um, thank you all so much. And thank you to everyone who has spoken out about this issue over the last year um, and beyond. And thank you all for your service. Thank you. Okay, Lil. Um, hello, my name is Lil. I uh, live in, I think, Ward 6 in Northampton. Uh, I support everyone's comments previously made today. Um, the current 2022 budget does nothing to cut from the police budget. It increases the budget by 3% and it reallocates less than half the funding cut from the police last year to the Department of Community Care. It's been hundreds of years of violent racism and ableism through policing. Our communities hurt and black leaders across the country calling for policing alternatives. This summer, thousands of 
poured out into Northampton. Hundreds calling for defunding the Northampton police. Our community is telling you what we want. We have given you so much information. I have given you my own testimonial, but this budget does nothing of substance. No change, especially not quickly. This budget will bring more decades of no change, more decades of our community being hurt and left without real help when we need it. I have had mental breakdowns and domestic disputes. My own mother has threatened to call the police on me while I kept asking her not to because she didn't have or know any other alternatives to call. Underfunding the Department of Community Care means that me and possibly people more vulnerable than, than me, more disabled and mentally ill, or more colored than me, won't get the help they need. They won't get the care from the community that they need for another year. It needs its funding as soon as possible to start actual public safety for everyone in Northampton. I think that the Northampton police, the budget should be defunded by 50% and to fund the Department of Community Care by at least 1 million in this year's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dory Midnight. Okay, sorry about that. I'm actually Luke Midnight Woodward, Dory Midnight's partner on her Zoom account. Um, I live in Northampton in Ward 3 on uh, Hancock Street. And I am a parent and um, a homeowner for what it's worth. Um, and I'm here to also support um, the cutting the police budget by 50% and increasing the Department of Community Care to 1 million at a minimum. Um, to me, it looks pretty clear the police will still have plenty of money, about five, five times the budget. So. That seems like a fair, um, well, not still not adequate, but for a starting point, it seems like a decent starting point. Um, my, my work is in Holyoke. I work at Holyoke High School as the restorative justice program director there. Um, I co-founded the program. So I've got a background in um, thinking about alternatives to punitive justice. Um, I've also seen firsthand at Holyoke High School um, how punitive justice really doesn't get to the root of anything and in fact exacerbates um, systems of oppression and societal problems and doesn't get to the root of what's actually needs to be healed. Um, and I've also seen the powerful potential of alternative models and what happens when communities come together to dream and then bring those dreams down to earth to actual practice. And that's what we have the opportunity to do here in Northampton. And I couldn't be more proud to live in a place um, where this conversation is happening. And I'm so grateful for the organizing that's already happened here. Um, so I just really want to lift it up and support it. Um, our budget at Holyoke High for the restorative justice work is about $350,000 a year, and that's not enough. So to think that a city, and that's with about 1,200 students, so to think that a city of Northampton could operate something effective on a similar budget to what we have at Holyoke High School is a joke. Um, that's not going to have the impact that we're looking for, and then as other people have said, it's a setup um, for it to fail. So let's set it up for success. Let's show real commitment. Um, I think you know the, the civil rights movement of our time is black led by Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is saying defund the police. Let's listen um, to the people most impacted and follow their lead, especially living in a majority white community. Um, we, as a white person, I don't wanna say where the priorities need to be when it comes to things that disproportionately impact communities of color. So I wanna listen. Um, and this is the directions that we're getting. So let's, let's um, Let's honor the leaders of our time. Let's honor our descendants who are gonna look back at this historical moment and judge us based on how we act, um, how we choose to respond and whether we rise to the occasion. Um, so yeah, I just encourage you to meet the moment with courage, imagination and a belief in the power of what's possible when we come together in the service of transformation and justice. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Amy Bookbinder. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm working with a new phone, so uh, bear with me. Okay. Um, Amy Bookbinder, Ward 7. 
a few thoughts before you vote on the budget tonight. First and foremost, thank you to the hundreds of people who've called in speaking their truth to power, sharing their stories of abuse, harassment, and harm done to them by the NPD spanning years. It was painful for me to hear. Was it painful for you, counselors? I know the truth is hard to hear, but worse is to ignore it. Your votes matter. If you vote for the budget in your white skin and otherwise privileged status, you'll be ignoring the voices of the people in a classic case of white privilege and choosing conversation over action. The mayor told the Gazette, if they had requested putting it up, we could have had a conversation. He called it an art installation. No mayor, it was a memorial and you had it destroyed a memorial to a person this council held a moment of silence for while condemning his murder and the racist police brutality. This council praised the Policing Review Commission's work and passed a resolution in support of its demands. More conversation. Tonight, you have an opportunity to stop talking the talk, no matter how lofty, but walk the walk. Reject the budget, which doesn't reflect your support of the Policing Review Commission's recommendations or your own commitment to defunding the police that you made months ago. And it shockingly instead requests increasing the already appalling huge police budget in a tone deaf move by the mayor. This reminds me sadly of another tone deaf response to calls for justice seven years ago after Jonas Correa, a young black man was brutally arrested, not in Minneapolis, but right here in Northampton. The videotaped police brutality went viral and was seen by over 50,000 people on YouTube. The city settled. We in Justice for Jonas called on the mayor and the council to have an outside impartial investigation. What did the mayor do? He refused and instead promoted the officer to the second highest position in the Northampton Police Department. Now his proposed budget for the NPD with an increased police budget is another tone deaf and dismissive response. Maybe if he'd listened then and taken righteous action requested, we wouldn't be where we are today with seven more years of police misconduct. And if he, ignore, and if he ignores the people's cries today for change, where will we be in the future? Seven more years, maybe with worse harm done? That's Counselors. time. Okay, I will close with this. Voters will remember, counselors, on election day, whether you had the courage to right the wrongs then and continuing with a no vote on the proposed budget tonight. Which side Thank are you. you on? Thank you. Uh, next is NPD spouse. Hi, yes, um, I am just gonna go by NPD spouse and I live in Westfield. In response made against me and my participation in these meetings, it is clear that they are an attempt to intimidate those who support NPD into silence and deflect from their utter lack of defense for both their words and actions. While many here would rather I remain silent, my family and those of all the NPD officers cannot afford to be silent when just last week, two of our officers had their lives threatened while they were simply working a traffic detail. A man approached them unprovoked in broad daylight and told them he was going to get a gun and shoot them. My fear is real, and every time I speak to you in these meetings, it has reason after reason to grow. Sadly, counselors, you are a part of that fear. Your decision to cave under pressure last year on the budget and defund the department by 10% opened the door for everything I have spoken to you about and so much more. You made that decision without doing any research on NPD or having any empirical data to support it. Last week, when Chief Casper presented the department's budget to you, several of you voiced your support. You have my, my sincere gratitude for that. However, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the comment stating the decision last year was made out of expediency. I think this comment may have been the most honest one I've heard yet in these meetings, and I think it speaks to the majority of the council's motivation. I think expediency is what drove most of you to vote the way you did last year. You are willing to endanger others to alleviate the stress and attention from yourselves. 
This is, of course, in addition to the pain you have caused the NPD officers' families who have endured threats, smear campaigns, and uncertainty for whether they will be able to provide for their families or even return to them. I genuinely appreciate that you have at least reflected on this decision over the past year and can only hope that you will not make that same mistake again this year or in years to come. Two of you counselors I know have already come out publicly in the media to show your support for Northampton abolition now and defunding, something that Nan doesn't seem to object to, even though before any public hearings took place last week, they were saying that they were quote unquote disgusted by counselors who voiced their support. Know that Northampton is not the only town regretting its decisions last year due to its impact on public safety. Many cities across the country who too quickly defunded are now scrambling to refund after realizing the impact on public safety. However, this does not mean that MPD is not eager to continually seek to improve. As Chief Casper stated to you last week, a co-responder model is both highly effective, safe, and responsive to the needs of all community members. This was also one of the recommendations of the commission and deserves further research. However, it is hard to trust any of the commission's assertions when one of the members of the commission last week directly stated that, quote, our intention was to diminish the footprint of the police department, end quote. This shows that the goal was not a non-biased review of the current state of policing in Northampton, but confirms its clear biased agenda as pointed out in the report by Mr. Pohl, one of its members. You do not need to defund the police department in order to fund the Department of Community Care. That is the perspective of those whose true agenda is not community care and safety, but rather the furthering of a political ideology that is based on anti-police sentiment. To those who may be wondering who I am or who my officer is, the families of NPD are your fellow community members, colleagues, friends, and neighbors. We are the ones who support our officers so they can selflessly leave our homes every day to put their <coughs> lives at risk for you and your families. Thank you. Next is Kathy McNally. Hey everybody, it's Kathy McNally. Unfortunately, my camera is not working tonight, which is unfortunate for you because I am having an awesome, awesome hair day. And I'm sorry about that. So, hey, I'm just a middle-class white 65-year-old woman who sometimes goes to Walmart, sometimes eats at McDonald's. And I want to say that I am shocked at your at the mayor's under budgeting of the community department. Because as our wonderful Lindsay Sabadosa state rep has often said and sort of really gotten me to believe, budgets represent values. And I feel like the half price, half loaf support that Mayor Narkowitz has given the um, community service department is really oh, an insult. And I hope that the counselors will correct that insult. I think that the police department has more, much more money than they need. I think if anyone wants to look at the statistics about policing in the United States, you'll see clearly what's going on. That police are overly funded everywhere. It's kind of obscene and I'm looking for the city councilors to return the full budget. You know, I listened to the commission, police review commission, and when they reported their findings, it was clear they did about a thousand hours of work. They worked so hard, they worked so carefully. And I think what the mayor is saying is, yeah, nice. Okay, you nice people you know, we're going to show you that we look like we're giving lip service. So I think it's an insult. And I want to share with what a neighbor said to me recently. And this is something that I've heard from my other, some fellow white people. This neighbor said to me, I don't know if it's because I'm white, but I think the police are great. And I think that's what the problem is. It is because she's white. We're not aware of what's going on with other people until we hear them at great personal cost share their experiences. And that has moved me quite a bit. So thank you, counselors, for dealing tirelessly with this issue. I support you. I think you're doing great work. And I want you to increase that community care budget. Thanks. Thank you. Next is Elliot. Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi. Um, so my name is Elliot Oberholzer. I use they, them, or he, him pronouns. I live in East Hampton, um, and I've worked in Northampton in the past. I get medical care in Northampton right now, so I'm invested in what happens there. Um, I, I'm speaking today to uh, urge you to defund the police budget by 50% at least. Um, and uh, speaking, uh, I'm speaking from the perspective of recognizing that the council is in a weird position here. You can defund, but you can't reallocate that funding. We saw that really clearly last year with the 10% defund. Um, so I, I'm thinking that maybe some counselors might be sitting here listening to all of these calls for defunding by 50% and saying, okay, if we cut by 50% and that money just sits there again, is it worth it? Um, and I'd like to say really clearly that yes, it is. If the only thing that you can do is cut the police funding by 50%, it's doubly incumbent on you to make that cut. Last year, um, the council cut the police budget by 10% and actually nothing bad happened, right? Society did not collapse. The poor sheep of the civilians were not eaten by the thinly veiled racist metaphor of wolves, no matter what police propaganda would have you believe. White fragility may feel under threat from that cut, but actually the facts are that nothing bad happened with defunding. Even more, we actually saw immense benefits from even that small cut. We got a serious and committed policing review commission based on the energy and the, the commitment around that decision and really wonderful steps taken by community organizers in the last year in the areas of housing, peer counseling, peer support. So what we've seen in the past year is that cutting the police budget gives people in Northampton the space to breathe. It gives them space to imagine a future collectively, to see a future that's better, stronger, healthier than what we have now. So again, I know that you're not directly in control of funding the Department of Community Care, though I hope that the council will use what power they have to encourage the mayor to fully fund the department. But the power that you do have is to cut the police budget by 50%, and that is the right way to proceed here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next is Ryan, uh, Ryan Wadsworth. Ryan, you're not unmuted. Okay, I will come back to you, Ryan. Uh, next is Emma L. Hello, I am Emma Linderman. I live in Florence. Um, first, I just want to say I support full funding of the community care department as recommended by the commission. But I'm speaking regarding the zoning regulations that are under your consideration, um, the zero or reduced lot line developments. Um, first, I want to state that I support equitable and environmentally responsible infill development that fits into a neighborhood. Recent developments have shown that this can be done well or quite badly. I urge you to support the no extra wide houses amendment. This is a modest proposal that provides a simple formula for how to figure out the size for any particular district and lot size. Um, the real problem exists when extra wide houses are built on small 50 foot wide lots. While I personally hope that 50 foot lots will not become common, when they are created, a 30 foot wide house on a 50 foot wide lot is just too wide for that lot. Please keep this from happening. And please don't be swayed by an argument if it's given that narrower houses might require more expensive use of architects and such. Um, this was stated by a city employee at one committee me meeting um, and thus be uh, not as accessible to lower income buyers. Uh, while a de developer with just one or two house plans for every lot may need to do some homework and pivot, a quick web search shows that a stock plans for, are a plenty for 20 foot houses that are just one or two stories high, and some of them are quite lovely. I also support amendments presented by Councillor Jarrett regarding this issue. He has listened deeply to his constituents 
and public committee and council discussions amidst recent challenges in Bay State, and I urge you to heed his recommendations. Lastly, I strongly urge you to conduct a comprehensive review of the infill zoning ordinances from 2013 forward to determine the successes and unforeseen problems and the best path forward to balance development with neighborhood preservation. And I also hope that climate change mitigation is included in this review. Thank you for considering my opinions and thank you for your service to the city. Thank you. Okay, Ryan, you should be unmuted. There you go. There we go. Hey everyone, sorry about that. Um, so thank you. Thank you everyone for all your time, all of your effort, all of your service. I, uh, I, I, I guess I'll just echo what Dan said, um, Dan Kennedy, that uh, he is calling for, uh, also Northampton Abolition now is calling for uh, you to use your power in this historic moment to stand up, to be bold, to reject this budget. Uh, there are several reasons to do so. Um, I wanna speak specifically to some of the procedural stuff. Uh, I've heard that it is only possible to, according to the Department of Revenue regulations, provide funding for uh, specified line item positions. <clears throat> and yet it was the mayor who uh, in direct, um, who, who, who failed basically to come up with a, um, a way to provide flexible position titles basically, which would allow for this new department to step into its work in a way which um, will be, which, which has the hope of being actually fast enough uh, that the immediate harm that is being done in this community can start to be addressed. Um, and so I would urge council to, to use your power and use this historic moment um, to, to reject the budget, to specifically call for the demands which have been so clearly um, expressed over and over and over, um, uh, which, which, I apologize, <laughs> going, in, going in several directions, um, y'all have already heard these demands and, um, and so thank you very much for your time. Um, I would say that, and uh, my last point is just that anything um, any, any, any failure to take up the urgency of this moment, um, despite our thinking about how that may be the most politically expedient, um, I, I do not feel uh, is going to help us in the long run. Um, we need bold action now. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sean Official. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Sean Official. I live in Bades Ward 7. Um, and I'm also here tonight to speak about uh, policing in our city and the budget. I do want to mention that um, this week from the desk of Joe Comerford, she um, let constituent know that the Senate passed the state budget, which includes 150,000 for Northampton Community Care Initiative. And if that is what Boston is seeing, that it is an initiative, um, then we should rise up to the occasion. First of all, be accountable and transparent about that $150,000 that is uh, slotted to us from the uh, state um, budget, as well as um, increase the budget um, that the mayor currently proposes proposed. Um, I'm also aware that the mayor applied for corresponder funding. I'm not sure if it's the same 150,000, but um, I would like to have more transparency about uh, what application um, the mayor applied for the corresponder funding and how that uh, the city will be transparent with the use of that funding if approved. Um, and I want to respond to the um, NPD spouse saying that while um, I am starting to hear that someone threatened 
um, her spouse uh, with a gun, uh, police can always take the, off the blue uniform and walk around the civilian. The people that are not listened to thoroughly are the people that live in their skin where they're all, often oppressed. Um, and she also lives in Westfield. So that means that our tax money go to salaries and then leave our cities. Currently, we do not have a police residency requirement. Um, most of our police are not our neighbors. So actually, we do want to have our neighbors be the one that care for the other neighbors. Um, and thinking about everything that's transpired um, in the city council lately, I can envision our city stepping to be a very white gated city with new developments, um, with armed police forces, um, limited access to uh, our land, um, and an increase in zones of, inc of exclusion. Um, I do not think that that is the vision that we want for Northampton. I don't think that is the morals or the values that North, Northamptonites hold. Um, so I really urge the council to do in your power to rely on the hours and hours of a testimony of individuals that have really uh, put their heart forward to share the impact. And most of the people that support the police are white um, and they do not have lived this experience. It's time to listen to the lived experience and support, not a co-responder network, but a peer support network. Um, and uh, I'm done for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is uh, Marina Malucci. Hi, yeah, that's me, thank you. Could you state your name and city or town for our record, please? Absolutely, my Thanks. name is Marina Malucci. Uh, I live in Amherst, Massachusetts. Go ahead, thank you. Uh, it's my perspective and the perspective of many that defunding and divesting from the police is not just a part of the movement of Black Lives Matter, but a absolute necessity for the saving of people's lives. It is crucial that this decision is made because if it is not by the council, people will die. Black lives will be lost if the police are not defunded and the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement are not listened to. The community centers need funding uh, and we as a community of people can support each other. In situations where mental health crises are found within communities and individuals, people with armed guns and legal power over individuals um, owned by private institutions cannot be the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Maritha Wallace. Hi, um, I live in Amherst, Massachusetts, um, but I'm an ESP at JFK Middle School. Um, I have um, been to several of these meetings and I have to say, you know, I fought really hard. I've given all of my words and I have to say, I don't have much hope that you will do the right thing. And I have to say, in all honesty, I'm, I'm tired of, of begging. And to be honest, I have said all the words, please help us do this. Many other people have said, please help us do this. But from what I'm seeing is you're not really interested in helping at all. You are, you have your way set. There is not one thing that I can tell you or any other person of color that can tell you that is going to change your mind. And I just feel like, you know, from the educational standpoint of the budget and fighting for all of that and fighting for my rights just to exist as a human being and having other black and brown students that live there and being afraid for them. I don't have much hope that you will do the right thing. I, you know, we have said all of the right things in previous meetings and in this meeting as well. But I, you know, I, I feel like that is something that is, is not important nor is it respected because you're gonna do what you wanna do. And, and that is not to protect black and brown people who look like me. And I get it, that's not your job. You don't wanna do it. So, okay, I accept that. But that is, 
it, I'm so tired of fighting and fighting and fighting and literally having what I need and what people look like me need fall on deaf ears. So I don't have any hope that you will do the right thing, which is to defund the police, listen to what we are asking for and give this money so that we can improve together. But I don't think that you'll, you're going to do that because I don't think you care. I don't think you care because you don't look like me and you don't walk around the walk around in society with my skin on because I think if you did you might vote differently thank you and have a good night thank you next is Jesse Hassinger thank you um, Jesse Hassinger Ward 4 I wrote a lengthy email to all counselors the other day, and I'm going to read a truncated version of this letter tonight. I've been thinking back on the past year, and there is one haunting question that is only just now beginning to be answered. How will people's involvement change once the momentum of the 2020 social justice protests have subsided? These protests, marches, and calls for equality that erupted last summer in the wake of George Floyd's death were amazing to see, especially when thinking about the incredible number of white people and other non-Black accomplices who stood in comradeship. We cannot remain deaf any longer. We cannot remain complacent any longer. We cannot remain white liberals who all too easily forget the terror that our white skin inflicts due to our ancestors' single-minded fight for white supremacy. Calling ourselves allies and doing nothing isn't going to cut it. Author Roxanne Gay, wrote in her article on making Black Lives Matter. Black people do not need allies. We need, she writes, people to stand up and take on the problems born of oppression as their own without remove or distance. We need people to do this even if they cannot fully understand what it's like to be oppressed for their race or ethnicity, gender, sexuality, ability, class, religion, or other marker of identity. We need people to use common sense to figure out how to participate in social justice. We as a community must go beyond the idea of allyship towards concrete comradeship. We cannot even consider calling ourselves allies if all we do is write a position paper on how heinous systemic racism is, and then we don't do a damn thing to change it. It is more than time to start trying to make additions onto the house of white supremacy and start figuring out how we can deconstruct it for a more equitable and just city. Let those who have been living in its shadow direct that deconstruction. They are the ones most affected by our decisions. Let them lead how we move forward. Last year, what was begun in good faith by starting to divest in policing must continue by fully investing in the community. So far this year, what we have seen is a reflection of the worst of white liberal complacency, a turning of the back to the voices of the BIPOC communities who we have actively asked to teach us what to do. Now that we have their answer, it is utter hubris to ignore it. I entreat you to hear what our community is saying and step away from the ease of white complacency. The budget as it currently stands does not reflect what the community wants. Do not vote for this budget as it is written. Instead, demand fully funding the Department of Community Care, a major that cut to the NPD budget and push for a reallocation of those funds to the Department of Community Care. Thank that was you. time, thanks. All right, I apologize. I don't know why the timer is sometimes dinging once and sometimes dinging multiple times. I can't figure it out, but I will tell you once it's ended because I know that it's really difficult to hear. Uh, next is Amy Francis. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, I wrote a whole thing tonight. I wrote a whole thing, right? And I don't think I can say anything better than what Dan Kennedy 
and Elliot, I'm going to kill your last name right now, Elliot, I'm so sorry, Oblen Holzer and Marthea Wallace and my wonderful partner in life, Jesse Hessinger, who just went, I don't think I can say anything better than what they've said, than what Jose said, than what Amy uh, Bookbinder said. So instead, um, in my pure lividness of this being any sort of discussion and pleading with you of what we as a community want, I give you hope by singing this song. It's time to play the music. It's time to light the lights. It's time to meet the Muppets on the Muppet Show tonight. It's time to put on makeup. It's time to dress up right. It's time to raise the curtain on the Muppet Show tonight. Why do we always come here? I guess we'll never know. It's a kind of torture to have to watch the show. But now it's time to get started. Why don't you get things started? It's time to get things started on the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational, muppetational. This is what we call the Muppet Show. Thank you. Please reject this budget. Thank you. Next is Lydia. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Lydia Irons and I live in Amherst, um, but I uh, hope to work in Northampton um, as I'm about to graduate nursing school. Um, I have many people who live there and I agree with the amazing person who just sang the Muppet Show song that everything that's been said tonight is um, well-spoken, well-said, with a perfect outline of how you all can move forward. Um, and what I'd like to bring to this conversation is that um, the other towns around you are doing it. I am part of the defund movement here in Amherst, and we have had um, a significant move towards the creation of a community um, safety working group and a community crisis response team that will be funded and we've frozen police positions and it can be done and it's happening around you. And if you can't wake up and see that you have the ability to be on the right side of history, then you are wasting everybody's time, including your own. You can reject your budget, you can make a one month budget. There are many ways that you can get around these things in the laws of this state and in the laws of your town. Um, and by choosing to just keep going with what you have because it's the easy thing to do, you're actively showing all of your constituents that you aren't listening and that you don't care. So please listen to all of these wonderful people, even when we're singing the Muppets, because it's very, because it's changing, it's happening, and you should come with us. Thank you. Next is Rue Walter. And, oh, there we go, Rue Walter. Well, let me see, I got my video going here. Yeah, there we go. I should be better adept at this if I'm a school teacher and have done a year of Zoom teaching. <laughs> uh, Rue Walter, 16 Warner Street. Um, just on one more time to give my support to things that were said by a lot of very prolific people already, like Jackie and Emma and Catherine and Janet and Deborah. And I support of Alex Jarrett's proposed amendment to at least mandate 20 feet between houses. Again, it's a start. And I want to thank Alex Jarrett because I have been coming to these council meetings now, kind of some, you know, a similar situation as other people are in for other, you know, other reasons. Um, and sometimes you just feel like you're saying things and no one's listening. And I really want to thank Alex because whether or not things go the way we hope it does, which we do hope, at least he's taken the time to make us feel like he's listening and to come up with proposals. Um, I feel quite often that I'm at these meetings and things are said, and then later on I'm hearing discussion that we can't weigh in on. And I'm hearing people going, well, I don't really get this. Well, I'm really confused. And I'm thinking, but it's your job to know this. 
before you come on. We've talked about de developing areas and people have, some people have never bothered to come and even see what's going on. So I do wanna thank him and support Alex's proposal and also definitely supporting uh, Bill Ryan's amendment um, for no extra wide houses. I just really, really, really hope that, again, I'm not gonna be listening on Monday night to people who are once again saying that they're not really understanding what was going on or hearing people asking questions like, well, how many zero lot line permits have actually been, people have actually issued permits that they've used in hearing answers be something like, well, I don't know, about five or six. When I know darn well, it's way more than five or six, but none of us can weigh in. Um, so I, I do agree that people need to do their homework and follow up, people that are listening and know that unfortunately, not everyone who is answering questions at the meetings later on, especially at planning and zoning board meetings, are always giving a clear picture of what's happening. So again, I appreciate your time. And we will not be going away. We are here for the long haul. Um, I hope Maritha, for everything that you're hoping for, please do not give up because sometimes I feel like that's what people hope will happen, that people will just give up and go away. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Bennett Sandbrook. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, my name is Bennett Sandbrook. I'm a resident of Ward 3. Um, this is my first time speaking. I, um, I'm speaking because I, I think it's incredibly important that more voices are heard tonight. Um, and I this is like the last thing in the world that I would want to do is talk to a Zoom meeting this large, but I think it's critically important um, that the council hears as many people as possible saying defund by 50%, defund the Northampton police by, by 50% and fully fund the Department of Community Care. Um, I've been watching these city council meetings for a year now and I'm remembering very viscerally where we were last year. I remember hearing councilors um, saying things that felt like they were understanding the urgency of the situation, saying things that allowed believe that the possibility for this town to become um, somewhere safe for all of its residents, somewhere that valued the lives of folks of color, that valued the experiences of people who had been harmed by Northampton police. And I'm, I've somehow lost that. Um, it sounds like the counselors are moving away from that, that they've either become scared in a year or they've, um, they've lost the sense of urgency. And I am so confused because all we have seen in a year is more pain. And all we have heard are more stories of abuse and violence at the hands of Northampton police. Um, as many have said, the budgets represent the values of this town. Um, if you believe that Black Lives Matter and if you believe um, the stories that people are sharing, that means defund the police. That means take actual real steps towards defunding the police and to um, a real presented opportunity. Um, I think you've, I've heard over and over again, um, folks say that they need more data, they need more research before taking steps. Um, I don't think you need more data or more research as this entire commission has shown, you need more courage. Um, I think it's scary to do something this big when there are centuries of um, white supremacy propelling the police department forward, but it's necessary, it's critical and and I think you should be proud of this opportunity, um, not scared of it. Not every town is has folks showing up in these numbers to say, here is what we need and here is what we want. And, and also here is how you do it. Um, but this town is. And I think knowing that the time that these council meetings happening, knowing, knowing all of the prohibiting factors to allowing people to show up, and there are still people showing up and there's still people sharing stories that they wouldn't tell even family members or friends. And they're telling them to you because you are the people who can do something with them. Um, I think you should be immensely grateful that you are in an opportunity to um, to actually make a, make a change, to stand up to the mayor who has shown that he does not care at all about his constituents. He does not care about anyone except the police department and except himself and, and especially white constituents of his town. And I think you can make a difference here. Um, defund by 50%, fully fund the Department of Community Care, um, well beyond the absolute meager scraps that are being provided, which is borderline a joke. Thank you. That's it, thank you. Oops. Next up is Rai. Hello. 
Hello, my name is Ryan Buckley, and I live in Ward 3 of Northampton. Um, I did some envelope math. It might, might not be perfect, but I believe that the current funding of the Department for Community Care is 0.3% of the total budget of Northampton this year. Any opposition to funding the Department for Community Care more is not financial. It is purely to sabotage the new department. It's my belief that the new mayor doesn't want anything to do with this department or any of us. He has chosen the budget of the, he believes the community will, you know, fight against the least. I'm not sure. It's a meaningless funding commitment to the department and an as usual increase in the police budget. As usual politics and an as usual budget is white supremacist. I know you all know this. This is the country we live in. Um, Northampton can absolutely afford to fund the Department of Community Care. It can offer a wage to the new department head, which is competitive compared to other department heads in Northampton, and which will attract quality candidates. It can also afford to hire a team to support this department head. Funding for a team will make the position of department head more attractive, and also teams are well known to be much more effective than one or two employees working on their own. Furthermore, a team can and should be representative of the diversity of our community, our country, and the folks this department will serve. I don't want the safety and future of my friends and loved ones and all the people in our community suffering at the hands of police to depend on one person, one part-time assistant, and $424,000. Can we please invest at least a million, maybe 800K, whatever, just way more than the actual, just way more than the actual safety of our community? Invest enough to hire a team that is diverse and representative of those most harmed by policing, who can learn about our community, collaborate with the amazing folks providing non-coercive, non non-carceral care already in our community. I know Northampton can afford this. I know that another 0.3% of our budget will not empty our coffers. I know that the only reasons to not fund this department, I don't know what they are. Um, but I know we can afford it. And I know, I don't know, please do it. Please, please, please. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Next is um, Allie Cup. Cup. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Allie Kipe. I live in Northampton. Um, like Bennett, who just spoke recently, I've been to many of these meetings over the past year. But this is my first time speaking um, because I believe this is really important. Um, I want to urge you all to reject this budget and to fully fund the Department of Community Care. Thank you. Thank you. Next is, oh, uh, Joyce was there, but she just did. Oh, Joyce, you're back. Okay, here's Joyce. Go ahead. Can you unmute? Hold on. Okay. Um, I, I didn't plan to speak tonight. I have written something that um, Laura uh, sent to each council member. Um, however, I'm so moved by the passion and the, uh, the heart of each speaker who's spoken on both of these topics, the zero lot lines and um, the... Uh, uh, increase or the defunding of the police, but mainly the attention to be given to the community care um, um, department. Um, I, 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 the balance that someone spoke about between love and power, I, I think is, um, is so little uh, taken into consideration in our world. Um, and I urge all of us, all of us to be fearless and choose love and listen to each other. And all of these matters that we're speaking of tonight come circling around social justice um, to have space and air between our homes and to have homes that are affordable uh, and 
take into consideration the needs to protect our planet um, and to care for each other through all of the social services. So this may not be my best effort at speaking, but I'm so moved by what I'm hearing tonight. And I urge, um, I, I guess I urge the council to have open hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ashwin Ravi Kumar. Hey everyone, I'm Ashwin and I live in Amherst. You've heard from me a few times talking about uh, the importance of divesting from policing and reinvesting our, in our community. Uh, today, I just wanna focus quickly on the operations side of things. And I know that many of the counselors have experienced working in nonprofits, uh, have experience even working in the private sector and have experienced building really new, bold and innovative programs. Um, I too have experience working in teams uh, that have built new and innovative things. Um, I've worked on teams that have built programs to do new types of conservation with indigenous people in the Amazon uh, that have worked with communities and nonprofits around climate justice in rural communities and urban communities in the United States. Um, I've also even done a brief stint uh, in Silicon Valley when I was a lot younger at Google. Uh, when I was 20, I worked at Google. And one thing that I know is that it really takes a team uh, to do big innovation. And what we're calling for here with the Department of Community Care is a tremendously bold and innovative space. It's really at the cutting edge of figuring out how to do new big things. And that, th that takes a ton of time. That takes a lot of people on your team that you can come up with new ideas together with, that you can have hallway conversations with, or even Zoom conversations with, that you can brainstorm and mind map and try things out together with. Um, with just one person and an assistant and maybe some sporadic consultants, you don't get that critical mass that is necessary to drive the level of innovation that we badly need here. Um, so I just really hope that you'll also think about what it would look like to be that person or be one of the people in the Department of Community Care, what that job would look like, and how supported they would feel to do what we're actually calling them to do. And I think if you if you think about your own experiences, like I'm like I'm doing right now, um, you'll see that having a team of people with deep expertise that represent the people that are going to be served by this department with a lot of time to be together, to build community with one another, to reach out and to innovate and to come up with new ideas requires a lot more resources than the 400 and some thousand that we currently have in the mayor's proposed budget. Um, I even know that the mayor probably has experience that's relatable to exactly this issue too. Um, so I just hope you'll take that kind of lived day-to-day -day imagination of what this will actually be like and how much better it would be to do this with a team uh, into account. You know, in Silicon Valley, by far not my ideological friends, uh, a lot of those companies have 20% time where they ask employees to spend 20% of their time innovating things. That's where we got Google Translate from. That's where we got Google Maps from. The best stuff really comes from time and space that people have to innovate, to be together, to work in teams. So let's support that here in the Department of Community Care uh, in a place that really reflects our values going forward as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Kristen Sykes, oops. Can you unmute? Great, can you hear me? Super, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kristen Sykes. I'm the president of the Mass Bike Connecticut River Valley chapter and I'm also... You're, Kristen, we're losing your audio. Can't hear you. Kristen, Kristen, we can't hear you at all. I'm not sure you can hear me. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hold on. Kristen. I can't hear you. Can't hear you. All right, I think she's getting the message. Kristen, I'll come back to you. Um, Javier. Can 
-hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, I don't have my regular setup, so I know how this is sounding. Um, thanks for <laughs> letting me talk, uh, Council President Chara. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to say thank you to, to the City Council, because the reality is that the Northampton Police Review Commission wouldn't have even been created if you didn't create it. That's a sort of a given. <laughs> and I know how hard the City Council President and the Mayor worked on, on the process of appointing us because I was part of the Northampton Police Review Commission. I was able to serve next to Carl Owen that you heard earlier during the public hearing. I was able to serve with Booker Bush, with Cynthia Supois, with Dan Kennedy, with Joyce Rosales, with Elizabeth Baraja Roman, uh, with Alex Jarrett and Michael Quinlan. Um, seven months after that, we came out with, with a pretty concise report of what we thought was important. The main, the essential, the key part of that report was the creation of the Department of Community Care. Uh, significantly funded, uh, that answers to those that it serves, the most vulnerable, and that, and that also has a diverse advisory board with people from criminalized and over police communities. Um, I appreciate that every single city council member has been really open to talk about this one-to-one -one, over the phone. Um, and I, I, I wanna say that right now, how the budget looks like is not enough. Uh, the One of the things that Dan Kennedy mentioned was that another really specific uh, direction that the Northampton Police Review Commission gave was that because it has to be a city department, because it has to be accountable to the people of the city from our community, has to be the foundational amount of money given to the department has to come from the city, not from grants. Every, and I, you know, we're in Northampton. I don't need to explain why grants can be really useful, but when you are attached to a grant cycle, I feel that the matters that we were ta we are talking about should not be attached to a grant cycle. That's important because that's who we are. Um, I really appreciate Joyce Rosenfeld for all what you said. I think it's really important to uh, to recenter the conversation where we are and who we are. Um, the department has to be well founded. The department has to give, and the city has to give the the open option to the new director to be able to do his or her work. Without real funding, as Dan Kennedy said, you don't have doers. You had management level people. That's necessary. It's it's. You know, from, from the point of view, I work for the ACLU of Massachusetts, as you already know. Th that's essential. Uh, thank you. Hopefully today your conversation is going to center on this issue and you will send a message to the mayor in relationship to have between $800,000 to a million funded to the community care department. Thank you. Um, okay, Kristen, let's give this a go. Okay. Sorry, and I, I didn't uh, articulate your um, gesticulating that you couldn't hear me. <laughs> so hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. I'm trying to be on my phone in the kitchen. Um, so I'm Kristen Sykes and I'm um, the chapter president of the Mass Bike Connecticut River Valley chapter. I also own a farm in Northampton, Pie in the Sky Berry Farm. And um, I'm also part of a group called Main Street for Everyone. And I just wanted to thank um, uh, Council President Ciara, Councilors Jarrett, Nash, and Foster for attending the most recent uh, Bike and Pedestrian Committee meeting where we had an opportunity to speak with uh, Tool Design about the downtown. Uh, we we're really excited that um, Mayor Narkowitz has chosen option three and we look forward to working with the mayor and the rest of the city council to uh, go even beyond uh, alternative three to make sure that we have a downtown that is uh, safe for everyone so that uh, it's safe for bikers, walkers, um, you know, folks that are driving and want to spend the day downtown and just to express the city council's um, support for this. And we look forward to working with you all moving forward 
to make sure that um, downtown can be as great as possible. So thank you so much for all you do and thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay. Next is Ezekiel Baskin. Hi, Ezekiel Baskin, Northampton. Um, I just wanted to echo what a lot of other people have said tonight, particularly the members of the Policing Review Commission who've spoken tonight. Um, $400,000, one and a half staff people is not enough to do what needs to be done this year. There has to be more funding from the city's budget, not from grants. And without that, we are not going to be where we need to be at this time next year. It's possible, it's possible to do this within the budget. Please make it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you're all putting in here. Thanks. Next is Shelby and Donovan. Hi, can you hear me? My computer's being a little strange. Okay. Yes. I think um, so. Just want to thank the council for creating the department um, of community care. Um, and I want to follow up on the comments uh, that Javier made. Uh, the department of community care cannot be staffed by a dedicated and diverse group as is recommended by the policing review commission without solid consistent funding. And this budget simply doesn't give this department the means it needs to meet the goals the community would like to see for this department. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jess Johnson. You have the opportunity to do one of two things tonight. You have the opportunity to do one of two things tonight. You can do something that seems transformational, or you can do something that is transformational. Creating and underfunding a department is not transformation. It could be made to seem like it, but it's not. It's not what we're here for. It's not what you're here for. We know it's not, and we look forward to you doing more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I see no further hands. Uh, Maddie Fisher. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, my name is Maddie. I live in Ward 3, and I go to school here in Northampton. And I, similar to a lot of others who have spoken tonight, have been to a lot of these hearings, but haven't spoken um, at any of them but I wanted to speak briefly tonight just to make sure the council hears the voices of the community, asking them to please, please defund the NPD by 50% and fully fund the Department of Community Care. Um, all that I believe and know has already been stated really, really eloquently by other community members. The police don't make us safer and cause a lot of harm, um, but I think we have a really incredible opportunity to create a peer led and run crisis response team as laid out by um, the commission that you created. And yeah, we're all counting on you as council members to do what is right and make this happen. Um, and we know it's possible. So please use your power to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emma Ryan. Um, hi, I'm Emma, and I also have been to many of these meetings and have not yet spoken. Um, I live in Ward 3, and I also go to school in Northampton, and uh, I, yeah, I just wanted to echo what everybody else has said, um, that it's your responsibility as elected officials of the community to listen to what the community wants and needs. And um, the Policing Review Commission has laid out a very comprehensive plan for meeting the community's needs and not heeding those recommendations is not serving the community. Um, and the, the only reason to not 
heed those recommendations is that you don't believe in our community and you don't value the time and energy and stories of those community members who have taken so many hours of their lives to to really fight for what they believe in and what we believe Northampton can be. And if you don't have faith and trust in this community, then this, this isn't the job for you. And if you don't have the, the um, courage to act on what you believe in and, and if what you believe in is our community, it seems clear to me and to many other community members that defunding the Northampton police by at least 50% and fully funding the Department of Community Care is the clear path. So please use your power and this time to make the right choice and, and really give your whole self to the community. That's what's asked of you as an elected official. And, and I, that's what I believe that you and we all can do for our community. So um, yeah, that's all, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Holly and Michael. Hi, um, my name's Holly. Michael's not with me right now. He walked out of the room. I um, have been a member of the community for quite a long time. Maybe 50 years ago, I would have been in support and said defund the police. Um, probably when I would have been protesting the Vietnam War, um, but not the vets. But as I aged, I'm looking and I'm thinking the defunding of the police is not the way to go. But I do believe supporting the community-based program um, certainly needs more support also. My second issue is um, I'd like to say that I support Alex Jarrett's zero, um, not the zero lot line, um, and getting at least 20 um, feet in between, um, and then what Bill Ryan was also supporting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I see no further hands. Oh, Danielle Amadeo. Hi there. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I'm actually um, at Salon 241 in Word 3. Danielle Amadeo, Word 3 here, getting a haircut for the first time and found a way to get on Wi-Fi to call in because that's just how important I think it is. <laughs> that um, city council really, really strongly advocate for defunding NPD by as much as possible, if not 50%, as much as possible. Um, again, I'm requesting that we not kneecap the Department of Community Care because at current funding levels, you're setting it up for failure. So if you actually believe that the Department of Community Care and what the Department of Community Care is advocating for is worthwhile in our city as so many people do, then please fund it fully and fund it, and fund it adequately. If you don't, you're setting it up for failure. It is malintentioned. Um, and that's how history will remember that decision. Finally, um, I, I got an email from my counselor, Counselor Nash, saying that um, so many people in Ward 3 are opposed to defunding NPD, PD's budget. And I'm, I'm curious about that because, um, and Councilor Nash, I hope we can follow up. I know I owe you an email, but I'm curious about that. And I'm wondering if um, city councilors might either be able to speak to in this context or in the future um, and release the, the actual numbers of how many people have showed up to calls advocating for defunding NPD and how many people have showed up not, or how many emails you're getting from your constituents advocating for defunding versus not because I think it's important to make that data transparent. It seems there's overwhelming public support for defunding NPD and for funding fully the Department of Community Care. And I think that um, if my perception is, is skewed, then I'd really like to see transparent data about that. Um, and again, um, encourage you all to be brave and know that the community is here to support you in making the decision to 
cut NPD budget, not keeping it flat, and um, and really fully fund Department of Community Care. Sorry, this wasn't the most eloquent um, comment, but thank you for listening and thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further comment, Laura, will you please uh, take the roll? Oh, wait, hold, I apologize, counselors. Hold on. Uh, Counselor Dwight, can you unmute? Done it, I'm here. Okay. Counselor Foster. Here. Counselor Jarrett. Hold. All right, give me one second, everybody, so I can find the council. And Councillor Jarrett, there you are. Here. Councillor Labarge. Hold on, Councillor Labarge. One moment. There you go. Here. Okay. Councillor Mayori. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Quinlan. I see his hand raised. Hey, there he is. Hold on. Uh, okay. There you go. I'm here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Oh, one sec, one sec. Oh, you should be able to unmute, yes? No? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, here. Okay. I lost my screen. Right. Why? Madam President, you have quorum. Okay, thank you. Give me one moment while I just make sure that I've got everyone so that they are able to unmute themselves. And okay, hopefully I do. All right. Um, let me. So apologies, I've got two screens working this meeting. So give me a moment. Okay, we, okay, so now that we've convened, um, I have to announce two public hearings for June 17th to meet legal requirements. And then after that, my goal is for us to recess for the finance committee and take up the general fund budget and the enterprise and the, and the revolving funds. So first up is an announcement of public hearing on package of National Grid Verizon pool petitions 21.257, 21.258, and 21.259 to install a total of three poles on Finn Street, King Street, and Myrtle Street in connection with the Mass DOT King Street reconstruction project. That's petition number 24881246. For Mass General Law, chapter 166, section 22, the City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, June 17, 2021 at 7.05 p.m. on the joint petitions National Grid, Verizon New England, and the sole petition of National Grid to install a total of three poles upon, along, under, or across one or more public ways, Finn Street, King Street, and Merle Street. Instructions for accessing the hearing may be found on the June 17, 2021 City Council agenda to be posted at www.northamptonma.gov no later than 48 hours prior to the meeting. The city council will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. Then second public hearing, announcement of public hearing on 21.279, National Grid Verizon Pool Petition for Pine Street. This is petition number 30336314. For Mass General Law, chapter 166, section 22, the Northampton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, June 17th, 2021, at 7.15 p.m. on National Grid Verizon New England's petition to install one jointly owned poll on Pine Street. Instructions for accessing the hearing may be found on the June 17, 2021 City Council agenda to be posted on the City Council City website, northamptonma.gov. At least 48 hours prior to the meeting, the City Council will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. Um, okay. Uh, before we recess for finance, I will just quickly see if there are any um, chair uh, announcements or updates from committee chairs? Or how about one minute announcements? Okay. Seeing none, 
then we are going to skip down to the finance agenda and we will recess for finance. Laura, will you please call the roll of finance? Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Okay, first item is approval of minutes from the previous meeting. That's May 6, 2021. Uh, is there a motion? Motion to approve. To approve. Second it. Motions made by Councillor Thorpe, uh, seconded, I think, by Councillor Quinlan. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. The minutes have been approved. So first up, okay, so bear with me for a second. Um, okay, first I'm gonna go to Councilor Jarrett, exactly. Uh, thank you. So I have a conflict of interest on one item in the general fund budget. It's Pedal People's contract with central services. And for the discussion in the full council, we have made arrangements to consider this item separately but that isn't possible in finance. Uh, so I can't participate and will be recused. Okay, thank you. So Councilor Jarrett's recused. Um, so I will go ahead and read this, but first let me just kind of set the stage. And uh, you might remember this from last year, but we did this really, really early in the morning last year. So um, because of Councilor Jarrett's conflict that he just explained, he's precluded from participating in the discussion of the order on the general fund budget um, so as we did last year to allow him to participate, what I would request is that for the finance committee, we move these items forward to the full council and then have, um, have the full discussion in the full council to accommodate Councilor Jarrett being able to participate. So that would be, um, it's, it's up to the council to do that, but that, that would be the request I would make. Um, normally we would have a full discussion here, but as just explained, that's not possible, including Councillor Jarrett. So I'm gonna go ahead. Um, okay, so this is 21.280 in order to approve FY 2022 uh, general fund budget. And I will read some of the order, although not all the figures. Um, okay, so this is in the city council, June 3rd, 2021, upon the recommendation of the mayor, um, ordered that the sum of $100,446,866, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2022 general fund budget, July 1st, 2021, to June 30th, 2022, be appropriated for the purposes stated, provided that the appropriation for Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School shall be used solely for the purposes of meeting net school spending as defined by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And no funds so appropriated shall be transferred to any account or expended for any purpose that would not be included in the calculation of net school spending. To meet this appropriation, $1,200,000 will be raised and appropriated from parking meter receipts reserved, $1,042,931 from sewer enterprise funds, $614,707 from water enterprise funds, $85,720 from solid waste enterprise funds, $345,781 from storm water enterprise funds, $15,776 from Community Preservation Act administrative funds, $18,899 from the reserve for police station debt service, and $97,123.52 will be raised and appropriated. So, um, and then if you scroll down, these are the different departments and uh, their PS, um, personnel services, operating maintenance and other than ordinary maintenance um, amounts. And so for general government under the general fund, the total expenditure is $6,350,754. Under public safety, the um, full total expenditure is $14,835,407, education for Smith Vocational Agricultural High School and Northampton School Department, $42,790,910, public works, uh, three, public, um, uh, 
3,942,184. Health and Human Services, 2,209,594. Uh, Culture and Rec, 2,250,230. Debt Service, 5,061,624. Employee Benefits, 21. Uh, 21,421,693. Capital projects, 1,584,470. Um, for a total general fund appropriation, $100,446,866. Total budget general fund, 105,921,808. Okay. We have a positive recommendation. Second. Motion's made by Councillor Quinlan and seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um, sorry, hold on. Mayor Norkowitz, did you want to say something? Um, I, I thought you were moving it to the full council, so I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'm, no, that's fine. I just, it looked like you were trying to say something, so I just wanted to make sure. No, um, no problem. Okay, so if there's no discussion, no further discussion or any discussion right now, and seeing none, um, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that moves forward. Next is 21.281 in order to approve, approve FY22 sewer enterprise fund budget. This is. I'm sorry, yes. Hold on. Hold on, everybody. All right. Um, on the recommendation of the mayor, uh, ordered that the sum of six million one hundred and seventy-seven thousand five hundred be, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year twenty twenty-two sewer enterprise fund budget, July first, twenty twenty-one to June thirtieth, twenty twenty-two, be appropriated for the purpose stated. And to meet said appropriation, $5,134,469 is to be raised from sewer receipts and $1,042,931 shall be allocated to indirect costs. Um, okay, and there you can see on the screen the PSOM and OOM, total expenditures. Okay, so counselors, when you're ready. Move a positive recommendation. Second it. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion? Okay, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that moves forward. Next is um, 21.282 in order to approve FY 2022 Water Enterprise Fund budget upon the recommendation of the mayor uh, ordered that the sum of $6,945,000, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2022 Water Enterprise Fund budget, July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation. That's six million three hundred thirty thousand two hundred ninety-three dollars is to be raised from water receipts, and six hundred fourteen thousand seven hundred seven dollars shall be allocated to indirect costs. And there is again the the PS OM and OOM uh, getting to that total appropriation. Yep. Move with a positive recommendation to the City Council. Second. Motion is made by Councilor Labarge, seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Any uh, any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay. That was just water enterprise, yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Next up is... 21.283 in order to approve FY 2022 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. Councilor Jarrett. Sorry. Okay. Um, so again, uh, so Pedal People has an extensive business relationship with the Locust Street Transfer Center. So I will be recusing myself from this item both in finance and in the full council. Okay, thanks. Um, 
I'm hearing that I'm freezing up. Is that, can you guys hear me? Mm-hmm. That's the Mets? Okay. Um, I hate to do this, but let me try turning this off and tell me if that improves, okay? Um, okay, so 21.283 in order to approve FY 2022 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget. Ordered that the sum of $665,045, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2022 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget, July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation. $423,840 is to be raised from solid waste receipts. $85,720 shall be allocated to indirect costs and $155,485 will be made available from the retained earnings balance of the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. And there again on the screen is the PSOM and OOM total expenditures. Motion to move this forward to the uh, full city council with a positive recommendation. Second. Second. Okay, motion was made by Councillor Thorpe and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Did turning off my camera improve things? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is 21.284 in order to approve FY 2022 stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget. Uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that the sum of $1,996,486 uh, um, $986, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2022 stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget, July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation. $1,647,705 is to be raised from stormwater and flood control receipts and 345 1,781 shall be allocated to indirect costs. And there on the screen is the, the PSOM and OOM for that total appropriation. I make a full recommendation to city council. Second. Motion is made by Council the Barge and seconded, I think, by Councilor Thorpe. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that moves forward to the full council. And we are at uh, 21.285 in order to approve FY 2022 revolving funds. This is upon the recommendation of the mayor. Ordered that in accordance with Mass General Law chapter 44, section uh, 53 e and a half, the city shall vote the limit on the total amount that may be expended from each revolving fund established by chapter 16 of the city ordinances. And here are the funds listed. Um, and the annual spending limit on the screen. Move a positive um, recommendation. Second. Motion was made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Is there any discussion here on the revolving funds? Okay, seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that moves forward to the full council. Um, so there are four other orders on the finance agenda and actually one, the next one, 21.286, the request has been made to continue that to Monday, June 7th. So um, we can skip that one. And then uh, I think we can do these next three if that's okay with everyone else. Okay, so we're at 21.289 in order to approve Mayor's Youth Commission Gift Fund expenditure for t-shirts. And this is upon the recommendation of the mayor 
ordered that the Northampton City Council in accordance with the Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 53A, Grants and Gifts, Acceptance and Expenditure, authorizes the expenditure of up to $258 from the Mayor's Youth Commission Gift Fund, Fund 2514, to be used to purchase t-shirts by t-shirts by the Youth Commission. Yeah, move this with a positive recommendation to full city council. Second. Motions made by Council of the Barge, seconded by Councillor Quinlan. Um, we can also, uh, Mayor Narkowitz, do you want to speak to this now or we could speak to it in the full city council? Whatever your pleasure is, I can certainly wait to the full council. It's a, okay. it's a um, significant appropriation, but we can wait until we get to the council. Okay, why don't we go ahead and do that? Um, so if uh, there's no further discussion, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that moves forward. Next is 21.290 in order to appropriate $435,653 uh, free cash to Academy of Music restroom expansion and renovation. And this is upon the recommendation of the mayor ordered that the sum of $435,653 be appropriated from the FY 2021 general fund undesignated fund balance free cash to the Academy of Music for expansion and renovation of the restroom facilities. Move with a positive recommendation to full city council. Second. 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 Motions made by Councilor the Barge, seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Um, any discussion now? Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. And Councilor Shara. Yes. Okay, that moves forward. Next is 21.292 in order to appropriate additional $608,500 from various sources for roundhouse parking lot reconstruction. This is upon the recommendation of the mayor. Order that $608,500 be appropriated from the following accounts to provide additional funding for the reconstruction of the roundhouse parking lot. $200,000 receipts reserved for appropriation parking fund 2312. $26,925 remaining funds from prior parking maintenance vehicle purchase. Um, and then $381,575 for capital from capital stabilization. Move a positive recommendation of full city council. Second. Motion made by Councilor Quinlan, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion here or now? Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay, that moves forward. Um, and we can now close out the Move finance. To adjourn. Second. 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 by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um, roll call, please, Laura, on adjourning finance. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. Um, we have adjourned finance and we are now back in the full council. And we are going to uh, go straight to financial orders. So, all right, this will take a second for me to get set up again. Okay, so again, this is a process we did last year, but um, it's, it's a little bit complicated. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm gonna tell you what I need for our motion and then I need someone to then make that motion in second it's like a call and response. Um, and it's weird because I can't see me doing this and you can't see me doing this right now, but it's, it's gonna work out. Um, and I thank Laura and the solicitor and, uh, and Susan Wright for helping update this flow chart that I've got going here. So our first step is to put um, a motion forward to adopt 
the FY 2022 general fund budget. So we're putting a motion on the floor to adopt the general fund budget for discussion. This is where so you all moved. Second. Second. Okay, motions made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Now, I need a motion to divide the question to separately consider the $40,000 line item in the central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract. I move that uh, we separate the question um, about the, the line item uh, with, that contains the pedal. Right. Yeah, thank you um, for purposes of discussion. Okay. Thank you. Second. The motion has been made by Councillor Dwight and seconded by Councillor Mayori to divide the question to separately consider the $40,000 line item in central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract. So is there any discussion on dividing this question? So the, the original question is a motion to adopt. Okay, so seeing no discussion, roll call please, Laura, on dividing the question. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Um, so Councillor Jared is refused. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Oh, yeah. Um, hold on. What's going on with Councillor Nash? He must have got booted out. Here you go. Councillor Nash. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, so the question is now divided. We can invite Councillor Jarrett back. And <laughs> so we are now going to deliberate and vote on the adoption of the FY 2022 general fund budget with the $40,000 line item removed. That's where we are right now, okay? And we've, the, it's already on the floor. So both the adoption is on the floor and it has been separated. So picture it as like two separate things on the floor. And right now we're, we're handling the, all of it, but that $40,000 line item. Okay. All right. Um, discussion, Mayor Narkowitz, would you like to join us? I'm gonna turn this back on and see if it works. Tell me if tell me if it doesn't, but it's weird not being in the netherworld. Okay. Uh, Mayor Narkwitz, can you unmute? Are you able? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So adoption of the budget, discussion. Is that a hand, uh, Councillor Mayor, then Councillor Jarrett? Got it. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I'm grateful to the mayor um, for this budget in general. I'm, I'm grateful that he uh, clearly was listening and responding to the police review commission's recommendation that Northampton establish a new department of community care. And I was no less than thrilled to see um, the community care department listed in the budget book. I'm also grateful to the mayor and Senator Joe Comerford for pursuing the $150,000 state grant to supplement the department of the community care's budget. So I'm looking at the numbers. So that puts us at, so there's four, uh, 423,955 is listed in the budget, I believe, for the, the Department of Community Care, plus the $150,000 state grant puts us at 573,955 at this point. So what I'm seeing is 308,647 more needed to meet the minimal funding recommended by the Policing Review Commission. 
uh, to assure the viability of our investment in this department and in the safety of all of our residents. Here. We, uh, we have an agenda item tonight for our approval uh, of a slightly higher amount, 435,653 for the Academy of Music's bathrooms. I, I consider the Academy of Music um, in Northampton like a treasure, a Northampton treasure, and I plan to vote to approve the funding for that. But I wanna illustrate how on the municipal level, the missing 308,647 is less than a bathroom renovation. The 882,602 uh, uh, that, that was cut last year um, you know, it seemed like the mayor had been willing to spend that amount on public safety in our last budget during a struggling financial time. So I ask, why not this year? If new vehicles were worth that uh, last year to you, Mayor, why, you know, why is the safety and the peace of mind of our of multiple community members not worth it this year? Uh, the council, say for one abstention, unanimously passed a resolution supporting the 14 uh, recommendations of the Policing Review Commission's recommendations, um, and this budget is not there. My concern is that we're going to waste the taxpayer money by not fully investing and committing to this new department with the new services it will be tasked with. I want the best and the brightest candidates for our Northampton Department of Community Care. The, the Policing Review Commission and similar models in cities with similar demographics demographics say the proposed amount of money will not get that for us. And referencing the council resolution in support of the recommendations of the Policing Review Commission that we just passed, is this a meaningful investment um, that as Council Dwight added um, to our resolution assures viability? I don't think this amount assures, of, uh, assures viability. I'm concerned that the Department of uh, Community Care uh, that has been recommended uh, to the mayor uh, and the council by our own appointees is kind of being set up as um, commenters have said to fail. Northampton has evidently been talking about providing cost-effective and quality alternative police um, alternatives, public safety services to our community for 25 years, which I didn't know until reading the budget book. That was very interesting to me. So why are we unnecessarily slowing that process down? It feels like there's ultimately a, la a lack of confidence in the idea of alternative services and a standalone accountable department. I asked my fellow city councilors to support our own council resolution. Uh, we also passed a resolution in support of and committing to actions at the federal, state and local level to combat the public health crisis of systemic racism. But to quote that, we. I will quote it, we have an obligation to advance racial equity by undoing the inequities found in the law and to proactively pass ordinances and make budget decisions to address inequity. We will act to update ordinances that have been shown to have a disproportionate impact on communities of color and adversely affect vulnerable populations. We also consider these impacts during our annual budget process as financial orders and as financial orders are brought to the council. Uh, we also said we should, we'd like to shift uh, municipal resources from punitive approaches to public safety, um, punitive approaches to public safety to supportive and restorative ones. Also from that resolution, we support the work of the Northampton Policing Review Commission created on July 9, 2020 to study and make informed recommendations for the change uh, to the city's approach to policing. I truly appreciate the start, but I think we can do better not next year, now. I will support this budget if the Department of Community Care is funded at the level recommended by the Policing Review Commission or higher. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Narkowitz? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, councilors, and um, thank you, Councilor Mayori, for your uh, comments and, and your questions. Um, so, um, I guess, well, I guess, first of all, I would just, with regard to the, uh, the capital order related to the Academy of Music, um, clearly uh, we have many, 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 many capital projects that are uh, more expensive than just general operating uh, revenue. And so, you know, from paving to, I mean, so there's plenty of examples. I think the real comparison would be to look at, you know, where this department um, 
you know, would fit relative to other departments. And again, this is a, this is sort of the initial phased budget for those departments. Um, I don't know if I'd be um, allowed to share my screen, uh, Council President, but I, I just have, um, I, I'd like yeah. to, I'd like to just be able to show a, um, to show a, a, a chart that we've developed. Um, so this is actually the 2022 budget, um, uh, general fund budget. Um, someone had shown a chart in a previous meeting that isolated the police department. And so I wanted to isolate the Department of Community Care as proposed. Um, and these are the other 12 plus budgets um, that are actually, uh, that the Department of Community Care is funded at a higher level then. And that includes our senior, senior services, senior center, that includes the auditor, that includes Parks and Rec, that includes Lilly Library, includes the city clerk, it includes our HR department, it includes the assessor's office, it includes one of our major divisions of the DPW, um, it includes the city council and city solicitor, it includes parking enforcement, uh, and it includes our arts and culture department. So I just, I think it's important to put it in context from an operating budget to operating budget, because, um, you know, I, we can certainly show capital projects that are, you know, in excess of many of our operating budgets, because it's the difference between capital and operating. So I guess I would just start um, with that as a starting point. Um, in terms of the recommendations, um, I am extremely grateful to the um, Northampton Policing Review Commission for the work they did and the recommendations um, that they made. Um, and, um, and I have done my best in this budget to come up with what I believe is a, um, is, is a meaningful first allocation of funding. Um, it is important though for me to just again say that the, the commission provided um, a very broad overview of what it wanted. Um, it, it obviously um, looked at examples of other um, models around the country and pointed to other communities that were doing this work. Um, and then it arrived at a, a very specific model um, and, and asked the city to pursue that. Um, and so I have, I have, you know, we had a good discussion about it. We had a good discussion with commissioners about, you know, the pluses and minuses of that approach and obviously other successful models that don't follow that approach. Um, but I took it away from that joint meeting that we all had um, that the commission and the council felt very strongly um, that we wanted to create a model that somewhat unique um, but but was what folks wanted for Northampton. So that was sort of my, my starting point. In terms of the budget, again, we've had long discussions about the $880,000 um, as a number. Um, it's not a real number. It's not a number that has that is factual. It's not the, it's not the amount of the cut that the city council made um, to the police budget. I mean, it's, it's just it's just factually not what was cut. Even it wasn't even what was cut from what you voted on on first reading to what you voted on on second reading, which was closer to six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So I understand that that number has become sort of this um, larger than life number that's taken on its own meaning. Um, but but no matter what the number is, um, the way we create budgets is not. And even so, then we go into the report, and the report says explore reinvestment opportunities, and it essentially references that $882 uh, dollar number um, and says that, you know, our interpretation of the budget cut by the city council is that it was made in the spirit of reinvestment in our community. Um, and so um, that is where the recommendation came from, but it did not provide a it, sort of the, I've, I've heard um, in public comment and in other places that, you know, they, they provided a clear, a clear um, detailed uh, you know, first budget or what, what, what was needed to fund uh, this department. Um, and there is no detail. And, there's, and, and again, I understand the commission was asked to do a really large project um, and to make up uh, sort of larger recommendations. And then the understanding is that the governmental body of the city that has fiduciary responsibility, the mayor and the city council, would then take those re recommendations and actually try to translate them into action through the budget. So, um, so where I, st my starting point was what is the best way to get this, um, you know, to get this department, um, form it formed and, and get it, get it started and get it, um, up and running in a way that it could then be fully expanded, hopefully by the FY 2023 budget. I would also say that, you know, I've heard 
a lot of concerns about grants and um, tonight or, or the grant that I requested, the earmark basically that I requested uh, through Senator Comerford, um, the NPRC also went on to say, we encourage the city as part of the establishment of the department to include securing grant funding um, in addition to funds allocated by the city uh, to supplement the cost of building new programs and services. So um, the approach I've taken, I've looked at what other communities have done. I've looked at how many of the other communities that are cited in the report um, and the approaches they've taken. I've also, you mentioned, I've cited uh, Northampton's own experience with um, the evolution of the way we've approached public safety um, with a very similar model of, of converting um, our dispatch from, from uniformed um, officers and firefighters to civilian dispatchers. Um, and, and I believe that what, what, what we need to do is we need to um, I put somebody uh, in charge of this, a, a senior level staff person um, who is now going to take these very broad recommendations um, and actually then make, try to make them actionable. Um, and we've, I've tried to provide them with staff. I've tried to provide significant funding for any of the additional, additional studies uh, that may need to be done. And, and it may just be that we need to do some of the data analysis that, the, that even the co-chairs mentioned when we had our joint meeting, that there were some data analysis that the committee didn't, the commission didn't have the time or expertise um, to try to further evaluate. So, um, so that is the approach that I put forward. And the goal of it is, again, not based at, not based on a number, but what's based on what I believe will get the department, this new department, um, you know, off to a strong start and get and get the work underway. Um, and again, that includes developing, you know, how much staffing do we need? How much staffing would we need? Um, how many community responders would we need? Um, what would those job descriptions look like? What would be what training or, or, or qualifications or certifications would be necessary? What, what, what about the coordination with the other public safety departments, dispatch, all the things that are mentioned in the report. Um, and so that, that's really what I believe the work will be over the next several months, just like it was when we made a decision, when a report was issued, that we want to move away from having police officers and a uniform firefighters doing our emergency dispatch, that we wanted to move to civilian. And so it took, you know, we brought in an experienced administrator who had experience in these types of organizational structures, who then set to work um, doing that coordination, doing that collaboration, uh, doing uh, the work about creating job descriptions, determining how many, how many civilian dispatchers would it take um, as a standalone department to handle uh, the 911 needs of the city. Um, going after state grants for which there's significant funding in terms of dispatch, um, E911. Um, I see the same thing happening here, not just this earmark. There is a lot of grant funding available um, as, as policing reform all across uh, the nation has been, um, has been moving forward. And that includes federal uh, grants, including the ARPA funding that's, that's uh, becoming available. There's also grants um, you know, directly uh, related to programs like CAHOOTS that are being scaled up nationally um, and funding is being pushed out. And at the state level as well, there's funding coming down uh, from DMH and from other agencies um, that are sort of right in line with the kinds of things we're trying to do. So there's a, there's a, a part of it that's pursuing other funding. Um, in terms of the concerns about one-time funding, um, I totally get that and agree with that. And actually it's one of the things I've been talking about in terms of why we didn't reinvest um, the funds that was one-time funding uh, that, we were, that we were sort of borrowing from our uh, stability fund last year. Um, you know, because we're starting a new department, because there will be one-time costs of starting a new department that could include vehicles, it could include equipment, it could include training, uh, training classes, it could include bringing in um, someone to help us uh, recruit and train staff, um, many one-time expenses. And so grant funding uh, for the startup of something like that is perfect. That's exactly the kinds of things that in the EMS, I'm, I'm sorry, the E911 arena, um, often uh, grants are made available to buy new consoles and to invest in the equipment that's needed to support an expanded or regional uh, dispatch center. So, um, so that's really my approach. I, I understand the, I understand the, 
sort of the passion and the symbolism about that number, um, that that became kind of a rallying cry. Um, but I have an obligation uh, to the taxpayers and as the chief executive who has to uh, create a budget that is actionable and reasonable and can actually carry out what we're hoping to do to try to come up with um, you know, very clear budget numbers that fit that purpose. Um, so, and then the only other thing I would say to you, because I, I want to address the concerns I've heard about, well, what if we want to hire up staffing sooner? I believe this budget provides that flexibility. Um, as you know, uh, the council uh, frequently will have a department come to you, um, or actually will have the finance director or the mayor come to you and say, you know, we, we want to move money from um, OM, the OM side of a budget to the PS side of a budget or PS budget to the OM side. Um, so we've got a lot of flexibility that the, I, when I put that $300,000 um, into the OM side of that budget, um, you know, that's a, that's a number that um, is not really, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a um, suspiciously round number as, as, uh, as folks often refer to in, in budgeting sometimes, because I wanted to put a significant amount of funding in there um, that could then be transferred into PS. Um, mid-budget year if we needed to. And I mean, already that 150,000 that we're receiving could easily offset OM funds um, that would be one-time spending. So that would you know, free up 150 in OM that could move over to PS. Um, again, I, we, we don't know how many staff we would need for this. We don't know how many staff we would need to do a, you know, a, pilot, a daytime pilot and then just to ramp it up into an overnight um, uh, operation. Um, but you could imagine that that would be the type of funding that could be available um, to move over to higher um, staffing. And then, of course, obviously, the council, um, you know, mid-year, we, we frequently come to the council if we do need an additional money um, to, um, to expand a department or create a position that was unforeseen when we started the, the fiscal year. Um, and again, grants are also part of that in terms of, I mean, this whole budget you know, is, is filled with examples of how we needed to add staff urgently during the middle of the budget year um, to address COVID. Thankfully, there was grant funding um, to, to pay for it, um, but that happens all the time. So I believe that this is a significant um, investment in the Department of Community Care. I believe that, um, again, this will be a senior level staff person who will report directly to the mayor um, and is on an equal footing with other department heads. Um, and we'll have the full authority to advance this project. Um, I also think that you know, you're gonna need to, this, this um, individual is going to also need to put together an advisory group. Um, you know, if this is truly gonna be a department um, that seeks the input of, of end users and stakeholders and, and the folks to be served, it's gonna require that as well. Um, and that's a very common model when I look around at what other communities are doing. So um, I wanted to make sure we had administrative staff to support such a group um, and to be able to help with grant writing and to be able to help with any of the other issues. So, um, you know, this I, during my time as mayor and during my time as an elected official in Northampton, I've been involved in uh, departmental reorganizations. I've been involved in departmental mergers. Um, I've been involved in the elimination of city departments. So I am very much aware of um, what it will take to do that within the, you know, within the workings of how uh, municipal um, uh, finance, as well as municipal personnel law, as well as procurement and all the other factors. So I believe and, and that this is a um, significant amount of funding. Um, I think even if you look at some of the other initiatives that are happening in other places, um, when you look at proposed budgets for, you know, what the city of Ithaca in its first year proposes, it's in line with what they've proposed, what they're estimating for their budget in the opening year um, of a process again that where they're bringing in someone as a coordinator, as a project uh, manager um, to get the to get the to try to take the recommendations there. It's 19 recommendations and move them from recommendations to action. Um, so. That would be my response to that. And again, I appreciate all of the, all of the time and effort that went into them. Um, but you know, when you put together a commission, they, they make recommendations um, with the understanding that then those recommendations must be taken by the, by the governmental leaders of the city who actually have a fiscal authority and fiscal responsibility. And then we have to turn it into um, what we believe will, um, 
work to carry out those um, those objectives. So that would be my my statement in terms of what this number represents. Mayor, did you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. And I I do really appreciate. I am aware that you there was a pivot in response to what the community is uh, to create a unique model. And I appreciate that you were responsive to that. Um, you know, I think Dan Kennedy spoke very eloquently about the grant funding problem. And I, I just want to say that, you know, this 800 number is, it's, it actually happens to be the, the, the number, 800 million dollars is what it, across the country with similar models it takes to, to have a viable alternative um, police structure, like the alternative to police structure, like we are proposing um, function. And so it's in fact, uh, anyone who thinks the 10% that proposed uh, cut that I proposed and was passed last year was, was just a random number, it wasn't. We had, we ran the numbers, the sociology department at UMass, it was the excessive amount of officers that we uh, had in a pandemic year next, um, that we were told was because we have visitors and tourists. We did not have that in the pandemic year. And it also happens to be the amount, and I knew this last spring, that it takes to get this type of alternative off the ground. So it doesn't have to be 880,000, it can be a million, but I don't think it's enough. And I don't think we'll regret adding $300,000 to this budget. And I think we'll attract better candidates. And I'll let other counselors speak. Mayor Narkowitz. Um, I, I, I guess what I would say is um, I, I, I was at those meetings, Counselor, and I do not recall you ever saying any of that, making that justification. I don't remember that. that we, number... we showed the grant. We showed they showed those graphs, and I would like to see the graph of the police department budget next to the community care department. And so budget. you knew you knew this time last year that there would be a proposed department of community care. No, um, I knew how much it, it took. Be proposed by a commission that had yet un been unformed that you didn't vote for? No, I knew what cahoots, I was looking at cahoots. I was looking at all those programs last spring and I knew how much it took to get them off the ground. And I also knew how much excess uh, officers we had in a pandemic year for a, for a city that was shut down. Well, cahoots is off the ground for 30 years and it's, and it's at, it's at 800, How it's operating 000. now. Okay, we're not gonna talk over each other people. Okay. Um, who I counselor I feel like I saw Counselor Jarrett, then I saw Counselor the Barge, Counselor Foster, then Counselor Quinlan. Counselor, oh, it's all of you. Okay. Counselor Jarrett, then Counselor LaBarge. I'll start making a list. <laughs> thank you, Council President. Um, Mayor Narkowitz, yeah, thank you for moving. Counselor Jarrett, you're freezing. Why don't you try for that animation? Counselor Jarrett, you're freezing. Oh, and okay. you're gone. Yes. Oh, no, you're great. Okay, go ahead. I turned my video off. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay. So, oh. Mayor, thank you for moving this important initiative, that explanation. Um, oh, it's yeah, it does <laughs> say my internet connection yeah, is yeah. unstable. It's not. I'm sorry. sorry. It's not um, much better. I let's let other better. counselors speak and we'll come back. Okay, um, Council of the Barge. Yes, thank you, Council President. Um, first, I wanna say that I applaud Mary, the Mayor Narkowitz for including in the budget for the year 2022 budget, a commitment to stand up and place a new Department of Community Care. This is critically important because it says the mayor has heard loudly, loudly and clear, the central recommendations of the re-imaging safety report of the Northampton Police Review Commission. And we all heard many, many people throughout the city of wanting a community care put in place. And it's happening, it's happening. I wrote this up because I had a lot of thinking to do about this. The budgeted amount approximately around 424,000 when increased by the 150,000. And I wanna thank 
Senator Joe Campofer for working with the mayor and helping us get that 150,000. Grants are very, very valuable. And, and I have to say, I did hear some remarks about grants and I disagree with that. Our Board of Health gets a tremendous amount of grants and also in the mayor's office. Anyways, I, I, you know, you tally this up and we're looking close to $574,000. And yes, I want to thank Councilor Rachel Muir about that 880,000. I really think a lot of people actually thought that was the amount of money that we had to fund the place with. And I think the mayor explained it very thoroughly. I also questioned too about the Academy, I mean, about the Academy of Music, but looking at the budget and what is needed for it, I understood that. I have another problem too with the hub that's being put in place and we're doing the parking lot there, but it's needed because of the sewer system down the line. So that's my thoughts about that. Anyways, I just want to say why this is not comparable to the 880,000 originally proposed by the commission is indeed a start. The mayor is there a possibility of examining the American Rescue Plan, especially the funding mayor for state and local phys physical recovery and for city's capital projects to support new program development called for by the Policing Review Commission. And I'm just asking you that, Mayor, if you could answer to that, please. Uh, yes, most definitely, um, Councillor. Um, you know, our my staff has been spending most of its days on webinars, um, like many municipal staffs and county staffs around the nation, um, learning more about the American Recovery Act, or ARPA, as it's sometimes called. Um, the um, interim final regulations were released about a week ago. Um, and yes, that's, I really said interim final regulations um, because they're not the, I guess they're not the final ones. Um, and so we are, uh, we are scouring that document and we are uh, working to go through the, those regulations. And again, working with MMA and the National League of Cities, but, but um, you know, those funds are designed for um, pandemic recovery and, um, and so, and certainly housing and houselessness and um, those types of issues related that have become exacerbated by the pandemic, um, I believe will be eligible um, as is with any of these grants, the devil is in the details, um, but that would be my um, expectation and we'll be you know, coming to the council um, with uh, more details about the entire um, ARPA uh, program and, um, and working uh, with the council, I hope, to um, to put together, um, you know, to get some to get some advice and to um, set up a, a process for how we're going to um, work to get these funds out into the community. Um, I also want to say that you know, in that same state budget, um, that the same uh, FY twenty two uh, state budget, um, there's also um, language that um, Senator Comerford has been involved in. Um, relative to uses of DMH funding, um, that have, then there's then there's language that's been added to um, state law um, in an outside section uh, that again speaks to these kinds of alternative uh, programs um, that could um, that are being that are being looked at. You know, not just here in the valley with you know Amherst and Northampton and other communities, um, but also all across the Commonwealth. Um, so there's even, there's going to be additional state funding um, as well, or grant opportunities um, that are that are being sort of shifted um, toward this model. Um, there's also, you know, the, the um, you know, the recommendations of the NPRC also talked, uh, talks about, um, you know, the co-responder the, the co model as one of, there's peer responders, co-responders, and civilian advocates are sort of, is sort of the full uh, bullets of the staffing um, potential staffing and there's and there are co-responder grants um, which are currently available um, that um, that um, communities around us are looking at um, and so that is something that we the city of Northampton is also looking at and again that would be something um, I would plan to bring to the city council um, to uh, to um, 
to get feedback on as well. So there's a lot, this is obviously a field where there's a lot of interest right now because of the reform efforts that are happening all across the country. And so there is going to be additional funding available and we'll certainly um, pursue it. And Northampton has a pretty good track record in terms of pursuing grants. But again, um, I understand that um, these grants are really for startup and therefore, you know, starting something new. Um, and so uh, that's really um, how we would use them and how we would pursue them. Um, and so the goal would be, uh, so again, like take, take, take this budget, for example, by way of example. So 300, um, 300,000 of my proposed budget for this first year um, is O&M basically for one-time studies. Okay. So one-time studies. So, um, so that means next year, um, without increasing the budget for it, that 300,000 can immediately be shifted to PS if it doesn't happen in the middle of the year. Um, so again, $300,000 for staffing um, that could immediate, that does not require an additional budget increase because these are one-time sort of startup funding um, in the first year that you that may not even be, may not even use all 300,000 of it. We may not need it. And we may be able to shift some of that immediately uh, to PS. Um, and for those watching at home, the budget is broken down into two state sort of state DOR categories, OM um, for operations and maintenance and PS for personal, ser personal, ser personal services. Um, one is the sort of the people side of the budget, salaries and benefits. The other is anything that's not the, the uh, you know, the cost for, um, you know, equipment or the cost for utilities or cost for any of those other non-personnel related things. And by state law, um, when you pass a budget tonight, you'll be voting on budgets that provide a PS and an OM. Um, and by state law, we the uh, departments cannot move money between PS and OM without coming back to the city council um, uh, on a past budget. And the counselors know that, you know, um, finance director Wright frequently comes to you at the end of the year and she's asking to move money from PS to OM to fill shortages um, because of changes or other issues. So, um, so there is the flexibility to do that um, in this budget. And again, and that's, that's not even talking about the potential of, of appropriating additional funds uh, to the budget. So, um, so again, I feel very confident that this, this gives us the resources. And again, I say this in the context of we're you know, trying to create a balanced budget. We're also trying to um, renew a fiscal stability plan um, that will, that, that, and without having to tap into any of those fiscal stability funds in the first year so that we're able to extend um, our, our, our sort of budget stability for funding all of our services for five years. Um, so I, I know we're focused on this one particular budget, but I do want you to understand that the full context in which um, we're trying to make these investments. What I wanted to ask you, Mayor, on the American Rescue Plan, do you know possibly what they're looking at for each city or town to get? Yes. Um, so the um, they're they're uh, publishing numbers for all communities based on a number of factors, um, and so um, with uh, the one of the biggest metrics they're using is our community development block grant allocation. Um, and so there's a number that's assigned to Northampton and all other communities that's related to CDBG. Um, so I believe that number right now is is looking like 16 million dollars. Um, and so that is, um, and again, there's, there's, um, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, regulations attached to it, sort of four main areas that it can be used for. Um, it must be spent for COVID related recovery. It must be spent, you know, uh, or allocated uh, within two years, and it must be fully expended within, I think, a total of five years. But what we're, again, broad brushes at this point, um, and we're trying to better understand um, you know, what, what that can be used for. There's sort of four overarching categories um, that, 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 that uh, they've outlined, that were outlined in the original law. Um, that includes, um, you know, that includes uh, uh, COVID recovery for individuals and for businesses. That's one big uh, piece of it. 
Um, there's also replacement of local revenue, the, uh, lo you know, lost local revenue. So, you know, all the shortfalls that so many communities experienced in parking and meals tax and other uh, shortfalls that affected so many budgets. There's uh, one of the one of the four provisions is for that. There's also um, in a water. Uh, sewer, stormwater, and uh, broadband infrastructure is one of the other categories. Um, and then the final uh, category is for um, hazard uh, pay uh, for, um, for employees um, during COVID. Um, so those are kind of the four large categories that you know we were talking about for months after it passed because that's all we knew. Now we've got a little more detail. Um, and so now there's a massive sort of Q&A going on between um, cities across cities and towns across the country and the Treasury Department um, in terms of trying to suss out uh, what 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 it can really be used for and what the process will be for how it gets spent and how it gets approved for spending. Um, I can tell you, having just come out of um, the COVID process where we were using FEMA money and CARES money, um, the regulations were very um, uh, complicated and um, changing, seemingly shifting all the time. Um, when we were told something was allowable, then suddenly six months later, it was not. Um, so I, we very purposely did not build this budget with ARPA funds, um, A, because we didn't actually, they weren't fully sort of um, distributed at, that, at the time we were writing the budget. And we also feel that, um, you know, we also feel that this is a very specific sort of one-time a pot of money um, that's not really for funding operations of the city, it's really for COVID recovery. Um, so that's the approach we've taken. The other factor, um, and I know I should probably stop because we're really getting far afield from the budget, um, is that um, the state also received a significant like $3 billion plus dollars um, in ARPA funds, and they are going to be setting up um, programs um, as well. So the other exercise that, that we're sort of going to be going through is not duplicating those programs, you know, not, not duplicating our efforts and spending money on things that we can get funding from the state. So um, it's, uh, it will be significant funding, but I do believe that there will be um, ample opportunity to use some of those ARPA funds, again, to, to potentially backfill some of this funding that's in this budget um, that could then be freed up and shifted um, to other areas um, uh, midway through the fiscal year. So yes, that's, that's what I can tell you at this point. Um, we're hoping um, to be able to come back to the council um, later this summer um, to talk a little bit more in detail about ARPA um, and, and the way that we're um, looking at it. Thank you, Mayor. Um, also, in your, in your budget, you mentioned what is possible in the year one for year 2022 with this new department. It will support the hiring of a project manager, an administrative assistant, and technical consultation from others who have direct program development experience in creating their own city's alternatives to armed policing for 911 calls that don't involve violence. Well, when I looked at the American Rescue Plan, in it was some involvement of what cities could get and so forth like that, that it did state if also it would fund if you had a new department or a new program in it. So I'm hoping that that's still there, that language, because community care will be a new department. So maybe possibly we'd be able to get some funds from them. Now also to um, this first year budget also supports a more thorough community needs assessment than was possible for all our volunteer police and review commission to conduct. Funding a needs assessment is very, very important. And I know people who work through DMH, I have worked with people with disabilities all my life it's extremely, extremely important. Also in that first year budget, we look more through community needs assessment than was possible for all our volunteers, police and review commission to conduct. And we know that the funding assessment is very important. 
everyone that I have talked with in Northampton, people that I just talked with Tuesday night, and this is what I am hearing. Whether they feel that safety means leaving the police budget as it provides funding level, or whether they feel that safety means having non-criminal social need. Calls rooted to a separate department. The truth is that the city of Northampton needs to try to bring all residents, and I'm talking about all residents, along with the development of this new department. All residents deserve to see how the new department will work with other city departments, including the NPD. All residents deserve to feel safe. And as a counselor, and I know all the counselors, we want everybody to feel safe in, the, in our city. And also to feel safe and to know that respect for them as human beings will be protected. And that is very, very valuable to me as a city council, that all is being treated as human beings with being protected. In closing, I wanna say mayor and to the city councilors that I strongly believe the city needs an advisory committee to guide this first year process in the initial development of the Department of Community Care. We have so many talented residents in this city and I have two special residents, qualified social workers, one who was on the police commission and was very knowledgeable, which both of them are. But I know many, many caseworkers throughout the city. I feel that there are so many residents who could lead and lend their expertise to guide the new project manager and administrative assistant in writing a mission statement, developing job descriptions, and figuring how the new department relates to the other city departments, which we just heard the mayor talking about that also. So I wanna thank you, Mayor, for listening and the city councilors and the residents in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council of the Barge. Mayor Narkowitz, did you wanna respond? Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor. I just I wanted to quickly, though, just modify, uh, amend slightly what I said about ARPA because uh, the 16 million out refers to the direct um, appropriation to the city. There's actually an additional 5 million um, that we believe the city will have access to um, that was actually um, allocated to all the counties across the United States and um, including in Massachusetts. But for um, counties like ours that no longer have county government, um, the act calls for um, a, a, a portioning the funds out to all of the communities in that former county. So um, with the additional about approximately 5 million, it actually brings us up to 22.5 million, I think is the total between our direct and county allocation. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you were citing language from CAHOOTS, uh, or, or rather from the ARPA Act um, related to this type of work. And there is, um, there is actually, um, uh, uh, funding that was outlined in, in ARPA. Um, it was actually um, um, Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon, who has obviously, Oregon is home to the CAHOOTS program. Um, and he's been every year introducing a CAHOOTS Act or a CAHOOTS sort of pilot act um, to try to spin up CAHOOTS across the country as a model. Um, and hasn't been successful in terms of getting that adopted, but um, it was incorporated into ARPA and there is language in there. So uh, we believe that there will be funding. I don't know if it's gonna come um, from the Department of Justice or it's gonna come to the states and then be uh, pushed out to communities. But as I said, this is definitely, um, you know, something that's part of both our state and federal um, uh, budgets right now. The other thing I wanted to say is I agree with you about the, um, uh, the, uh, an advisory committee. I think I called that out in the budget as, as one of the things that, um, that this um, project manager um, would, would need and would need help with. And, and we would obviously need to work with that person to form um, such an advisory committee. Um, and again, that's a very common model. The other thing I want to say, and, and, it, and, it, and it's sort of about technical support, is I've been having um, communication um, with the Center for Policing Equity, um, which folks may be um, aware of. They're the leading um, nonprofit that's doing um, a lot of this work around the country, um, including, including, you know, in Ithaca, 
Um, they're the they're the sort of the consultant to Ithaca, and they've been working in Minneapolis. Um, and I've actually had a meeting with their team um, to talk about the work that we're doing here. Um, and they are very interested in the potential for providing um, some technical assistance to Northampton. Um, and again, they um, they are a 501c3. And so they actually do this work as part of their sort of, um, they're not a professional consulting firm. They do this work as part of their mission in terms of um, uh, what they're doing around the country. So um, so that's another potential that's um, uh, not a, it, it's a, it's not a grant, it's not dollars, um, but it's some really significant expertise um, that they could bring uh, to this process. And, you know, they have actually shared with me um, some job descriptions for these types of coordinator positions um, that have been set up for other programs um, in other parts of the country um, as sort of models for what um, Northampton may want to do. And they've certainly offered that when, if, if and when there is a proposal in place, that um, they would be willing to continue our conversations about what, uh, what, what hiring someone like this would look like and the type of expertise that would be needed, um, as well as um, any other advice. So um, we are, you know, I am, I am uh, taking this uh, recommendation very seriously. And, um, you know, I, uh, I think I've said this last year, um, when I expressed my frustrations about the process as it unfolded last year, that, you know, I am someone that, um, you know, takes this work very, you know, takes this work of public policy and of our municipal government governance very seriously. I'm, I'm very data driven. I'm uh, very much into um, trying to gather experts, um, ex outside expertise, um, and trying to put in place what we need um, to be successful in whatever we're doing. Um, and so, um, you know, now we are in a position, I think, where we have a recommendation, um, and I want us to then um, further explore and 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 build out that recommendation, um, and hopefully put it in a position um, so that when you and um, when the next council and the next mayor um, are looking at a budget for FY 2023, um, that there will actually be a, a, a much clearer blueprint for what this. Um, could look like as a fully operational department. I, you know, I thank you, Mayor, for that. Um, I have to agree. I, I heard tonight again the urgency. Once you go ahead and hire Mayor, the two employees, I am urging you, Mayor, to please put in place the advisory committee that is in dire need to work with those two people. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Councillor Jarrett, let's go. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, but it's already a little hinky. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, I know it immediately says your internet connection is unstable. I'm so sorry. Um, well, try turning I'll off turn the off. camera. Yeah. Yeah, I'll turn off the camera and you can let me know if it's too bad. Okay. Uh, like maybe I can figure out how to call in if that's the case. Um, <clears throat> so, Mayor, thank you for moving this important initiative forward for all your explanations there. I think they were very helpful, um, <clears throat> and I'm glad to 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 have those that clearer picture. Do you have a sense of the ongoing budget amounts? I mean, I know. <clears throat> Part of this is, is all about doing the research this year to determine that. Um, but if we look at what, uh, if you're looking at what other programs are out there um, and wanting that to be ongoing, non-grant non funded, non -grant funded in, the, in the longer term. Um, and I guess my concern is, you know, if, we're, if we have now filled out this budget allocated money um, <clears throat> to other areas of the budget, uh, even because in order in this year, we need to uh, get um, <clears throat> that we, we don't expect to spend as much as, as we would perhaps once it's all established, or we would be getting more money from grants to do that work. But how will we, or won't we have to just take money from other areas of the budget to then fund an ongoing stable um, budget for this? 
Um, thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Um, you know, in terms of the way I look at this, there's going to be a lot of one-time costs that um, will will not be um, you know repeated in in coming fiscal years. Um, you know, sort of like the same kinds of one-time costs that we needed when we made the transition I referred to earlier towards uh, dispatch um, and uh, towards civilian dispatch. And so I believe that this ultimately, when you look at the amount of PS money in this budget, um, that it will not uh, and and versus and the OM amount um, that that this is a this is a significant um, first budget for a department that only exists um, you know in a few paragraphs in a report. I mean, it's a significant investment, and so I believe this will be enough for us to get it off the ground um, and then really understand what 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 the full staffing may look like. Um, but again, I'm, you know, compare it to other standing departments that, you know, that I showed you earlier, like these are other standing departments with, you know, multiple staff and, um, you know, and significant operations. So um, this is not a small amount of money. And as we move forward into future years, um, you know, there obviously there will be choices just like we have to make in every uh, department as to what if there are positions that additional positions that need to be added um, and how we will pay for them. Um, so, you know, again, this, the budget that I'm uh, presenting this year, um, you know, we are, um, it is not a net increase in, in staff from the prior year. Um, you know, we're, we're basically trying to recover some of the staff that we um, had to eliminate last year because of COVID. And, um, you know, so, you know, it's the same evaluation that will take place every year um, but I believe this is a significant amount of funding. And I believe that, you know, as I said, the 300,000, um, um, you know, just, I, you know, we don't know what, you know, again, you, um, the, the request is that we have a city department. So for example, you know, we will, this, the court, the project coordinator is going to have to develop job descriptions um, and he's going to have to run them through our HR process. And they're going to have to go through our HR um, grading process. Um, which is in accordance with, you know, our collective bargaining agreements for how uh, grade, you know, how positions get graded, and then we'll have a better understanding of what the salary range will be. Um, but, you know, even, uh, you know, um, I don't, I, I don't even want to venture a guess, but really, you also have to understand that in a, in a departmental budget, you know, we are only covering salary. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure um, when you look at other departments in other places, um, you know, including Cahoots, where there's a, a per, there's a contract price um, that basically covers, you know, salary benefits and OM and everything. Um, this is a salary only budget because the way we pay for benefits in the city is that they're not paid out of each individual department. They're paid out of a, a separate line item. So, um, again, think of that 300000 alone. Um, as well as additional OM uh, funding that's in that budget, um, as if you translated that into pure salary dollars, um, you know, that would be three $100,000 a year positions, which I don't think we'll be doing that, but, you know, um, you can do the math and understand how many positions that could stand up almost immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we, you know, this, this will, um, this will take time and this will, you know, I understand the, um, the urgency. There's also, as I said, um, you know, the co-responder uh, piece of this, there's the, there's sort of the peer responder. There's also the co-responder um, that's, uh, that's listed in your report um, in, well, in the NPRC report that you were a member of. Um, and, and so co-responder is a whole other area um, where there's, um, there's been new funding, um, you know, new funding that's been made available for that, not only through grants, but also in the way um, that the state is treating um, reimbursements for Medicare and Medicaid um, and allowing these types of services to be reimbursed uh, through that type of funding. Um, uh, much like we, you know, much like we get reimbursed, you know, our, our, our EMS system is um, significantly reimbursed through insurance and through Medicaid and, and, um, and, and those types of insurance programs, either public or private. So, um, so that's another avenue that we have to factor in, in terms of um, how, how this would be fund, how this could be uh, funded. Um, so that's the, um, you know, that th those are just some of the other factors that people may not be thinking about 
um, when, when that goes into what could be funded with this money that, that's in there now. Um, and, you know, departments grow from year to year. Um, and so, um, you know, that would be part of the normal budgeting process. But I, I you know, I strongly disagree um, that this is a not a significant amount of funding or, you know, not a fully funded community care uh, department, as I've heard many times. Um, nobody has shown me what that budget is supposed to, what that budget looks like or uh, because we don't know what it looks like because we need to we need to understand what the department is um, and then we'll be in a better position to do that. So I guess that would be my response. Thank you for that. Um, one question also I have about has to do with accountability. And I thought I would read just from the report, NPR, NPRC report. Um, so it's, quote, uh, this department also needs to be accountable to those that it serves in a way that is not currently seen in city departments or by social servants, service agencies who contract with the city or state. Governance of the department should include people with lived experience of criminalization and marginalization and those impacted by it. Uh, these people should be prioritized in hiring decisions at all levels. This includes, but is not limited to black and indigenous people, people of color, immigrant, working class people, unhoused people, disabled people, people harmed by sexual, domestic and psychiatric violence, youth, LGBT, BQ people and people of marginalized genders. Without a direct charge to include these individuals and represent a balance, any department that is crafted would fail in its equity and justice goals. Um, and so if you could speak um, briefly to um, the thoughts on how to implement that recommendation in terms of the um, advisory and um, the general running of, of the department. Well, I mean, again, this gets into how we will, how we would work to develop an apartment and, and understand how it would be um, integrated as a municipal apartment, uh, department. And, um, you know, obviously I've already mentioned collective bargaining and, um, and I've mentioned, you know, we do have a fairly clear structure under our charter for how, um, you know, for, for how our city government operates. Um, and so what you're proposing would be um, somewhat of a significant departure from that. Um, and so we would need to understand how that, how, how a model like that, uh, how, how and if it could be um, accomplished. And again, um, you know, we have, we have, you know, collective bargaining agreements that have very clear understandings about lines of supervision and professional staff and professional supervisors and managers and grievance processes um, and all of those other issues that would have to be understood. Um, you know, we don't have employees right now that report to non-city employees. Um, we don't have a structure like that. We don't have anyone, you know, anyone that works for the city that reports to someone who is not a city employee. Um, I don't know that you'd find that structure in any municipal government. So that's going to, that's an interesting, that's going to be one of those areas that has to be un understood and explored. Um, and to see whether or not that's you know possible. Again, that's a that's you know that's an issue in terms of that's one of the contrasts um, from you know um, contracting with a private organization, for example, um, or a nonprofit that may have that type of structure. Um, but you know um, it'll you know I understand the the desire to have this be part of a municipal government structure, um, but you also have to take, you know, the good with everything, what comes along with that, that, you know, what will come along with that and the challenges that will present. So that is going to be one of the pieces of, you know, having, um, you know, having a strong advisory board. Um, uh, but in terms of making fiduciary or operational or personnel decisions, um, that would be a, that's going to be a, an interesting, um, puzzle to understand how that would fit within the municipal governance structure, um, which again is yeah. governed by laws, it's governed by ordinance, it's governed by collective bargaining agreement. Um, and so that'll be the challenge. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I mean, explanation, I, I, I recognize the challenges and I appreciate that. Um, it sounds like though it's one that, that you're willing to, to put forward as let's see what we can do with it. Let's see how we can create a, a structure that that uh, a, you know adheres to these ideals. 
Um, so I appreciate uh, that willingness to think about it. Um, yeah. Lastly, um, I've heard from many the uh, to a suggested name change just to the community care department rather than department of community care uh, because of the acronym similarity to the department of corrections. Um, uh, maybe we'll even come up with an even better name, but I just wanted to put that out there and I think I'll start calling it the community care department. So um, thank you. Although um, those of us who are recovering Catholics will then think it's, um, you know, CCD, which was, uh, you know, the, uh, Catholic education we all had to go through. So that, you know, it's a mixed bag either way. But um, I guess what I would say to that is, again, I, I tried to adhere to what was in the, um, you know, what was in the actual re recommendation. Um, and again, I think what would have to happen for this to, to be when, when it's fo fully formally organized um, as a department that will have a mission and will have, you know, any other aspects to it when it actually gets put into our administrative code. Um, you know, that would be what the, um, what I said in my message would be the next mayor would propose an administrative order to actually add it to the administrative code. So that would be an opportunity uh, if there was a name change um, for that to happen, you know, or, or some other way to, um, uh, you know, whether it's DOC or whatever, you know, whatever, pick your acronym, but that could certainly be accomplished. Um, I just didn't feel it was in, within my purview to start making those kinds of changes at this initial stage, but certainly that's totally within, you know, the purview. You know, a few years ago, we created the uh, the public shade tree committee uh, commission. And then we, you know, a few years ago, we changed it to the urban forestry commission. So um, that certainly could be accomplished by administrative order. Um, I primarily wanted to just, you know, honor the recommendation and have this as a budgetary separate department in the budget. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Foster, then Councillor Nash. Thank you, Councilor Shara, and, and thank you, Mayor. Um, I have three questions for you. Um, before I ask them, I just wanted to make a couple of observations that are not directed at you, but sort of um, about this in general. I've heard in the last year, I've talked with um, so many people around Ward 2 and, and indeed around the city about, um, you know, ab about policing, about the NPRC, about the work that was being done. And, and I just continually step away and even after public comment tonight, um, just impressed with how compassionate and caring our community is. And that starts at the grassroots and, and it's um, going up through municipal government as well. Um, you know, I've certainly talked with a number of people who had just never considered that their experience of policing isn't the same experience that other members of the community have. Um, but I've noticed that the, through those conversations and through bringing in, um, you know, many of the comments, um, you know, that we've been hearing through this process um, from people who have spoken up um, and shared their stories, um, by sharing that with, with other folks in the community who had just not considered this, um, there's a tremendous amount of support um, throughout the city for this idea of approaching issues right now that we've handed to policing because the police are there, they're working 24 hours a day, um, they're willing and they've taken the, these um, concerns on, but there's also tremendous community support and a lot of compassion for, oh yeah, you know, that, that mental health issue or, um, you know, this, this um, issue that's coming out of um, homelessness or, or all of these, um, you know, really needs that we see in our community that need to be addressed uh, there's quite a bit of support for addressing them through a new department of community care. And that's just something that conversations that I've loved having, and I'm really grateful um, to NPRC uh, for their very hard work, um, you know, throughout the last year uh, and for the report that they've issued. And, um, you know, I, I want to express my very, very strong support that um, a new department be a municipal department, um, you know, and, and I understand that as you mentioned around hiring processes and, and, collective bargaining and all of those things, you do take, take the good with the challenges, um, but I think codifying it in our city and in our budget um, is, is the good. And I really um, am thrilled to see it um, in our budget and, and to begin the work this year. And 
you know, I, I think it, it, it's easy to say, or, or I can say, sure, I, yes, I wish it were more. Also, as we're talking tonight, and I hear the eye you have on grants and on other potential sources of funding and recognizing there are an awful lot of one-time startup costs um, that can help to fund the beginnings of the department and you know, hearing where other sources of funding can come for. I hope we do see budget transfer requests uh, from OM to PS. I, I uh, would certainly support those um, in, in order, you know, as a counselor in any way I can to see the department be successful. And I know um, sometimes that, that takes time and it takes time that we don't necessarily want to take, but at the same time, um, I, I understand we need to have those things in place in order for the long-term success of this department. And I appreciate that. Um, so now I will ask you my three questions. Um, the first is you had brought it up uh, when you were talking before, and it was a question I was gonna ask you because fringe benefits and employee benefits are not included um, in the salary line of any of the departments. Um, so I was going to note that, that that does actually increase from our municipal budget, what is um, heading toward this department. But that led me examining more carefully as well um, on page 159, the employee benefits line. Um, I noticed a huge jump in workers in unemployment compensation from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21. And I, I can give you a second to get there. I'm, I'm sorry, I sort of jumped from the department to this really specific question, but I, I do want to have it answered while we're talking about the budget. Um, You're just, muted. Oh, okay. Could you repeat the page, Council? Yeah, yeah um, page 159. Okay. It's the I'm, employees. I'm actually going to also ask our, our finance director to be part of this uh, conversation too, because um, she's much more well versed in the workers' comp and those line items. Um, Great. Do you have a chance to thumb so you're looking at those? the you're looking at yeah. the benefits chart, correct? Do I'm you, looking at the benefits chart. Okay. Yeah. Nine one one nine nine one nine. Okay. And which particular line are you looking at? The Three, four, five, six down the unemployment compensation line. Yes. Okay. Um, um, so from FY twenty to FY twenty one, that it just jumped in, in a number that that really um, surprised me, and I'm assuming it's pandemic related. Uh, but it jumped from $14,076 to $103,935. And I was wondering if you had a sense, or uh, I'm sure Susan does, um, the ac close to the actual number for FY21. And then if that projected FY22, that 100,000, if you anticipate that going up and down and if any of the rescue funds may be used to help offset that. I'll let you go ahead, Susan. I mean, we are looking at a chart that's comparing actuals to budgeted, so that may be, explain some of the, the some of the d disparity. But go ahead, Susan. Uh, that that is correct, Mayor. Um, we typically budget about one hundred thousand dollars or one hundred and ten for unemployment. We have two lines. One is the actual unemployment because we're self-employed for unemployment. So if someone self-insured, yeah. self-insured unemployment, um, we pay the cost 100%. Um, so if you look at the 2018, the 2019, and the 2020 in the budget, those were what we actually spent. The 2021 column and the 2022 are what we budgeted. And um, we did not spend um, a whole lot in 2020 because the CARES Act, we were allowed to use um, CARES Act funds to cover unemployment costs. So we did um, lay off a fair number of employees in, in multiple departments. Um, I can think of some, the, the senior center, because the senior center was closing down during COVID. And all of those unemployment costs were picked up um, in the CARES uh, Act. Um, and we will not spend a lot in 2021 either. Um, one thing I will note is, you know, the unemployment claims are not always necessarily for an employee that we might have laid off. An employee can leave the employee of the city, go work somewhere else, and perhaps get laid off or let go. And because we are the employer in a period of time from the time that they file for um, benefits, they go back a certain period, 
sometimes we have to pay unemployment on employees that um, may have worked for us, but their unemployment situation is not a result of their employment with the city. So it's a number that can fluctuate from year to year, um, but typically we have been reserving about 100,000 a year, but we haven't been spending that um, at least for the last two years. Thank you, that was, that was really helpful. Um, I appreciate that explanation. Um, and so my, my other two questions were um, re more related to the Department of Community Care. Um, Mayor, as we were talking about grant funding, you know, I definitely have heard this concern um, as well from people, um, you know, that because it's not, it, it's not necessarily something that you can count on, it's very hard to, to run a department. I hear your explanation that um, there is money set, set aside and a significant um, money set aside to get it started as well as, as down the road, many grant opportunities for, for some of the one-time costs. But um, I was wondering if you talk, could talk a little bit about some of the municipal grants um, that we're seeing in other departments. So I know the health department, um, you know, has, has had some significant grants, planning and sustainability. Um, it might be really helpful just for context of what's possible um, in, in terms of sort of years and specific projects. If, if you could just off the top of your head, if there are a few that you wanted to highlight. Only the health department, um, you know, uh, Director O'Leary was with you um, at the last meeting. And, um, you know, if you actually look in the in, in many of our departments, um, you will see that there is often a sort of a supplemental column that talks about grant funding um, that does support some of our positions. Um, so health department's a great example. I mean, we have a general fund budget for that department. Um, and then we have a number of employees uh, that are, are supported through multi-year federal grants, uh, particularly in the area of uh, the work they're doing around opioid and, and substance use um, um, uh, work. And so, um, so there's you know, significant multi-year federal grants um, that are that are paying um, for those salaries, paying for some O and M costs, um, et cetera. Um, you know, the senior center is another great example. Well, a senior service is another great example because there's formula grants that come to every city and town uh, for seniors. It's based on a formula, um, and so there you'll notice in their department that there's grant funding um, that supports it. So you know, there are cases where we do integrate um, some uh, grant support. Um, into, um, into our department, you know, CDBG um, allows you to pay for some administrative costs. So we do, um, so we do fund um, uh, salaries from CDBG. Um, so yeah, definitely grants are significant um, and we are, you know, very actively pursuing them, not only for one-time projects, but also, you know, to set, to start up programs. I mean, the, the Prevention Coalition is a great example of the substance use work uh, we've been doing in the schools for the last 10 years that have been fully funded by federal grants and paid for a coordinator for 10 years. Um, you know, and so now we now we're working to integrate that into our uh, budget permanently. Um, you know, clean energy grants, you know, the green community grants, um, you know, you can pretty much go across the board. And, um, you know, there are, are many grants that are helping to support um, important parts of our city mission. Um, every year, you know, chapter 90 for paving projects uh, in the DPW. Um, you know, so it's not uncommon. Obviously, we, you know, we, we are always mindful when we get grants because we want to make sure that they're, you know, sustainable and, and that if we are going, going to, you know, um, pay for any aspect of staff that we know that we need to be prepared um, and understand the long-term sustainability of that. Um, you know, the schools is another example. I mean, the schools rely significantly on millions and millions of federal grants through Title I and other programs. So, you know, they have whole teaching positions, you know, Title I reading teachers that are fit, funded entirely by federal grants. Um, so it's, it's not an uncommon model across all of our departments. Um, and uh, so that's certainly common. But again, we, we you know, I think that um, I am, I'm, I'm, because this is such a new and emerging field um, and there is such a interest in it at the state and federal level, I think we would be remiss if we didn't pursue these grants. And, you know, I know when I talked to Senator Cumberford, you know, about, about requesting an earmark, you know, this is something she's seeing in many of the communities in her district, which is why 
um, she was able to secure the funding. And, you know, there's also outside sections of the budget that has language related to this kind of work as well for DMH grants. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, there will be funding there, but obviously we, we also want to build a stable, sustainable city department that's, you know, funded, um, you know, that can be supported by the general fund budget as it grows out over time. Um, even the, even the 911, the, you know, the, the, um, you know, our department, uh, the public safety communications center there, they, they receive, um, E911 grants from the state that go to every, every, um, you know, uh, PSAP they're called, but the, you know, all of the, all of the 911 call centers, um, around this, around the state on a formula basis. And it's paid for by your, a fee on your cell phone, um, that then goes as a formula grant to, um, to all those 911 centers in the state. So, um, you know, and I, and I referred to the whole reimbursement issue that's now out there and available in terms of, uh, particularly for co-responder models where, um, where there's been uh, increased flexibility in terms of if a co if a social worker that's part of a co-responder program with a city or town um, that's you know obviously work not working directly for the city but is part of a program there's reimbursement for their work um, directly through Medicaid and Medicare and, and, and insurance in some cases as well um, so that's kind of a long rambling answer I but but um, suffice it to say that we have a lot of experience with grants and we are um, I think our city has been very sophisticated in how we use and apply for and pursue and integrate them um, into the mission of our city. Who's, whose responsibility? I guess this gets into my third question, which part is a, is a statement and I've heard talk about um, the need for an advisory committee with the department. And I just also want to urge that the search for the director also include um, people who are invested in, in who we've been talking about, whether it's members of the MPRC or, or people who um, can really use their own experience and their own view on the community in the search um, for a director, um, which is gonna piggyback onto my question of who would be responsible for seeking and applying for those grants? Is that coming from the mayor's office? Would that be the director's responsibility or is it kind of a shared? You know, my sense would be, it would be a, it would be a, you know, it would be hopefully the, the project manager, you know, that would be part of their key responsibility, but obviously, you know, we work collaboratively, collaboratively across all departments and, and the mayor's office on grants, you know, on, on grant writing. And sometimes there's multi-departmental grants um, that we get information from, you know, lots of departments. So I can certainly see, um, you know, this being, um, you know, a, a collaborative work, um, particularly because you're often needing to get information from other departments. You know, you, you know, we've talked a lot about how dispatch might be really important in this process. And so trying to understand how, um, how this would integrate with our dispatch system and other public safety agencies. So, yeah, I would think that this part of this uh, person, um, role would be um, working on um, looking for these potential grants, which again, as you're as you're developing what the what the what the department's you know mission is and staffing is, you know you're in the best position to be able to to identify grants that support that. Um, so, and then in terms of the hiring, I mean, uh, you know, as counselors know. Um, I, whenever I, um, you know, do a, a hiring for, you know, like a department level position, um, you know, first of all, that requires confirmation by the city council um, under our charter. Um, and so I have a long his record of putting together um, a screening committee um, that includes, you know, typically some city employees, it includes city council um, and other um, you know, stakeholders or people with expertise. So I can certainly see that putting together a screening committee for this type of a hire would be, you know, would require a screening committee. And I, you know, um, uh, uh, former NPRC members out there listening, don't be surprised, you know, be careful what you ask for because you'll probably get a call. Some of you will get a call to serve on this uh, screening committee um, and, um, and other community members as well. So um, yeah, so that's how I would approach that. Um, and then really, I think the, you know, I, I wouldn't want to, I, I think it would be, I wouldn't want to form an advisory committee um, for a department without having this 
person in place first. I feel like that would that would be um, you know that would be too sort of top down in terms of you know that person really um, you know work you know help being at the ground floor of forming that advisory committee and being part of that process. So um, so I see the first step obviously is the um, you know if this budget is approved and if the funding is available then you know developing. You know the job description and and uh, putting together a, a, a screening committee um, to work on that first piece, um, and then um, and then really the next piece would be to get this advisory um, committee in place as well. I mean, again, advisory to this department. Not you know, obviously we've had a commission that studied these larger issues and made recommendations, um, and now we have. And again, this is not. You know, this is not uncommon, you know, um, with what's happened in, in other communities. Um, uh, you know, you know I, keep, I keep using Ithaca as an example. I mean, they got started many, they got started long before us, um, you know, and their, theirs was in response to a, a state mandate that came down, um, you know, from state government that all, all you know, um, municipalities in New York state had to go through this process and submit um, a, a sort of a, a blueprint for what they were doing in the area of police reform. So they they were at it um, before many other folks, um, but they're still in a process. I mean, they're still in a process of, you know, um, doing additional uh, stakeholder input and putting, you know, putting in place what they think is necessary, coming up with budget estimates um, and, and trying to understand what their revised Department of public safety, um, or I forget what the terminology will be, but sort of this combined civilian and police department that they are moving toward. Um, so, so again, we're, we're, we do have some other examples that we can look at for guidance and how this process has worked. Um, and then that, and that's where I think that, um, that's really where I think that, um, you know, a, an organization like Center for Policing Equity, Equity will be really helpful advisors as well because they've been working with so many other communities in this work and they're really seen as the among the leaders in this effort. Thank you, that was all my questions, appreciate it. Okay, Councillor Nash. Thank you, Council President. Well, you know, I, I just want to do hats off to my colleagues for asking all sorts of great questions. You've pretty much asked all of my questions, uh, uh, except for one, and that is, uh, Mayor, uh, in terms of this new department and how it relates to the Resilience Hub, I, I mean, I, I look at the, I, I can't help but see lots of overlap there. And um do you see that as well? Is there is there going to be? Go ahead. What what do you see for overlap there? Um, well, you know, to be clear, the the resilience hub has been a project that we've been working on for much longer um, than and than than this effort. And obviously, you know, as I said before, when we had our joint meeting, I'm grateful to the um, NPRC for for you know acknowledging it and and calling out its importance and and. Um, and obviously that's going to be, a, um, you know, the, the resilience hub, you know, is a facility at this point that we're working to develop. And then on a separate track, we're working to develop, you know, the services that will be uh, co-located um, in that particular hub. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see the, at this point, I, I see them as two separate initiatives. Um, and, um, you know, there may be, obviously there, you know, there may be some um, coordination and an overlap of services at, at some point, but I really view them as two separate distinct initiatives and um, that we're focused on. And, um, but obviously, you know, you can understand that, that, um, that there'll be, there'll, there'll need to be coordination among um, those same stakeholders and, and service providers that may be involved in the resilience hub uh, we'll probably be, you know, be working with um, members of the community care department um, as well as our other city departments. Um, but at this point, I do still, you know, view them as two distinct projects, and um, and we're sort of again working on two tracks of first trying to secure and and build out a facility, um, and then second, and then on a parallel track, you know, working um, uh, working to actually create the, um, you know. Uh, 
sort of the operational piece. Um, and I think I mentioned to you at a recent meeting that you know Community Action has um, secured a grant, I think, from the Beverage Foundation, um, and they are um, advertising right now uh, a resilience hub uh, sort of community collaborator, uh, I think is the job title, which is sort of a community organizer position um, th to begin the work of, of outreach to, to the uh, various communities and stakeholders and agencies uh, that provide these kind of services to, to really try to build what the vision will be. Um, so that's sort of where we are on those two tracks. Um, but I, I do, I mean, I, I obviously view it as a type, you know, as, a, as part of our overall efforts to support um, the needs of the community and particularly the needs of our, of our most at risk members of our community. Um, and, um, and obviously in, you know, the, the Department of Community Care is a, is a way of creating a, an alternative police response um, to the needs of our community um, as well. So it, I think it's all under the same umbrella um, but I don't see the two um, as being sort of merged together um, in this context. Interesting. I, I, I just, in my, you know, in my view, I would see overlap, um, but I, I definitely see that the two uh, initiatives will be, there's a potential to be serving similar populations, you know, uh, providing the service uh, the, the, the more long-term supports as opposed to the emergency immediate supports. And, um, you know, and how those two go together is, I think it's going to be critical. Um, yeah, and I mean, and, and no doubt, I mean, one of the goals of the Resilience Hub is to try to help provide, um, you know, support and shelter and services to people um, so they don't get to the point of crisis um, where, you know, a where a community care worker from the Department of Community Care or Community Care Department, whatever um, the proper uh, title will be, um, does not have to respond to someone in crisis because we're working to, to serve their needs and um, and before they get into a crisis situation. So I think they're, they're you know, they'll be both working um, towards similar missions, but, but obviously more complementary, I think, um, of the work. But again, these are, you know, these are all, you know, these, these are all things that uh, to be thought out going forward. And obviously things can evolve over time. And, um, you know, as I said, my, my goal at this point was to put in place the initial funding and um, knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be uh, turning over the reins to another chief executive and there'll be another city council, um, you know, sworn in in January. So, um, but I, I feel like what we've put together, what I've put forward in this budget, um, gets us started on the um, on a positive footing to move forward. Yeah, and I really appreciate that, Mayor. You know that the, you know the the uh, Department of Community Care, the Resilience Hub, uh, the looking for co-responders, the outreach with Community Action to help. Um, you know. At, at, additional programming there. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if something else comes along in the next few months as well. I think that, you know, I mean, I total all of this up and, you know, and it looks like we're committing a little over, you know, roughly two and a half million dollars. You know, if you look at all of the different programming, you know, if you put the Resilience Hub, uh, you include that as part of it, along with all of the various uh, the um, programming that we're doing, that's, it's a significant commitment. And I, I think that some of that is getting lost in, in the discussion around the $880,000. I, I also want to say that, you know, I, that I've been doing some research and CAHOOTS runs about $800,000. That's the, the contract with Eugene. And that, um, that Eugene has a budget that's roughly six times the size of ours, and that um, that Cahoots is about eleven percent, or no, it's 011 percent of the um, of the Eugene city budget. Um, Mr. Buckley pointed out before that you know that what we're allow allotting is is only 0.3 percent. If you add in the hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you know now we're pushing north of. 0.4%. Um, 
and that um, that for I, what I'm trying to say is that for a city of our size, that we've you know when you look at what we're dedicating to help people at risk in our community, it's 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 very substantial, and that um, that for I, and I also want to add that um, that a an important piece that. Um, that I'm really grateful to the Policing Review Commission for is that the way that it has brought Northampton to consensus. And, and this speaks to uh, part of what uh, uh, Danielle Amadeo was raising with me earlier, that, you know, where is where are these folks who are saying, don't, don't defund the p police and also fund the Department of Community Care? And I can tell you where they are. I, as a counselor, I walk down the street and I talk to them. I, I get emails from them. I get phone calls from them. They, they, they don't show up at this meeting and um, at, at council meetings. And, uh, but there's a clear consensus in Northampton that um, we don't wanna defund the police. And we also, people are firmly behind this idea of a department of community care that that we need these types of services, just as Councillor uh, Foster was pointing earlier. And I also wanna point out who's missing from this conversation because it really points to how much Northampton is behind this, that this is a city of fiscal responsibility. If, if we are being fiscally irresponsible, we will be hearing about it. And that the, the, the people get that we need to uh, allocate these funds and create this department. And um, so anyway, I, I, I'm going to support this budget and, um, and appreciate the, um, the effort you've put into this mayor. And um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Quinlan. Oh, it's Still really, uh, yeah, it's really great to, to be in, in, colleague with all of you as you've asked so many great questions that I had written down before. Um, but I did want to change the subject for a second, Mayor, before talking about the Department of Community Care. And I wanted to ask you about the Office of the Assessor. Last year, Councilor Jarrett uh, had brought this up and I had uh, circled it on mine as well. So this is page 32 of the budget. Two people last year were receiving pretty substantial raises. They were going from about 42,000 to about 51,000. So it was a you know, 17, 16, 17% increase. Both those same people are scheduled this year for a $4,000 pay cut. And so I'm just trying to understand what's happening there uh, because you know, they are, um, you know, last year there was a discussion about the fact that this was uh, because they were at a certain level on the, uh, pay scale so that, you know, and they were stepping into these positions. So that's how they were paid. But when you see as someone's pay going down, I was a little concerned. I just wanted to kind of understand that. Why is that happening? Yeah, I'm going to have to ask uh, D Director Wright speak to you about this. I think it's a combination of hours and some other staffing changes, but I'll have um, the director uh, walk you through this. Great. Thank you. Okay, I don't have the actual salaries in, um, from last year here in front of me, but the main reason for the decrease is that uh, Assessor Joan Serafin was at the top of the scale. Oh, um, the I'm sorry, this is, this is the auditor's Auditor. office, the assessor's office. Oh, you said assessor. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I meant auditor on page 32, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, I, 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 well, I can explain that. Um, the, the, what happened last year is two of the staff people, the payroll and AP coordinators were erroneously budgeted for 40 hours a week last year when they only work 35 hours a week. Okay, so their I salaries know. were readjusted this year. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. It's just when I saw the number was down, it really- Yeah, no, no, they, they, and they are, getting, they are getting their normal step increase, so. Okay, all right, great. Uh, well, I guess we'll, we'll turn back to the topic of the evening. Um, you know, I, I just want to say a couple of words about um, the Department of Community Care and, and the Northampton Policing Review Commission before I have a, just one or two questions here. You know, I mentioned before, I was very honored to be a part of this uh, NPRC 
Um, and as the NPRC's recommendations became more structured, I was, was very happy with, with what was proposed. Um, I really uh, appreciated Councillor Nash just talking a little bit about the consensus that he feels we see, and Councillor Foster mentioned it earlier as well, um, because I, I, I've been honestly a little worn down sometimes by, by reading people pitting the health of our community against the safety of our community. Um, it's, you know, it's been difficult. Um, and, and so to, to be here tonight and listen to, to my fellow counselors and the mayor talk so positively about where we're headed with all of this, it, it's really uh, making me feel great. Um, you know, I um, noted that in, in the report on page 11, you know, I'll quote it, the new department will be established and funded in 22 and then fully operational in 23. Um, you know, and I think that's really important to kind of think about, um, you know, but I don't, I, I, I want to make sure that we're characterizing the $882,000 request correctly, because this, this was presented to us on May 18th and the police department was budgeted at one number. And then when, when the final order was approved, it was $882,000 less. That's that the number is a real number. It was, it was pr presented and then it was, you know, and then the, the it was $882,000 less when, when it was approved. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to mention that because I think it's important to characterize that correctly um, for, you know, for people listening. Um, you know, I, I just want to get into to why this is important to me. Um, I mentioned the other night when we were talking to Chief Casper, and I was kind of rambling a little bit, even worse than I am now. Um, but, you know, two weeks ago, I attended Brandeis graduation. Um, the commencement speaker was Brian Stevenson, who's a public interest lawyer from Montgomery, Alabama. And he talked about the health problem in America, the history of using the politics of fear and anger to force the criminal justice system to respond. Specifically, he talked about addiction crises, which has led to mass incarceration across America. And we know that that response also includes houseless and mental health crises as well, criminalizing these problems, which really present, you know, as public health problems. The politics of fear and anger can pose a great threat. I'm really happy that we're moving forward to care for our community in a more compassionate manner. If, if I don't know what the number is, I'm going to make a number up. 85% of people in Northampton feel perfectly comfortable calling 911. That's a good starting point. My goal, and I can sense the goal for, for my colleagues here, is growing that number as close to 100% as possible is, is our a, a priority for us. Uh, adding a fourth emergency response option does that. Um, I too have had a number of conversations about the Department of Community Care, and it seems to me that an awful lot of people do support this idea. The people that I've spoken to that support the idea really feel it's gonna create greater community health and offer important support to our neighbors. I just would note one conversation I had with literally one of the most conservative people I know and as we talked about it, and, and I kind of explained my, my feeling on it, what I, my vision for it would be, um, his quote was something along the lines of, if this really works in your life, you'll never do something better than this. And that made me feel great. Uh, so I'm filled with pride to have been part of this process and to, uh, and I pledge to see this through. Um, you know, so I would just ask, Mary, you've, so many of my questions you, you've, already, you've already answered. Um, and I guess just a technical question, would the project manager require council approval? I know that the department head would, we, we did that with Mr. Flagg and, and Dotrell and Chief Davin, but would the department manager require that too? I guess that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I suppose, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not the ultimate department head necessarily. Right. Um, so I guess theoretically it, it may not, but I, there's certainly nothing stopping me from, from coming to the council and consulting with you and getting your, getting your approval. Um, I mean, my hope is that I'll have council involvement in the screening process so that there'll be some involvement in that. But um, yeah, I guess you're right that, that, that the, you know, it's, it's a department. And although, you know, again, I guess technically until the department is formalized in the administrative code, then you're probably right. Um, that it's not like, you know, again, like the assessor or something like that. But right. again, I, I feel like, um, you know, this is a, I, I've, I've expressed in the budget message and my other, um, you know, in, in other uh, discussions with the council about this, that, you know, I am extremely mindful of my um, short timerness here. 
Um, and so in terms of making really long-term decisions with long-term implications, um, so I, I want to be very mindful about, um, you know, having some continuity and, and having other um, inputs on this. So uh, I guess we can talk about that further when we get to that point in the process. But yeah, I suppose you're technically, we would, it would not be considered a true department head at this point. Um, so uh, yeah, we'd have to, and again, we don't even, you know, the administrative code typically spells out, you know, the department of X led by a director or led by whomever and, you know, advised by, you know, fill in the blank. And so it sort of spells that all out. Um, uh, so probably that would be, um, you know, once that's in place and then the department is fully formed, um, then, um, you know, then that would probably be the, the, the more permanent hire um, I don't see this person as being the director of the department. I see them really as the as the person who's going to help us. You know, I see it as a short term position that's going to help us uh, lead. Um, you know, lead the process of establishing the process of the okay. department. Yeah, great. And then um, it, it seems like you've said this, but but I want to ask very directly: um, if the project manager is ready to hire and get the department rolling, assuming it's before January third of twenty twenty two. Uh, you're prepared to make these budget uh, amendments and adjustments to 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 try to start as as soon as we, the the project manager feels that we could go. Of course, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, part of this is I want to hire someone and empower them to you know create the blueprint for what this department would look like. And you know, again, I, I you know it's 25 years ago, but you know, similar situation with the with the public safety. Um, communication center and, you know, we brought in somebody who had worked in public safety communications for many years and had, you know, knew what it took to put together one of these, um, uh, one of these centers and, you know, made recommendations and created job descriptions and did all the coordination with other departments. Um, and then, you know, uh, away, away the city went. So yeah, I, if that, if we could certainly, um, you know, that I would, most definitely bring forward any needed transfers that would be needed to support that. Great. Thank you. And I'll just conclude with, with one thing, which is as I, as I have, um, you know, kind of looked at this, uh, you know, and, and, and again, I, I felt really great about a lot of this, uh, you know, I think, the four hundred twenty thousand dollars versus the 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 you know requested eight hundred eighty two to get the department rolling to me is is less important. It, what's important to me is when this department is established that it's properly funded. Um, you know if 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 we can establish it and find and figure this all out with this money, but then find what if you found out that it really needs seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a million dollars then then that's important to me that those tax dollars are allocated at that time um so that that's one thing i wanted to mention and then i also have been thinking a lot and i, I just did a little research here on you know Councillor nash was talking about some of the money but when you start talking about per capita allocation you know eugene and springfield oregon through cahoots get nine dollars and eleven cents per person and this four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars is fifteen dollars over fifteen dollars per person here uh so i'm, I'm grateful for for that. And, and lastly, I just want to thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, for this budget. Uh, you know, you've answered all my questions. Uh, very comfortable with this. And I just wanted to reemphasize what you state in your budget message, which is that you're hoping we can work with a spirit of shared purpose and collaboration among all stakeholders. I'm hopeful for that, for that too. I think we as the counselor counting on all city departments, especially our first responders and dispatch to help make Northampton safer and healthier. And I invite all of you to join me in that cooperation. Thank you, counselor. And I can tell you that, you know, when I put out my budget message, I got calls from all those public safety departments saying, I hope we're gonna be part of this process, right? I mean, they, we, they wanna be part of this process because mm -hmm. um, they, I think they understand, you know, how complex this will be. And, the, and they already work together very closely, um, you know, in terms of um, responding to the 911 call. So, you know, we're, as we, as we talk about adding another, another um, response department to that, um, there, there definitely needs to be clear coordination. Um, because it's, you know, as you all know, and I think even as the report acknowledges that, you know, there's um, the dispatchers have a have a challenging role in terms of understanding what what um, what resources need to be dispatched when a 911 call comes in. So, you know, even just developing those protocols um, for how the dispatch, you know, they have 
if you've ever been in there, they've got you know huge binders full of all the protocols for the various types of calls that come in. And so this is a whole other set of protocols that they'll need to develop uh, for when a you know community responder would be dispatched. Um, and who, you know, would it be dispatched with a paramedic? Would they be dispatched with, you know, a police officer if there was some violence uh, potential? You know, all those kinds of things I think will have to be uh, worked out. Um, so uh, yeah, that'll be the work and, and there's gonna have to be a lot of teamwork, but I'm, I'm confident we have, a, we have a really well-functioning public safety team now. And, um, and I ho- have no doubt that, that um, you know, Northampton will be able to create something that every resident can be proud of. It'll be a heck of a flow chart. Yeah. Um, are there counselors who have yet to speak who would like to? Counselor Thorpe. You're muted. <laughs> yeah. I wanna thank everyone for uh, what they've mentioned here this evening. And I, I just wanna say to, um, Everyone, I appreciate what you've said, and I want to thank the mayor for his uh, what he's presented in his budget proposal, and, and realizing that not only the police department but all the departments should be engaged in critical analysis and revision of structures, policies, and practices that confer safety for all people. So, with that, uh, I will be supporting uh, the mayor's budget as is. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dwight. I guess by process of elimination, that leaves me. I am uh, traditionally long-winded and rambly, and I'm going to spare all of you that because actually as other colleagues have acknowledged that um, despite what some people may judge, wisdom has been expressed and displayed tonight and the discussion, the very complicated discussion. And the urgency, of course, is what's driving the urgency Besides the very obvious, which is a, a long-held tradition in this country of systemic racism, and as it manifests through our institutions that have been developed over time, and the dismantling of that is the objective. But one of the other bigger drivers is, of course, this, that compels the urgency, but another thing that compels the urgency is the energy that was invested maybe by the community at large, but particularly uh, the BIPOC community after the Floyd lynching and all the other associated murders that occurred that year of the extrajudicial killings of black and brown people. The, and there is a concern that that energy, we're losing that moment, um, that, that we, we are not riding the wave, if you will, in a way that, that uh, would be realized on the ground in a very distinct and real way. And I've had a number of conversations uh, with representatives from NAN. Have we ever actually learned how to pronounce NAN besides NAN? NAN? I don't know. Northampton Abolition Now also with other community members. And what I've said is essentially what happens is you take vision, you take courage, you take courageous aspirations, and then you crush them in the prosaic process of municipal governance. Um, But at the same time, change is realized, the progress is made, the cog, the ratchet effect occurs. And as the culture, hopefully, and I believe actually in my heart that it is in process, has not been in continual process of changing, particularly as it pertains to uh, inequalities across the board. Um, and we are very, very, very far from ever saying that we've achieved something there. But, uh, you know, to quote many, to, uh, to borrow a quote and to bastardize it somewhat from Martin Luther King, the arc of justice bends slowly but bends towards freedom. Our work essentially actually has us in that bind in some sense, making a very 
you know, we've been called upon to make a bold and brave um, choice and decision and change. And in, in so many frustrating respects, and many of you heard, you've heard many of them tonight, we're very limited. We're talking about introducing um, and creating a department that is unique, We're not sort of unique, although we can't qualify an absolute, but it's not kind of new, unique, it's, or the uniqueest. It is just plain and simply, in many respects, borrows from a number of other proposals, but this one is unique, at least the one that I've heard called for in the recommendations. It will, in all likelihood, change as it is starting to be realized, but and I have heard that the mayor and also certainly this council is not shied away from that ambitious goal. You know, it is, all of this is fraught with potential failure. And, and it does require, as, uh, as Councilor Quinlan mentioned, a continuum of effort, not just from, well, you know, as I said, my efforts are going to be basically from the peanut gallery soon, but those of you who are continuing on, it will, it will require the nurturing and consideration that you guys are committed to invest in. This, my choice on this, and I've heard it very loudly and clearly is an enormous disappointment to a number of people on all sides of this issue, to be honest. Um, and what I've always said about representative government is that the one thing that we have over, say, putting this to a town vote, is that we are, we are chosen, we represent ourselves, we explain and express what our moral compass is, and then we hope that people invest their trust in us to make reasonable, thoughtful decisions using those gauges. And, and um, this is the perfect example of it. There will be, we are, to a person having a deep and abiding struggle. It's a point of privilege, but it's definitely a privilege. And we, uh, you know, the dilatorious impacts don't affect us more or less. And we're trying to improve the lives and lots of others. And I'm, I'm, I think I want, I hope people walk away from this understanding that that is indeed what we've invested in this so far. That is our commitment. And it is reflected in every counselor's questions, the mayor's responses, the thoughtful processes. We're all committed to moving in the same direction. The destination and the way we get there is where we have the differences of, of discussion and that will be ongoing. It's not new and it won't end tonight. It won't end when we have a second vote on the budget. But I'm, I just want to share with you my admiration for all of you and appreciate in these extraordinary circumstances, the courage and the hard work that you've committed to this. Um, you're not going to hear that a lot <laughs> in public comment or on the streets, but I want to share that as a colleague, I am genuinely appreciative and, my, and the same amount of appreciation that I would turn towards the uh, the Policing Review Commission, I would apply here. And I hope, uh, at the very least, my appreciation of you counts to some small infinitesimal degree and, and hope you appreciate that you have done good things and are committed to doing that. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dwight. Um, I'm gonna take a moment and weigh in if that's okay before we do round two. Um, so, uh, you know, I met with many of the members of the Northampton Policing Review Commission individually after they presented to us their report. And one of the questions that I asked each of them was, what's, what's the most important first concrete step that needs to be taken? You know, you, you've given us these recommendations, but as you've said, you haven't really laid out for us how how it's going to be done because you you recognize that there are many factors and so but like in your opinion what's what's the first step and many of them told me that they felt like the first key step was to bring on and they they said a project manager or a coordinator or a director but 
the idea was to bring on someone with energy and talent who could really start to lay out how the department will function and what is needed for that department. So I was extremely grateful to see what's called here a project manager um, in this budget and at a department head salary plus, you know, plus additional part-time staff and then the OM funds. Um, and I'm very thankful to Mayor Narkowitz for, um, for working with Senator Comerford to get that $150,000 earmark for Northampton. That's, that is a huge addition for this. Um, and, and just hearing the potential federal and state funds that I know I've been following for the last few, you know, couple months or so, um, and that we talked about tonight, just feel very hopeful. Um, so, you know, and, and um, Mayor, I want to thank you for, you know, the work that you are doing on this process. Some of it, I think, you know, we're, we're hearing for the first time tonight. Um, and, you know, the outreach and the research that you've been doing to start the department and for, you know, engaging with the Center for Policing Equity and, and the other, um, the other work that you're kind of doing behind the scenes to sort of set up for this fiscal year, the, the creation of this department. Um, you know, you compared this first budget um, to some other departments on that chart that you showed at us, but those include those departments full operational budgets. Um, this fiscal year's budget for the Department of Community Care is not full operational costs, which, you know, I, I certainly understand. And I think um, we, I hope we all are, as we've talked about it tonight, have come to understand that um, those those costs are yet to be determined. You know, we've, as we said tonight, there aren't, there are job descriptions, scales, need for vehicle isn't determined yet. Um, equipment, you know, what kind of training dispatch we'll need. There are many things that need to, that would go into building an actual operational budget for this department. Um, and some of them will be one-time costs, you know, like training. Um, and I think some of that will happen this year and then we may have to build more in there. So, you know, I, I really thank you, Mayor, for outlining the flexibility that you see in this first budget for the department and for the possibility of additional funding. Um, and, you know, I, I understand that grants are important, but not permanent. And as we've talked about, you know, in this year's um, general fund budget, we have this example of the Prevention Coalition, which for 10 years had been grant funded and that ended. But we incorporated it into our city budget. So, you know, the end of a grant doesn't necessarily mean that all that came from it is lost or that it disappears, but it does mean that a really conscious choice has to be made to continue that or figure that out if, if a grant does disappear. So you have to be, it, it's always okay. important to get that funding whenever you can, but you have to be mindful that it's, you don't rely on it too much. Um, so uh, what else do I have to say? You know, I also want to add that you know, of course, the $882,000 is a real number, like that's a number, it's a real, it's an actual number. But you know, my real concern about it becoming a symbolic number is that it wasn't based on a transfer of specific services. So it doesn't equal what this new department is meant to be. And so I worried if I worry if we become too mired in it and, and to and cling to this symbolism of it, that I want to be very careful that we don't limit our vision for this department by by holding on to this number from from the past that doesn't relate to actually what what we need this department to accomplish. Um, and you know, I, I just want to talk to some of the people we heard from tonight that we've heard from this past year. I, I, I heard I really heard that some really feel that more is needed for this fiscal year and that none of this is enough. I, I truly, I do hear that. And I wish, um, I wish those folks felt the same hope and honestly excitement that I feel about this start. And I think I'm hearing from all of you and I really appreciate hearing that from you. I think Councillor Quinlan just said it really eloquently. Um, you know, like Councillor Foster had said, uh, you know, I, I also have had dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of conversations in this past year um, throughout the city. And about you know what has gone from an idea of uh, and a and a real need to be filled that we clearly heard from many in our community to then a very well thought out and researched recommendation by the Northampton Policing Review Commission 
and we're eternally grateful for that, and has now moved to beginning funding that we are voting on tonight. Um, and I, that, that feels like progress to me and it fills me with a lot of hope. And I know that for some, it feels like slow and maybe small progress. Um, but, you know, I hope that we, as, you know, as Councillor Quinlan just was saying, you know, I hope that we really can work together on this um, and come together as a community because I, I'm committed to seeing it through to be a fully operational department and to making it be the supportive response to those in our community most in need of our care. And I think that we can come together and do this. And I hope that we can do it with a sense of purpose and accomplishment and, and um, an appreciation for everyone that has contributed to getting us to this point. So thank you all for this discussion this evening. Um, okay, Councillor Mayori, I saw your hand, yes? Yeah, thank you to all my fellow councillors for your thoughts. I, I just wanted to go back to a few points. Um, because I was interrupted, I, I want to clarify that yes, when I make, propose a 10% budget and when we asked for it to be reinvested, we wanted it to be reinvested because we knew that was a meaningful amount to be reinvested. And so when we're comparing with the graph, you know, the um, other the other departments, we're, this is a 20, supposed to be a 24 seven department. It's not the senior center. I, I would rather it be other 24 seven uh, departments if we're going to, to kind of look at it that way. And so I just, um, I guess I don't, uh, I don't see this brave. I do think we can, we will come together as a community. We have a wonderful community and everyone works really hard and is really engaged. I, I'm not understanding why we want to slow that down. And that's what I think this is doing. I think we, every single counselor here knows that we're going to need much more than $300,000 more to this department. And so adding $300,000 right now, I don't understand why, why, why we are not. I don't, I don't understand why we are not doing that. And uh, I, I think what people wanted to feel with the reinvestment of that symbolic number was that they were being heard. And I don't, I just don't think, you know, it's symbolic, but it's real. And I, I'm not understanding why we don't want to just start there. This is very precise training. When I talk to the more conservative folks in, in my ward, their biggest concern is, well, how will that look like? You know, um, I'm worried about those responders. Or, or will they get hurt? And and I don't want to set this, um, you know, this department up for failure. This is this is a very involved, this is a very involved funding project. If it's going to be a unique model, it's going to take a lot of resources. And I guess I just really don't understanding, I'm not understanding why we're starting um, with, with a figure we know, we, every single one of us knows is too low. Thank you. Other, other counselors? I, I saw another hand before, but I, oh, Councilor LaBarge. Um, Mayor, I just wanted to let you know that on an email that I got yesterday, somebody apparently had emailed Tim Blake from Cahoots and they charge $300 an hour for consultant. So I just wanted to give the mayor that message. Understood. Thank you, Councillor. You're welcome. Obviously, we're building a we're not building a cahoots model in Northampton, um, but obviously it's some of the same, um, some of the same, um, you know, skills and, and experience is def would definitely be important. So they're, they're definitely someone that we're a, a model that so many people are looking at around the country, but obviously we've made a, you know, the commission made a con conscious decision that that was not a model that we would go with, that we would build a municipal department. Um, and obviously, um, you know, with, with the, with the, um, some different emphasis. So, I, so that, but that's definitely, they would be among the, you know, the, the folks in, in nationwide who have so much experience and I'm sure they're getting uh, lots of people knocking down their door right now 
um, for, for assistance. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilor Jarrett and Councilor Mayori. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a couple more notes before we moved off of the community. Um, uh, the, the CAHOOTS model, we're not, we're not choosing to be a contracted model, um, but, but many of the things that CAHOOTS provides, the peer, peer um, response being uh, very large, or is certainly a, a thing that I'm hoping that we will <clears throat> take uh, lots of, uh, inf you know, inspiration and information from. And then also that the community care department, it's not just about um, emergency response, that, that investment is, is needed in all aspects of community safety and peer response is one, but just to remember that, that any money we put towards initiatives that support people, so housing, the resilience hub, that, that meeting people's needs um, will reduce the need for policing and, and lead to better outcomes. And it doesn't all have to be housed in the community care department, but I do think it needs to be accountable in, in whatever way we devise like the community care department. So just putting that, that note that in a way, you know, we are spending uh, on the resilience hub and such, we are spending, we are investing in the community in that way. Um, and uh, more would, would, is going to be better. Um, and um, so I just wanted to make a couple those, those points there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz, did you want to respond? Oh, you're muted. Thank you for making that point, Councillor. And again, I just I would refer you back to the budget message and the budget itself. I mean, the the single largest um, division increase division in this budget this year is health and human services, and we are making um, you know we're making our largest increases um, primarily in our health and ser human services division as well as education. Um, um, and you know, I know you spoke with. Um, with Dr. Provost about some of the work that they're doing um, in, in the school system um, that also is toward that same uh, mission. So anyway, just wanna reemphasize that again, sort of the global, um, uh, the global budget here and, and the choices we're making globally in terms of where we're putting our greatest emphasis on investment. Uh, Councilor Mayori. Yes, when Council Lafarge brought up and uh, Council Jarrett brought up uh, cahoots, I remember the point I wanted to make, which is one of uh, the biggest problem um, that cahoots self reports is underfunding. So I don't think uh, Councilor Nash's point that that you know I, I you know that that's um, I, I think they probably need a lot more um, than they are receiving. And the Amherst uh, Safety Working Group. Is proposing 2.2 million for Amherst, and that's for 24/7 and 15 staff coverage. Amherst has budgeted 140 thousand dollars in FY 2022. Was, yes, but I'm saying that, but the, the people of color who led that proposed 2.2 million, and that's who I'm listening to. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, Councillor Jarrett. All right, I'm, I have more uh, questions or about and discussion about the budget, but it, it, are we done with the community care department? I mean, this, at this, you know, this moment in time is about, is about everything except for that one line item that we have. <laughs> yeah, okay. So go for it. Okay, great. Well, I just wanted to say overall, I, I feel this is a solid budget that I can get behind. Uh, I'm glad we're bringing staffing back up. We're funding these new initiatives. I do want to say that I am continually frustrated by funding and the regressive nature of our property tax system um, and how that is hard on on, on many people. Um, and we continue to advocate for changes in that, uh, including the, the fair share amendment to boost uh, reimbursement. Um, and 
I wanted to then to just talk a little bit about the, the policing budget. Um, and uh, so I have a, a statement to say about that. Um, so first that, that I hear the voices of those who want change, who want reduced footprint of policing. Um, as a member of the Northampton Policing Review Commission, I agree we need significant change and to move many functions away from police. Uh, it is clear that policing has a disparate and negative impact on black and indigenous people and people of color and many others. Um, this police budget is a level service budget, like most of the other departments in the city. That level of service is the level of service that we made after last year's cut. Um, that cut, though not the ideal way to do it, was, I believe, a necessary move to allow for funding of alternatives. And even though many of us agree that an alternate response would result in better outcomes for many services, Police are often who we have to respond now, and that is an important service. So I think that cutting too much too soon would, would undermine the very thing we are trying to accomplish, which is better public safety for everyone, and could backfire and we could lose support for those alternatives. Um, and the, just that the, the Policing Review Commission report calls for fully funding alternatives and then evaluating uh, moving funding from policing. I will um, certainly be following the approaches of, of other communities, um, such as Ithaca, New York, which has been talked about, which is uh, replacing its police department with a new department of public safety. And oh, I think that's a strong executive. Sorry, you're freezing yeah. up a bit. Why don't you try turning okay. off your camera? Yeah. Um, so we will, so that will, um, so I think strong executive action will be needed to make real change and stand ready to support that. But did, did most of that come through? Yes, you just kind of froze towards the end a bit. Okay, so um, that's, there's my statement, thank you. If I knew you were wrapping up, I might've let it run, <laughs> but I, was, I just didn't want you to get stuck, sorry. Thank you for that. Um, any other discussion? Okay. So seeing none, roll call please on um, the adoption of the FY 2022 general fund budget with the $40,000 line item um, in the central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract removed. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Oh. Councilor McNash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. And Councilor Dwight. Yes. Okay. Um, Councilor Jarrett, we're going to go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for going process and allowing me to participate. Um, so thank you again. You're welcome. So we're going to ask you to step away. And so now we are going to deliberate and vote on the $40,000 line item in the central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract. It is already on the floor. The motion is there. So discussion. The motion stands. The motion stands. Is that right? There's a motion I've on the floor that hours, already... I've been spent hours figuring this out. And yes, it is already all, it was there. It was just in two separate parts. We did one part and now we've moved over to the other part. That's where we are. I don't want to mess that up. So um, Laura and I worked uh, really hard on this. Okay. Councilor Quinlan has a question. Yeah. Councilor Quinlan. Okay, so uh, just to be clear here, looking on page 51, there's a line, it doesn't say pedal people, it says trash removal, that's the 40,000 we're talking about. Just wanna make sure that we, we're all aware exactly of what that is. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Laura? We've taken two votes so far, um, the vote to divide the question and then the vote to adopt the general fund budget with the 40,000 removed. I thought we still do need a motion and a second to uh, to approve. We need a total of four votes 
in this whole process, I've recorded two. I'd like okay, to so I move, thought... <laughs> I'd like to move this item just to be safe. I would like to move this item to put it on the floor for purposes of discussion and vote. Okay. Second. Okay, that motion's been being seconded, but so just bear with me for one moment. So Laura, Please. we had the initial motion, right? Yes. Then we had the motion to divide. Yes. Right. And we had a vote on that. Then we had the vote on the adoption minus the line item. Now we're going to have a vote on the adoption of the line item. Um, and then we'll go to the order. Okay. But we've only had two um, votes with motion. So this is the third. Um, that's fine. It's not what okay. we discussed earlier today, <laughs> but that's fine. Which was that once we divided the question, they it was they were both on the floor. <laughs> they would have two separate votes. But a motion's been made and seconded. I'm fine to do it for safety sake. Belts and suspenders. Yeah. Move the trash. I will. I will not be the one figuring this out next year. So good luck to you all. Okay, so any discussion on this motion? Did your, who had that question, Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Was that yeah. question answered? Not yet. I okay. can confirm that that is a, we obviously don't, it's not a, it's, it's a contract that we, that we, you know, have to put out every so, so many years um, to a vendor. And so that is the down, that is the trash contract that currently is held by pedal people. Um, but that is the line item that funds that contract. It just happens that the contract is with pedal people. So, Thank you. Council Labarge, then Councilor Mayori. I have a question for the mayor. Now with the contract mayor, that goes out to bid, correct? Many other people can apply for that? Um, yeah, um, it does go out to bid, it does have to go out to bid. And typically it's, um, I believe we're right now in the final, um, sort of the, the final, typically these will have like, uh, you know, a base number of like a base three years or something like that. And then there's an option to renew for one year and then another option to renew for one year. I think we're in like the final renewal um, option right now. Um, and so I believe after this year, um, it will have to go out to bid again. Um, uh, now, obviously, keep, well, I won't go, I won't get into <laughs> procurement this <laughs> evening. I'll just stop and you can uh, vote on this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mayori, did you have your hand up? I, I just wanted to clarify. So we're only voting on this one item. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion on this one item? Seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Oh, Councillor Mayori, you were frozen. Sorry, yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. That passes in, uh, that adoption passes um, first reading. So now our next step is we go back to the agenda. And so we are at 21.280 in order, Councillor Dwight. Um, requesting a break, if we could. Um, sure. Let's be back here at 10. I, mean, hmm? <laughs> I was just saying yeah, only if everyone's agreeable or you're agreeable. I just, it seems that this might be a natural point at which we do that sure. in five hours. That's fine. Um, okay. So let's be back here at like <laughs> 10, 15. <laughs> Seventh ending stretch. Okay. A minute. 
Okay, we are back and we are up to 21.280 in order to approve the FY 2022 general fund budget. Move approval, please. Second. Uh, the motion has been made by Councillor Dwight and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Uh, Councillor Jarrett has recused himself again. Um, okay, is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, everyone's moving. Okay, roll call, please, Laura. I missed. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I didn't actually hear, I, I couldn't hear anything starting with uh, the, what the president, President Chiara said. Um, okay, so- I'm sorry, my audio uh, cut out when I sat down so I couldn't hear what we were voting on. Okay, so we're at 21.280 in order to approve FY 2022 general fund budget. And Councillor Jarrett has recused himself. So we're up to um, the roll call. Okay, wait, what did we just vote on before that? Okay, so <laughs> we did, we had a motion to adopt the budget, then we divided that, that, this yeah. is the process that we have to go through, so. Right, I understand, I'm just a little. A motion confused. to adopt, and then it, you divide that quest, you divide the adoption into two separate. Okay, parts. right. Vote on each of those. That. And so we have voted on the adoption of the FY 2022 budget. Yes. We're now at the, this next step, which is the order. We actually have to vote on the order, okay. which is what goes to the DOR. And, um, right. and it has to Thank encompass you. the, so it's the entire budget. It's the school budgets, it's everything. Um, and, and that is why Councilor Jared has, is not participating because it has to include everything. So we the, the, Okay. The enterprise budgets? The nope, those come next. Oh, oh. This is the general oh. fund. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Okay. Those, those are, will come in fast succession after this one, but this is the thank entire you. general fund budget. General fund, okay, thank you. Sure. My audio is cutting in and out, so I didn't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> any any you. other discussion or questions? Okay, roll call please. Laura. I started a roll call. Councilor Labarge voted yes. So I'm Councilor Mayori. Uh, no. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. Okay. Now we're at 21.181. In order to approve the FY 2022 Sewer Enterprise Fund budget. Move approval, please. Second. Motion was made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge. So we um, we did not have a full discussion in finance like we normally may have. So um, let's ask for discussion as we always would. But if anyone wants to hear from Mayor Narkowitz, who's just popped in. Any questions or comments on the sewer enterprise fund budget? Um, the mayor has um, given us his budget statement and, and broken this down for us, but if there are any elaborations or other discussion points that you want to emphasize or things you want to emphasize, I'd appreciate you taking the time to do that. No, I think, um, you know, th this one's in, uh, these, these enterprise um, budgets for water and sewer are, you know, we, we already go through the rate setting process earlier in, in the session. So I think, you know, you've heard um, that these are all, these are level funded, um, water and sewer are both level funded. Um, we didn't raise rates uh, this year. Um, and so there's obviously not a lot of, there's no change from last year's budget. So this is a level funded uh, budget and the rates uh, remain the same. And, um, and I know that you got some more detailed information about that when you spoke with um, Director Lascalia. So there's, yeah, there's not, this is, um, there's not really much to discuss just in terms of their, these, at least these, these two, and actually, frankly, 
three are, are level funded. Can I ask your indulgence and in just for the public's interest? I mean, because we are enjoying uh, public scrutiny like we've never had before on budget discussion to explain the mechanism of, of enterprise funds. Certainly. So, um, uh, so enterprise funds are a, um, you know, are, are, are um, created under, you know, mass general law, um, and they basically are set up as separate cost centers. Um, I guess that would be the best way to describe it in sort of a layman's business term, but um, basically it is for um, very discrete uh, functions, usually utilities, um, hence water, sewer, stormwater, um, solid waste. Um, and, and basically they are um, self-sufficient uh, funds that, um, you know, uh, derive their revenue from, um, you know, from rate payers. Um, and then um, all of those, um, all of those rates that they pay um, must go back into the utility itself um, uh, to fund the operations of the utility. And, um, you know, there are some indirect costs that are also paid, uh, uh, that the utility also pays to the city. And there's a summary of those um, in the budget separately. So for some, there are some general fund services that, that our enterprise fund utilities rely on. And so there's some reimbursement to the city for them, including, you know, health insurance for all the um, enterprise fund employees that get paid out of the general fund, but then there's an offset to reimburse the general fund for those costs. Um, but that's the, that's the general um, structure of an enterprise fund. And, um, and, you know, we have, um, you know, we have these four uh, currently. And, um, and again, you know, as you look through the budget of the DPW, you'll off, it'll, it'll often, um, you'll see the same employee showing up in, in several different um, divisions. And that's often because um, a portion of their salary is being paid in some cases by the general fund, and then a portion may be paid by um, one of the utilities, uh, one of the enterprise funds. Um, but that's generally what it is. And in the case of water and sewer, um, you know, the revenue to fund it is directly related to um, the revenue we anticipate raising um, primarily through the, um, through the um, rates um, that, that we charge our users, both, you know, um, obviously residential and commercial. Thank you for indulging me. No problem. And so Jarrett. But just another general question about enterprise funds. Um, the are, is it required? Is an enterprise fund required that we take that we take a portion of the budget, and not have it in the general fund? Um, um, I, you know, I don't know that it's required. It's but it's a it's considered a good um, you know financial practice. Um, you know, because if you're trying to run a utility. Um, and you know you want it to be self-sustaining. Um, you know it, it just it, by by accounting for it the way we account for it. Um, you know it's it's clearly separated in the budget. I mean, ultimately, if if a if a utility um, were to um, run into a deficit and that it couldn't cover, it would still fall back onto the general fund. Um, um, but that's obviously not been. You know, our goal has been to make sure that we create utilities that are self-sustaining and that are, you know, supported by the, um, by the utility um, users. Um, so, but yeah, it's not required. And I know, you know, there's um, uh, been some, you know, discussion at, at various points, even about the solid waste enterprise fund, um, which, you know, used to be fairly significant when we were obviously running the landfill and it was a regional landfill. And now it's, pretty much gone, come down to just being for the transfer station. So that's en ended up being a much smaller um, enterprise fund. So um, not sure where the where we'll head into the future in terms of our um, uh, solid waste, um, but you know, that's an example of one that, you know, I, I suppose theoretically could be just blended into the general fund. But again, I think if you're just to try to do transparent accounting, and you know, be able to let, because um, obviously not every resident, not every taxpayer uses the transfer station. You know, we are we know that half the, you know half half our residents, um, you know, 
use private ser- use a private vendor. So, um, so in terms of just transparency and accountability to the folks who are actually using the transfer station, I think the I do think the model is is a good one and sound. And from an accounting perspective, they all you know they get um, they get audited. All of the free cash or retained earnings you know stays within the utility fund. Um, so it's, um, you know, because obviously one of the concerns that you could you hear is that, you know, are you raising my sewer rate to support the general fund budget? You know, are you, it does, it does the, does the rate I'm paying for sewer really truly reflect the rate of the utility or are you using it as a workaround prop two and a half, um, you know, to raise revenue that's otherwise capped by prop two and a half. So it's, I think it's, I think it provides good transparency and good accountability um, and just as a, as a, managing of finances, I think it's a good model, which is why we've tended to go with it. Thank you for that explanation. Any other discussion on the sewer enterprise? Okay, seeing none, um, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. We are at 21.282 in order to approve FY 2022 water enterprise fund budget. Move approval, please. Second. Motion moved by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Discussion on the water enterprise fund. Okay, seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, 21.283 in order to approve FY 2022 solid waste enterprise fund budget. Councillor Jarrett. Um, just as I explained earlier in finance, I'll be recusing myself for this item. Thank you. Move approval, please. Second. Motion made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion on the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget? Okay, seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading 21.284 in order to approve FY 2022 stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion on this enterprise fund? <laughs> Seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yeah. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. We're at 21.285 in order to approve, order to approve FY 2022 revolving funds. Move approval, please. Second. Motion is made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz, with sort of the same reasoning that Councillor Dwight said before, could you explain to those who are paying attention to the budget and these funds um, what a revolving fund is? Certainly. Again, it's another it's another ca- another category of an of an account that's allowed under Mass General Law, um, and it's um, some similar similar concept to an enterprise fund, although not quite as um, elaborate. But basically, um, these are a series of revolving funds that are set up 
Um, again, usually for, you know, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the actual like lists of the um, revolving funds, they're, they're typically for um, departments that have some kind of a, a cost center, um, you know, um, a, a great, you know, starting with energy and sustainability. And, you know, we, we made a decision as a city to put um, while well, they used to be called SREX, now they're smart credits from our solar, um, as well as other um, uh, renewable and green energy um, uh, funds into this revolving fund that then we could then utilize to spend on, um, on energy and sustainability projects. So that's an example of one. Um, and, you know, right on down the line, um, you know, the you know, senior center activities revolving fund. So funds that come in um, for um, all the various uh, different activities, these can then be spent on those types of activities. Um, you know, obviously something like the Aquatic Center at JFK uh, run by Parks and Rec, there's, um, you know, there's funding um, that comes in um, and these, uh, this basically authorizes uh, Parks and Rec to spend up to this amount, um, you know, without having to come back uh, to council. And again, it can only be spent on uh, the aquatic center um, and actually the council sort of has double approval on this because um, you know the law was changed a few years ago under the municipal modernization act that we actually have all these revolving funds have to be in our ordinance as well so um, they're in ordinance and then you also still approve them um, uh, as part of the um, budget every year um, so that's essentially what a revolving fund is and um, and as a requirement of um, Section 53E and a half, yes, there are half sections of, of letters in Mass General Law, um, E and a half, um, that the council uh, has to set a limit each year on how much can be expended. Um, uh, so that's, that's what these are. And so these are always part of the budget every year. And um, if we ever, when we add other revolving funds, we have to first come to the council and have it adopted as an ordinance. Um, and then obviously incorporated into this order uh, with an annual um, spending limit on what can be drawn from the revolving fund. Thank you for that explanation, Councillor Jarrett. So that, that's the annual spending limit, but there's no limit on how much could be added to it in a year? Um, yes, that's correct. And, you know, and theoretically, if, if for some reason we needed to, um, you know, we needed to take more money from a revolving fund, you know, a request could come to council to appropriate money from that revolving fund. Yes, that's right. Um, so yeah, the funds can come in. There's, there's no limit on funds that can come in, um, but they come in and they, they automatically flow to this revolving fund. Um, and then, you know, there are obviously limits on what can be spent. So, you know, departments look at, you know, what they think they um, need that's reasonable, you know, the authority that they need, um, you know, reasonably, because obviously, you know, you, you know, these are often very small transactions, you know, people paying for water aerobics classes, um, you know, at the, at the pool at JFK, you know, so all those fees, you know, coming in, um, and then fees going out to pay the lifeguards or to pay the water aerobics instructor, you know, so they're, um, and, you know, the same with the activities funds and all the other smaller funds. Um, so I think they're designed, you know, again, to have a, have a discrete fund that is, you know, monitored separately, has a very separate purpose. And, you know, when the, when the revolving fund is created, which is created by a vote of the council, it clearly spells out the uses for the revolving fund uh, dollars that flow in and out of the revolving fund. So, um, and, and can it, can it go negative or it must be there for You're muted, Mayor. Um, yeah, I don't, um, we're, we're, we're obviously not supposed to have it go negative and we're supposed to, um, you know, we're supposed to uh, obviously be monitoring that closely and not allow it to go into the negative. And obviously the, um, you know, there would be um, implications, you know, for against our free cash um, if we did have a negative account. But yeah, we would not want to, um, we would not want it to go negative. So we're constantly monitoring those and obviously picking um, limits, uh, you know, within this order that, um, you know, that, that, 
that fit. You, you, you couldn't spend, you, can, you can't deficit spend from a revolving fund. So um, that would instantly be, be flagged by the auditor. The auditor will have all these spending limits built into their controls. And so as they process, you know, uh, bills and other, other spending, you know, they will know when they've reached limit on what's been authorized. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the revolving funds? Okay, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor McGorry. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. So uh, the next one, 21.286, the request has been to continue that to Monday. Um, so let's move down to 21.289 in order to approve Mayor's Youth Commission gift fund expenditure for t-shirts. Move to approve, please. Second. First name by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Mayor Narkowitz, tell us about the t-shirts, please. Um, I'm actually, um, well, obviously there's a gift fund for the Youth Commission then, and, you know, we can accept gifts into a gift fund, but then we need to come to the council to appropriate funds out of it. I'm actually going to defer to your, um, to the uh, Councillor Dwight, who works very closely um, to provide the specifics on these t-shirts. I, like, I, I don't have the specifics. I don't know what's going on with t-shirts. Okay. I know that this, you all know that this is a very active youth commission this year. Um, and um, and at, it, with the leadership of uh, Noah Cassis. And uh, I'm not sure. I, he, I merely got a request as to what the process is to uh, secure funding for the t-shirts, but <clears throat> this was discussed at a meeting I did not attend, so I couldn't I couldn't elaborate beyond the fact beyond the information you have available, which is it's for t-shirts. Okay, is is um, the chief of staff maybe wearing one of the t-shirts? Yeah. <laughs> I, I assume. Uh, oh, <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> so I I know that the you know the youth commission comes to us sometimes annually for funding for. Um, you know, art supplies or um, expenses for printing. Sometimes there have been, um, uh, actually, I'm, I've got some breaking news coming in right now. Um, these will be custom t-shirts to be used for downtown canvassing to raise support for the Youth Commission's initiative to lower the municipal voting age to 16. Um, so uh, that is, um, they, they're, they're very actively um, campaigning on the um, special act legislation that they've supported and they um, want to create t-shirts to, um, um, as part of their, their effort. Um, so I, they, I've just um, gotten a request for re reimbursement, I believe um, that's what it's for. Okay, I, I, but, I feel bad that I scared off the chief of staff by commenting on the t-shirt. I apologize. I, this came to me from uh, director, finance director Wright. So she okay. had the um, she had the request. Okay. It's also, it should be indicated that the source of this funding actually was generated by youth commissions past, who through a number of, of fundraising efforts um, for various things like providing backpacks for immigrant uh, refugee students who were coming to uh, Northampton who eventually didn't get to come to Northampton because of Donald Trump's orders. But the fact is, is they, um, they have, uh, in some respects, a larger fund available to them than many other departments. And that is money that they've generated through their own good work. Excellent. Um, Alan, do you, do you have anything you want to share? You just want to see if he changed his t-shirt. Well, I, I can see that he's still unmuted. <laughs> so I don't know if there's something they wanted to say and then was bashful. All right. I guess not. Um, any other discussion or questions about these t-shirts? 
All right. Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Dwight. Sorry, yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading and we're at 21.290 in order to appropriate $435,653. Uh, free cash to Academy of Music restroom expansion and renovation. Move approval, please. I didn't hear a second. 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 <laughs> now I heard too many. Okay. <laughs> Motion was made by Councillor Dwight and uh, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Um, uh, Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. About? So, um, this, as you know, over the last um, several capital improvement programs, we've been making some significant investments in the Academy of Music, um, which many people may or may not know is owned by the city of Northampton. It's the oldest um, municipally owned theater in the United States. Obviously it's run by a board of directors, a private board of directors, but the facility is owned by us. And so we've been working very closely with um, the director, Deborah J. Anthony, and the board um, to, to really work on some significant um, safety upgrades and, and um, other improvements. Um, and especially uh, during the last year of COVID, um, when the theater has been dark, uh, we've actually you know, used that as an opportunity to accelerate some of that work that is in many cases very disruptive and um, would cause the theater in some cases to need to be dark, go dark during some of the construction. So um, we've been working on a number of things, um, safety, um, uh, fire sprinklers and um, access. And you've probably seen the lovely uh, new backstage ramp that was built a few years back. Um, and so, um, so this is a project that we um, have been working on with them and they've sought various um, grant sources through Mass Cultural, um, CPA and other sources, um, and it's the bathrooms. And um, for those who have um, have been, have been um, to the bathrooms downstairs at the academy, they're they're uh, vintage. They are um, they're old. They're dated. Um, they're obviously very elegant and, and beautiful looking, but they're um, they're small um, and and undersized in terms of the capacity for the theater. Um, and so they've been working on a project to um, modernize and expand the bathrooms um, in, uh, at the academy, um, including adding proper ventilation, um, you know, uh, doubling the number of um, um, stalls, uh, as well as um, upgrading the, um, you know, the um, the other I mean, urinals and sinks and, and moving to, you know, touchless um, uh, fixtures um, as well as working on better um, flow um, in and out of the, you know, flow of, of patrons in and out of the bathrooms. Um, and so um, they went out to bid recently for that work and um, we just got the bids back in and, um, probably won't come as a shock to anyone who's been reading the news lately that um, the bids came in um, a little bit higher than we had anticipated um, for this work, um, uh, both because of some of the increases in materials, um, um, as well as just some of the general construction costs out there. Um, but we feel really strongly that um, this is a critical project. The theater is slated to reopen September 1st. Um, they've managed to get through the pandemic um, uh, and continue to pay their employees using a, a lot of different grants they've been able to get. Um, and they've really been able to sort of weather, um, you know, COVID that way. Um, but they have a, they have pretty much a full, um, a full uh, schedule book beginning on September 1st. Um, you probably started to see some of the advertisements, you know, not only the Academy themselves, um, DSP Productions is bringing in a number of um, a number of artists, as well as um, some of the other folks that they work with. So we feel like, um, you know, the, the Academy is, uh, you know, um, 
as Councilor Mayor referred to earlier, you know, it's obviously a, 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 a cultural sort of gem in our city, but it's also a major um, economic development driver for the city. It brings thousands of people to the city um, every year um, for performances, and that has a multiplier effect in our local economy. People who come and go out to dinner, people who shop, um, you know, people who spend maybe the night or the weekend um, in our local hotels. Um, so we really feel that it's critical and obviously the timing right now of having the theater closed and not, you know, not going to be open um, during September until September uh, feels like we really need to um, get this project done because um, when when the theater reopens, I don't have to tell you how challenging it will be to do a project like this when it reopens. So um, I've met with um, uh, Deborah J. Anthony and the chair of the board and, and um, discussed this project and, and, and looked at it and uh, talked with David Pomerantz about it. Um, so I really feel like this is an investment the city should make at this critical time. And, um, and that's why I'm bringing forward this order to supplement funds that we've already appropriated in the capital program uh, to support this and some other projects at the Academy of Music. And I'm also going to warn you that, you know, um, well, not warn you, but sort of respectfully request that if you're willing to fund this, that, um, you know, that, that um, I would also like to ask for two readings. Um, we just got the bids um, and the contractors would like a letter of intent um, in order for to order, you know, tiles and fixtures and, uh, and all the other supplies that they'll need. And, you know, we, I know there's challenges right now in getting that stuff. So getting it ordered as soon as possible. Um, would be critical. So um, I, don't, I think I may have put that on the agenda. I, I think I made a request. Um, but anyway, so that's the only other piece that I would add. I have it noted as a request. Um, any other discussion or questions? Councilor Jarrett. <clears throat> um, so I was looking through the last two improvement plans, but I did not see this directly. Is there a would this normally be something that would be in there? So this, um, I'm going to ask Director Wright to. Um, I let me first find an email that she gave me that has all this information. Um, I don't know if Susan, Susan, yeah. Can we? Can you talk about this project relative to all the other projects that we've been working on and that they've been seeking funding for? Um, I and we're talking, I'm sorry, I-, I The Academy of Music, bath the Academy of Music Bathroom Project, yeah. Okay, and and in the context of all of the pro other projects- uh, Just the, uh, uh, Councillor Jarrett and was referring to the capital program and this project relative to the curtain project and the sprinkler projects. And this is basically a project that they've been working on that they've now come up with a shortfall. Correct, yes, they, they have other funding for this. Um, that they they secured, um, but they had been seek they have sought funding from us for other improvements um, that that we funded this year, primarily the um, fire suppression system. Um, but this project, they um, they have secured some funding, um, but with the academy closed um, for COVID and getting ready to reopen for a very robust season in the fall, uh, we wanted to try to get these projects done now. Um, you know, we recognize the Academy as a driver um, of parking and meals and other other revenues that the city depends on. So, um, you know, we want to be, see that they're able to fully open and also have the confidence of the guests and the audience that come in that they will have. Um, I'm not sure, Mayor, if you talked about the touchless um, Yes, I did. Yes. And I did talk about the economic impacts. And I think the I think what I think the, the, the better way to answer this also, Councillor, is just that we we sat down with the Academy and sort of went through all of their capital needs and kind of strategized with them which ones we would put through the capital program and which ones they were going to seek funding from Mass Cultural Council. Um, as well as other, you know, fundraising and capital fundraising. And so we did focus on a, a several projects and they've actually in their applications have used our investments as matching funds or shown it as matching funds for investment in the academy. And they've been working on the bond bill, um, but really they, and so this was a project that they thought they could fund fully with their MCC grant funding. 
Um, and so they, but they can't, and they don't have the resources. So either it doesn't get done, um, or, you know, again, this is, this is a project they've discussed with us in terms of, you know, wanting capital funding, but we really prioritize some other projects like the fire curtain and the sprinkler, uh, the fire suppression system um, as sort of life safety ones. But so now they've basically reached a point where they don't have the funding to complete this project. Um, so they're coming to the building owner um, to seek support. Um, and I just, I, I, I feel like this is one that we need to, um, that we do need to support. Yes, and, Susan. And I will add that, um, you know, should, if they weren't able to do the project, they would lose almost $300,000 in other funds um, that they have leveraged towards this project. So um, those funds would, would, that have been dedicated for this purpose from their various funding sources would probably go away. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah, so I mean, my, I think it's a great project to support. I'm just a little uncomfortable because we only received a few lines about it. Normally when there's a capital project, we get a whole page description that says what it's about and now asking for two readings, which wasn't on the agenda. Um, that I mean, normally, you know, of course, I'd, I'd vote for a first reading knowing, knowing we had time to think about it for second reading. So both those things together just make me a little uncomfortable. Um, we with, certainly with could. It, we, it's a large expenditure. We certainly, I mean, um, I, I know you have a meeting scheduled on Monday. I don't know if that meeting is going to um, actually transpire. I don't know if that is going to happen. Um, yes. It is. It okay. will happen. It definitely will happen. We have things that are... Good. So, I mean, theoretically, I could, you, if you, you know, if you would feel better having more detail, I can certainly, um, you know, if you took a first reading vote tonight, and then um, I could try to have um, folks from the academy uh, come and, um, and present more detailed information about this project on Monday. Um, I, I'm making that promise without talking to them, but I did say that that could be one possibility. I mean, that would lose us a few days, but obviously not that many days. Um, in terms of being able to um, commit to the, um, you know, to the contractor, uh, the low bidder on the project. So that is an option as well, if you'd feel more comfortable. Um, okay, before we sort of make that decision, uh, Laura, we talked about this earlier. So if we took a first reading tonight on this, um, would we be able to take a second reading on this on Monday or no? On this agenda is double posted um, on Monday's agenda. I mean, it's posted as a as first, a first reading, reading, I believe, but it's still just the project itself is on the agenda. Yeah, Obviously. it's definitely on the agenda. It just is posted as a first reading and hmm. So that's the question whether we could. Um, you can suspend thing? rules like you do every meeting, but. Right. That, that's actually all it would require is a suspension of rules. It's always listed as a first reading when we suspend rules. Um, and it's only listed as a second reading in subsequent meetings if we haven't suspended rules, if that makes sense. So. Um, it would just require a motion to suspend the rules in order to vote on do a second reading on Monday. Okay. So, uh, Councilor Jarrett, would you be comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. So, any further discussion on first reading? Okay. Uh, roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Um, shall we go on to this next? Can we finish these financial orders? I don't know what that is, Laura. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would, um, I would, um, I would appreciate that just because of Director Wright and, um, if, if possible. 
Okay, so let's move on to 21.292 in order to appropriate additional $608,500 from various sources for roundhouse parking lot reconstruction. Move approval. Second. Motion's made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um, discussion on this. Mayor Narkowitz, did you want to talk about this since we didn't talk about it in finance? Sure. Yeah. So this is um, so the roundhouse lot uh, renovation is is something we've been working on for several years. Um, it's really kind of the phase three of the Pulaski Park renovation. Um, as folks may know, we did you know we did the initial renovation of Pulaski Park. Then we made the decision to build the Overlook, um, you know, which was sort of a, a community um, designed um, addition expansion of the park. Um, and then one of the pieces of that was um, we wanted to eventually, um, you know, renovate plus, uh, the Roundhouse parking lot, but we also wanted to offset some of the parking spaces um, that were lost because of the um, Overlook project. Um, so we've been working over the last several years, there was an initial um, uh, capital um, allocation to this. Um, I believe it was 2018 or 2019, um, believe it was about 230,000. And um, so we've been doing not only engineering during that time, um, but we've also um, been working with some abutting uh, landowners. And um, you may or may not recall some orders that came to the council um, where we actually um, acquired some slivers of um, land um, along the back part of the, um, of, of, um, of, of the roundhouse lot. Um, and so the, the, this project would basically um, expand the footprint of uh, uh, the roundhouse lot. Um, it, would, it would actually um, redo and, and, and move the bike path so that the bike path would stay on the outer edge of the parking lot like it is now. Um, it would allow us to create overall an additional 22 spaces in that very um, heavily used lot. Um, it would work. It would work to improve um, surface uh, water drainage concerns. Um, we, we've worked on some access issues to the um, to the South Street apartments um, with the fire department access. Um, we'll be adding um, EV charging stations um, as part of the. Uh, project as well as um, embedding infrastructure for further EV, EV charging stations, um, and we'll be doing uh, work to accommodate the, um, you know, the trash collection um, that's associated with the South Street apartments, as well as upgrading accessible parking um, locations in the lot. So it's a project that we've been working on for several years, and um, it was brought to the planning board. Uh, recently for site plan review, um, and it did get site plan approval, um, and we put it out to bid, um, and we got the bids in uh, recently, and um, and so this additional funding it's um, uh, is needed to actually um, execute the contract and um, and and do this project, which again is sort of you know if you've seen the lot, and and of course it will include. Um, you know, it will include uh, plantings and, and um, you know, islands and, uh, and trees and all the other pieces of, of, the, um, of a parking lot project like this. Um, but in order for us to now advance it, uh, we need this funding to do that. So you'll see the order proposes that we use a portion of um, not only um, some of our receipts reserved um, for parking, but also the um, funding from um, another fund that we would close out as well as some capital stabilization funds that would um, all combined allow us to move forward with the project. Okay, thank you. Councillor Foster? Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions about the project itself. Is it appropriate to ask those as we discuss the financial order? Uh, sure, and I'll do my best to answer the questions. Um, All right, thank not, you. And tell me if you can't. I'm not okay. David Pomerantz, but I can try to play him on television. Um, the first question, um, you mentioned the bike path um, being moved so that it's still um, at the back of the parking lot. And it's it's been an issue. I, I talked with Director Fiden about this a couple of years ago, but uh, the way the snow removal works, the snow actually gets piled 
on that stretch of bike path. And I, I was wondering if you know off the top of your head what the plan is, if, if that's still going to be an issue, if there's a new plan for snow removal there. Um, I know that snow removal would have been one of the issues discussed at site plan. Um, actually, I want, is Mr. Fiden on this call? Hmm, interesting. I don't think Maybe so. not. I didn't know if he was here. How about, how about um, is Ms. Mish on here possibly? Nope. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I just was going to ask that question in the context of that. Um, I can get you more information about that. Um, but I know that snow removal would be one of the considerations that we would look at and obviously drainage. And, and so that is a question I will have to um, get you an answer for. And I have two more if that's okay. Sure, um, totally. Okay, great. The, the other question, um, I've just been hearing it and just so you could explain, I assume it has to do with the um, bidding process, but there was some question around the timing for the reconstruction of the roundhouse lot. And, and of course it's at the same time as, as the other lot downtown. And if you could just sort of explain how the timing shook out as it did. Yes, definitely. Um, and, and this has to do with the fact that we had the unexpected closure of the Masonic street lot um, because we've had a massive sewer collapse in the, um, in the that runs through the Masonic street lot. It's an ancient sewer um, that they've been nursing for years and it basically um, uh, sort of pancaked on us this year. So they've had to mobilize um, um, a contractor who's doing that work. And so yes, the Masonic Street lot is now closed. We knew that we would be doing the um, roundhouse lot this year. Um, um, and obviously we um, we're not anticipating the Masonic Street lot. We are working actively right now and on a on some alternative parking um, for the um, to tick to pick up the slack from the Masonic Street lot. We're working with a private entity that has a lot that we're looking to um, uh, utilize on a short term basis. Um, we're just waiting for um, uh, final approvals from sort of the higher level there, um, which we think will help solve um, the Masonic Street lot issue very close to the Masonic Street lot. Um, but in terms of the roundhouse lot, um, there's really never a good time to take a parking lot and, and reconstruct it. Um, uh, all I can say is that, you know, we're going to try to do it, um, you know, during the, um, during the summertime, um, which, you know, relatively speaking, when the schools are out and, and colleges are out and people are on um, well, we'll be on vacation again, I think this summer, um, that it, that it's a, it's a good, as good a time as any to do it. Um, so I think we're going to, we're going to move through it. And, and, you know, the, the lot will be, there'll be, it'll be done incrementally, unlike the Masonic street lot where the sewer line pretty much runs right through the heart of the lot and the whole thing had to be closed. Um, there'll be some site work and there'll be some, um, you know, work that can get done. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we estimate that the Masonic street lot we, we think the work there will be done in about 80 days or so. Um, and so, um, so we think that, you know, the, you know, if, if the funding is approved and then the contract is awarded and then there's a whole process for mobilization, you know, this roundhouse project probably wouldn't start to get underway until, you know, later this month. Um, you know, so we think there'll be some overlap, but we do think the Masonic lot will finish um, and come back online. Um, and then we will have that additional parking. And then I would also just say that, you know, um, the parking garage continues to have high levels of uh, vacancy in it. You know, we've got, we are still seeing a lot of vacancy, you know, a lot of spaces available in the parking um, garage as well. So, um, you know, we'll be working to find alternative spaces for city employees so that they're not, you um, uh, creating, um, you know, so that they have a place and are not um, creating issues in any of these alternative lots. Um, but yeah, it's, it was not planned. Obviously the Masonic street piece was not planned. We don't have an option not to do the Masonic street lot. Um, and frankly, the roundhouse lot is important. And the fact that we're expanding spaces um, and it's a project that's not going to get um, any less expensive if we continue to wait to do it. So um, I guess that would be my answer. But we're obviously going to work very closely with the business community, um, with employers, um, to try to get the project done as soon as possible um, and with the least amount of disruption. 
my my last question um, is several of my constituents in Ward 2 are heavily invested in lighting for mm -hmm. city projects. Um, and I've, I've heard their concerns around this project. So I just wanted to take a moment um, to lift that concern up. And, and I, I don't know if there's been conversations back and forth the status in the last couple of weeks, but I, I, I just wanted to elevate their concerns that um, they are concerned that the lighting will be quite bright um, and, and have glare. Um, and uh, you know I know the Energy and Sustainability Commission did endorse the five principles of lighting um, and the concern I've heard from some of my constituents is they're not feeling like the lighting plan is fitting within those, those principles. Yes, and I've obviously heard those concerns and you've heard those concerns expressed here at city council. Um, I know that obviously, you know, we, we've um, going through the site plan process um, and going through the spec process, you know, we've, we've um, spec'd out lights that are dark sky approved light, light fixtures. Um, and we went through the site plan process with the planning board um, relative to um, you know their requirements because the planning board has lighting standards that it's adopted um, and I know that there's some um, question that those even those dark sky standards aren't dark sky enough um, um, so I know that director Pomerantz has made a commitment to um, meet with um, uh, James Lowenthal who he knows quite well because they've served together on on uh, city boards. Um, and so, um, so I know that they are going to take a look at some other fixtures that, um, that uh, Professor Lowenthal is suggesting, including some that he's identified at Smith College. And so we are going to look at that piece of it as well and take another look at that. Um, you know, I, again, I can, I can, um, I don't know if you've seen the lights down in, in in the roundhouse lot, I mean, they're they're sort of the old school um, lights, and they're they're um, you know they're they're quite bright. And I can assure you that we would be you know the the fixtures we would be moving towards would be dark sky approved, um, like our street lights, and we'd be looking to you know obviously having the it's it's a balancing act because it's um, you know we obviously want to work on the dark sky issue. It's also a public safety issue. Um, you know, that's a lot that we've heard a lot about from downtown um, businesses and workers who work um, late into the evening and then go to their cars late at night. And so uh, that's, you know, it's a balancing act between having safety and, and accessibility, but also trying to meet those dark sky principles. So I know um, Director Pomerantz has said that he's willing, he's going to be meeting with, um, uh, with James and, and looking at um, some potential alternative uh, fixtures, and um, and you know we're working with Ty and Bond, um, who is the um, uh, you know who's the engineer on the project, and they they've been working with a lighting consultant who is um, is you know they're willing to do another photometric assessment of of the proposal. Um, but in terms of meeting all of our existing standards and meeting uh, our current lighting standards. Um, you know the project conforms to that, but we're but we are um, going to uh, work with and listen to some of these additional concerns. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that. Thanks, uh, Councilor Mayor and then Councilor Jarrett. Uh, yes, thank you, Councilor uh, Foster, for bringing that up. And we did we did discuss this at Energy and Sustainability, and it was um, and David Pomerantz did kindly uh, agree to go on a. Uh, a day trip or a night trip to look at the lighting, evening trip uh, to look at the lighting. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that uh, David Pomerantz will um, be able to kind of address some of those concerns. And, um, but but what, what I'm hearing and what we discussed at, at NESC is that in fact, the lighting really doesn't meet, um, it doesn't meet the five, five principles of responsible outdoor lighting which is part of our climate resilience and regeneration plan. And it, it actually violates several um, of the tenets of our, our own, uh, Northampton's own outdoor lighting. Uh, and, you know, there's um, safety, safety and lighting is an interesting issue because there's a perception and there's a reality and there's a lot of other alternatives for lighting that keep people safe. There's a lot of glare. And what I learned is that if you have lights that are lower, uh, 
that that actually is safer than the, the lights that we perceive as, as making people safe because there's actually lots of glare and dark spots in those. So I'll be interested to, to follow up with, um, with uh, David Pomerantz uh, on that issue. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that they can do something, but I do actually hold the same concerns. Councillor Jarrett. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillors Foster and Mayori for addressing those. You, you touched on most of my points. Um, and yeah, uh, looking forward to, I'm hoping to be involved in this nighttime walk uh, as well. And, you know, Smith College, um, which is certainly very concerned about the safety of its students and all its community members, um, does have lighting plans for its parking lots, which reduce many of these concerns. Um, so I would love to see these concerns addressed to that walk and, and discuss that before then. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. All right, stay with me just a tiny bit longer. We've got a second reading. Let's do that. And then how about we continue the rest of the agenda to Monday? Yes? Sure, why not? Okay. So we're at 21.271, order to authorize Conservation Commission to, act to acquire Massachusetts Audubon Society conservation restriction. This is on second reading. Move approval, please. Motion made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion? Roll call on second reading, please, Laura. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, that passes on second reading. So we're gonna continue the rest of this agenda to Monday. So our meeting is Monday, that's June 7th at 7 p.m. And, but I just wanna, go over quickly what we are continuing, okay? Just so that everyone knows. So we are at, uh, so orders um, A and B, uh, those two orders that are on the agenda on first reading will be continued. Um, uh, referring the ordinance, um, a parking space ordinance will be continued, then scooting back up to the top of the agenda. Uh, we will do the consent agenda. And I believe that is it, plus the two ordinances um, that we had already said are going to be on that agenda, and then the financial order that was requested um, be just automatically carried over to Monday. Okay, oh. Councilor Mayori. Uh, and just to clarify, there will not be any, there will not be public comment because it's a continuation of this. Just for anyone out there. They're Correct. Back it's back. a special meeting, so there's not public comment. Um, and and then one other thing, we will do the second reading on the um, the Academy of Music uh, order. Move to continue the meeting to Monday. Second. Motion made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Nash. Any discussion on continuing? Oh, did did Laura have something to say? Oh, did you, Laura? Well, I just wanted to make sure that she had mentioned the um, e the acquisition of the property along the Mill River, and I think you did. Yeah. Could I um? Could I? Could I ask one more question? Um, yeah, please. And that is, um, uh, I was just uh, conferring with the finance director, and you know, um, well, relative to that conversation we were having about the parking lots and the two parking lots being out of service and wanting to get the construction going as soon as possible, so we could get them. Uh, would the council be willing to entertain a second reading on the on the roundhouse lot funding so that we can get that project underway? Um, obviously, knowing that we're going to be doing this further work on around the lighting, or 
I'm sure, when would it come back? Would it be on the 17th? Is that when the It would be on the 17th. Okay. Okay. So um, I guess that would just be my one question. Would they, would you, uh, would, would the council entertain that or would you want to wait for two readings on that? Um, just in, out, of the, in, out of the interest of trying to get the project um, advanced um, and getting it going in the summertime. I would consider introducing a call for suspension of rules and it's up to the council to vote on. So Laura, can you, so we'll keep track of those two that we will remember to introduce it and see the council's pleasure, yes? Okay, excellent. Um, there's, we had moved to adjourn, is that yes? Yes. Well, it's not a motion to adjourn because we are, we are continuing. Oh, sorry, we haven't voted yet to continue. Yes, right. that's what's on the floor. Okay. Right. Uh, any further discussion on continuing anything we didn't cover on this agenda? Seeing none, roll call on continuing. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. And okay. I believe that is a de facto adjournment call vote. We don't need to adjourn because we're actually Still postponing, right. we're continuing the meeting. So we don't, right. we're, we're, we'll Not continue voting. the meeting. Right. But if you want, we can do a motion. I'll take your word for it. Um, Mayor Narkowitz, I feel like there's something that you wanted to say, no? Uh, well, I had asked if you would consider a second right. reading, but you've already uh, moved on, so. Um, oh, did you mean tonight? Or it I could be you Monday. Monday. It, can be, it can be Monday, it's fine. I, 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 I was not clear. It could just right, be Monday when we take up the other order, it's fine. Okay, yeah. okay. I'm sorry, I that's what I thought you meant Monday. Yeah. yeah, no no problem. It's, you know, tomorrow's Friday and um, Monday is, we'll be fine. Okay. Monday comes after the other two days there. Yes. Okay. okay. All true. Okay. Stop, stop showing off. <laughs> <laughs> too fast oh sometimes. Yeah. So Laura, do you agree that we don't need to adjourn? I mean, yes, that sounds right to me. I could could hurt to do a motion and a vote, but I think you yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, <laughs> again, I don't think there's any harm if we I, adjourn. Yeah, I think we should adjourn because <laughs> this is a special meeting we're having on Monday and we have carried over those items which are already on that agenda. So they are two separate meetings. It's not It's not like, I, I think that I think they're two separate meetings. Well, let me, let me clarify just to make us more baffled than everything else. But mm -hmm. the fact is there won't be public comment because as Council Mayor already pointed out, it's a continuation of this meeting. We've had the public comment. No. It's just a Sorry. Uh -huh. Oh, I was not correct. I was There's not public Sorry. comment because it's a special meeting and public uh, comment. Okay. We have public comment according to our rules on regular council meetings, but on special meetings, which is what it is, there's not automatic public comment. That is why. Okay. Well, as a rule, we we the we don't have not continued meetings, but there have that actually is within our purview to do that. And then in order to continue it, in this case, uh, designate, I mean, it could be continued to the first, uh, the discussion and all those agenda items could be deferred to the very next regularly scheduled council meeting. Um, and as such, it would, <clears throat> as you're continuing that agenda, it doesn't matter. This is too prosaic and too silly at this point to even discuss. I move that we adjourn. How's that? <laughs> Motion made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Labarge. I think we've more than discussed this. Yeah. Um, you can't discuss a German. <laughs> yet somehow we did. Council Nash. Councilor Nash. Oh, absolutely, yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Sure, why not? Councilor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes, I don't want to wake up and see you all still on my computer. <laughs> Please. We, we, the meeting somehow still going on. Right. So yes, yes.
Okay, we are adjourned. I will see you all on Monday, which comes after Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Absolutely. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.